All right, we are live. Welcome, comrades, to our stream this evening with the mighty Chairman Hakim. I would have liked to have said King Hakim, but I've recently learned that monarchy is bad. <laughs> Anyone else know yes, about this? That is <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would have thought you would have thought that I'd be a bit harder on monarchy, given the eight hundred years mm. of colonial rule under uh, the, the British monarchy in Ireland. But uh, oh, well, uh, right well anyway, anyway, you have a nice crown there in the in the thumbnail, so hopefully people are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> able to appreciate it hopefully the republicanism yeah. doesn't come out too strong that you can't appreciate a good crown you know anyway exactly. anyway today we're going to be hanging out we're going to be doing some q and a's we're going to be taking it easy talking shite having some fun for the next next couple of hours get your questions into the live chat starting with at paul Marin, and uh, we'll answer them one by one Hakeem, thank you for taking the time out this evening to do the stream. Uh, actually, I say this evening, it might hello, be quite hello. late. Well, it might be quite late. It must be like the middle of the night or something. On your yeah, end. it is. It is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It is almost midnight over here. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm so sorry. I'm so. Wait, can I just ask uh, before, we, before we get yeah. into it? Do you have much time? Uh, do, you, do you have like a time limit or do you have like... Uh, no, uh, no, no, no. I will not be going to bed until like three in the morning regardless. So. <laughs> okay, right. Well, you know. Yeah. You should set a time limit now. I'm just, I'm just saying, because <laughs> these streams have a tendency to, you know, drag out a little bit. But, uh, well, let, 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 let it take its room. Why not? I, I don't particularly mind. No worries. Let's see how it goes. Anyway, uh, don't commit to something. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> like six hours later, I think it was six hours last Friday. It was uh, with, Social with Swan, Swan, right? With Social Swan. Oh right? Jesus! I mean, it was great. I, I, I adore Josh. He's fantastic. But um, we were talking for like eight hours straight as well. For like two hours after the stream yeah. was finished. Oh. It was great. <laughs> it was excessive. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Kamriti, uh, thank you so much for taking out the time, Stephen. I know that work has been pretty intense for you recently, and you know I really appreciate yes. everything that you do. Thank you for making the time to continue to educate us and to share your insights <laughs> and wisdom. Would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself to the comrades? Uh, maybe sure. if there are any comrades here who somehow aren't aware of your work. Mm. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, all right, so I'm Hakeem. Uh, I make videos from time to time. I'm a physician by profession, and uh, I do this as kind of like a side, ho side hobby, you could say. So I could... Um Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. If uh, just so people know, I do not have the chat open in fear of the, you know, the, the Stalinist internet cutting it out again. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last day we had some issues with that, but um, I think it's pretty. Yeah. I think it's pretty solid today, so I think we're all right. Yeah. So um, I'm sure that this will be actually quite a long um, chat because I do have a bit of time. Uh, but if there are <laughs> questions that are missed and I do not get to them, uh, and of course I wouldn't know because I'm not looking at the chat right now, I don't have it open, uh, feel free to DM me anytime. Please do so on Twitter because there I actually see them and answer them on Discord. Like, it's a mess always. Well, so, you're popular, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, Everybody... <laughs> It's like a million oh. questions for you. <laughs> You're too kind. Also, do you have you have no idea the the two or three weeks that I was yeah it was a three weeks three weeks I was gone off Twitter because I had a lot of like work was way too much. Mm. Um, I maybe racked up something like six hundred DMs on Ooh. Twitter alone, and it took me a full day of. <laughs> Oh, that was a, yeah. It was, well, it was fun. It was but fun. This is I think this is a lot. A lot of this is probably related to your recent spike in popularity. You know, we did a we did a stream like I think it was about like seven maybe seven or eight months ago at this stage, and you know, I think your channel was a bit a third the size of what it is now. It just skyrocketed. I think. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I think this... it had to do with um. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it was like the uh, the, the... the Bosch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> go on, go on, Heavy. Go on. No, I, I think it's probably the, the lag, maybe a slight little lag, but um, I think it was probably after the Vosh stream, around the time you did the Vosh stream, you talked to him, and then, I don't know, maybe the, the algorithm picked you up. I don't, I don't know what happened there, but it, uh, it skyrocketed, well deservedly. Yeah, uh, I think it was more uh, along the lines of, that was part of it too, um, but it started, I think, right before that, uh, and it was the, the, I did like two or three response videos that for some reason happened to blow up, and as a result of that is uh, why we got this... Um, this uh like mm. growth that occurred and i'm sorry there's oh, that makes yelling sense. downstairs yeah, oh no on. that's okay the the i i noticed the audio seems to be slightly quieter now maybe maybe yeah. you adjusted the the audio yeah hold up one sec no it's okay take it on take it on gonna have a little sip of my desperados cheers comrades <clears throat> Oh, we've got many, many questions for Comrade Hakeem already in, in the chat here. I've got like a list. I've got a, a Word document and I've probably got about... <laughs> I've probably got about 15 questions taken down and within each question, there's like about three or four questions already. So um, <clears throat> we'll get through them one by one. Send Comrade Hakeem uh, a DM on Twitter and uh, he'll probably get to them uh, in his time if we don't get to them today. But we'll do what we can anyway. All right, I am back. Excuse <clears throat> me, hold on. Let me just make sure the levels are fine again. Oh, that's okay. Um, it says. Yeah. I think people are I saying think it that should be fine. Sorry, yeah. Go on. 
Yeah, no, that's okay. Could I just get you to say uh, hello again there and just... We'll just hello, share. hello, hi. How's okay. everything? Uh, the audio, <clears throat> I'm looking at the bars, it looks okay. Comrades in the chat, if you could let us know that everything's okay, yeah. then uh, then we can, we'll can correct them if there's any issues there. I think it's probably okay now. Yes, uh, just for explanation for all that, uh, I'm not currently home. I'm visiting family at the moment because uh, I had a day off that I spent working. <laughs> admin <laughs> bullshit, <laughs> admin, admin nonsense. True but, worker. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, so excuse the um, family sounds, right? <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I was telling, I was telling uh, Paul earlier about this, is that back home, major city in the center with an apartment and everything, internet is shit. I, I could not get a connection to save my life. It drops every two seconds. Here in the middle of nowhere, I am honestly, I think 20, 25 kilometers, I think, away from the nearest level of civilization in Perfect all directions. Internet. And it's absolutely like pristine. So you figure that out. <laughs> Crystal clear. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So we can get into uh, excuse the interruptions. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I can go off and yeah. try talk about this or that So it's no problem. Um, okay, great. Come here to me. I actually promised uh, a comrade who asked me a question about a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. They asked me about something that you have uh, discussed historically a bit before. And yeah. um, I'd like to ask you about it again today, uh, maybe just to add a little bit more clarity to it. And I can't remember the comrade who asked me this, but um, if you're if you're out there, if you're listening, uh, hopefully this will you'll enjoy this. So mm -hmm. I was recently asked to speak on Iranian imperialism, but yes. as I knew that uh, you were coming on the stream soon, I promised that I'd ask you about this. Uh, you've described it as soft imperialism. So mm -hmm. would you mind talking a little bit more about this? Uh, what is soft imperialism, and how does it manifest mm -hmm. in Iran? Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't recall if I call it soft imperialism, but I did call it regional, um, ah, like right. a small, okay. smaller scale. Yeah, mm. yeah, but I guess you could call it soft in a way. Oh, okay. um, because uh, yeah, no, that's all right. Um, the the okay, here's the issue, right? When we talk about imperialism, what is one of the fundamental things? Like before the export of capital, before you know these sort of things, uh, the the issue is that requires a relatively developed nation to do right. Uh, Iran is not one of those, right? Um, it is a quote-unquote developing, yeah, meaning overexploited country. Even in the relative scheme of things, as an overexploited country, it can nonetheless do some small-scale um, levels of uh, imperialism, or at least like fractions of it. Mm. Uh, what is the fraction that takes part in, in Iraq, for example? That is mostly in markets. It has penetrated Iraqi markets um, for uh, the export and uh, of, of their you know products produced within Iran uh, and the. Uh, that this is taking place in is agriculture. Um, mm. If people do not know, uh, lots of the um, uh, Iraq is actually a, a very rich agricultural country. Um, even though you look at the map, half the country is desert. The other half is incredibly fertile land, um, especially in the southeast, uh, in the east, and in the north. Um, and as a result, we have uh, quite the productive agricultural sector. The thing is, though, despite having a very productive agricultural sector that can not only produce enough for all of Iraq's needs but also export. Uh, as a result, uh, we have this very strange thing that has occurred, which is that we import Iranian vegetables, despite the fact that we have the, the capacity to grow our own. Not only that, but the farmers exist and the tools exist and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my own grandfather himself was a, is, is a peasant. He's a farmer. Um, so the thing that happened is after the this, um, I mean, like the, the, the fall of the previous uh, government, uh, it was kind of free reign for Iranian forces uh, to uh, control Iraq both politically as well as economically. Uh, and one of the things they did first was monopolize political power in Iraq, um, which is something that we can still see the consequences of to this day. Um, but a uh, like extension of that, um, like the, of that thing is that uh, they've also um, extended themselves economically into Iraq in ways such as, for example, uh, having convenient deals that only benefit Iran, but while kind of draining Iraq. Um, another thing is like, for example, uh, in Iraq, uh, some exports are paid for in hard currency, um, something Iran cannot currently get. Uh, and of course, is, if people don't know hard currency, meaning like euro, dollar, stuff like that, usually means specifically dollar, but uh, these are trade currencies. And uh, Iran currently cannot get trade currencies as a result of um, the embargoes and whatnot that have been uh, placed upon them. So uh, it's kind of like a political move to uh, kind of keep that up. Uh, at the expense of Iraq. So this is kind of what I mean. It's a lot more in-depth than that, um, but it kind of 
it's some people may think like oh what does this mean like oh just iran is exporting tomatoes to iraq why should it matter it's like because iraq <laughs> has all the capacity to grow its own tomatoes mm. right so that's the the, the the meme there um but there's a lot more to be said there's research that could be done into this mm. um there's even a video that could be made but uh, i have not found the time and sadly the interest as well because it would take quite a lot of time for something that's a pretty niche i think mm, mm. well no I actually hope that's satisfying Definitely, yeah. And I think it actually it adds a lot of uh, layers to our understanding of imperialism as this global <laughs> system. There isn't just one point from which imperialism emanates. Mm. There are all these competing imperialists, exactly. competing imperialisms. You might talk. I've actually I've heard people also refer to this similar phenomena as sub imperialism. I'm not sure if you've heard this term mm. before. I've heard this. Yeah, you've heard of this. Yeah. I mean, people have some people have uh, described like sorry, for example, like um, sort of rising powers. Uh, Mm. They've talked about it, sub imperialism with regard to Brazil, uh, with regard mm. to India. You know, there's just there are these elements. They're, they don't necessarily have the power yet to fully uh, imperialize and exploit all these other countries and have this massive influence, uh, which really pins them down. Mm. But there, there are elements there, and it does seem to be growing. There does seem to be this comprador bourgeoisie who do have imperialist ambitions, and it's definitely going exactly. in that kind of direction, even if it's not fully there yet. But um, mm. yeah, I think that that, yeah. that that's probably the the same kind of thing that we're we're talking about. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, and a thing to be noted as well is that, um, like, in case people might uh, uh, misunderstand what we're saying, just because there is something uh, like of like a, of a sub imperialist flavor, we can say, or um, a, a regional imperialist power and, and such, um, the primary contradiction in many places remains to be the major imperialisms, right? Because, for example, mm -hmm. um, if you look at, let's say, American imperialism. Uh, it, the economic presupposes the political, while it's the opposite, for example, in, with Iranian involvement in Iraq, the political presupposes the economic. If you take away uh, Iranian political influence in Iraq, this sort of uh, local regional imperialism um, of its economic nature is gone. It's taken away. It crumbles mm. on its own. You don't need to fight that against that specifically, right? Uh, while uh, compared, like if you contrast that with American imperialism or EU uh, imperialism, yeah. Or, for example, exactly, yeah. Uh, the economic pre it, it comes before any political sort of uh, consideration, we could say. Mm. Uh, this could be a point further developed, but yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's a, there's a massive conversation to be had there. And uh, I think it's really useful for us to, to expand on what our understanding of imperialism all right. at all times. Because actually, I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, that Lenin really did, you know, like pushing back against the, the Kautskyist kind of um, ultra imperialism <laughs> kind of idea, like the second international stuff and all this sort of thing. I mean, it actually is really important that we do understand inter imperialist conflicts and these different kind exactly. of uh, levels of it. So, yeah, I do appreciate uh, us bringing it up. Boy, would it be nice if um, the Kautskyites stayed in the 20s? <laughs> <laughs> They're coming back. They're a literally organization, even in the US. Yes, talking about it. actually it goes, it goes don't, you remember, <laughs> yeah, don't you remember the check the, the jacobin article that came out like oh, couple, oh my god yes i do remember that oh, oh lord i died of cringe that day <laughs> okay you know honestly i don't care i don't care if this gets me labeled as a conspiracy theorist or not i am like a good maybe 75 percent certain that jacobin is like a cia front of some kind <laughs> there is no way those are genuine left i do not believe it I, I cannot allow myself to have such little faith in the Western left for me to believe that this is a thing that exists. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, yes. I, I definitely, I feel the sentiment, sentiments. The uh, <laughs> Congress for Cultural Freedom is out in full force. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, well, anyway, we're, I suppose we're going down the, we're going down a weird <laughs> rabbit hole now. But anyway, let's get back on track so we don't get labeled the, the loony yes. uh, tinfoil hat. <laughs> conference. Yeah, sure thing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Listen, thanks very much for clarifying that. We've had a bunch of questions um, throughout the day. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of questions written down from earlier on. Uh, so I might just go ahead and read a few of those out. There's a fun one here first. This isn't actually really like a theoretical thing. It's just a, a request. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Communist Orange. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, go on. Communist yeah. Orange says, Paul, could you and Hakeem do a weekly podcast? <laughs> we'll make for some great content. <laughs> well, thanks for the question. Uh, but, um, huh. I, I think that uh, I, I think Comrade Hakim might be a little bit uh, pressed for time already. <laughs> <laughs> I may be otherwise preoccupied, but no, I'm actually genuinely thinking about that. Oh, you know, this is the thing. Every time, I, yes, uh, every time I thought about this. Um, okay, I, honestly, second, legitimately, I, yeah, I, I do personally. Uh, I don't think I have enough interesting things to say for like to be able to talk weekly yeah, about yeah, this stuff. Yeah, and no. uh, if I were Disagree. to do something of this, uh, yeah, if, if I was going to do something of this, like, type, then it would be, like, more long-form research stuff. And if I'm going to put in all the effort, I might as well make videos. But um, maybe not a weekly thing, but maybe 
in the future. Maybe something that could be done like once a month, just current affair chatting. It could be a thing. Why not? That'd be great. Um, yeah, we'll we'll keep we'll keep a pin in that. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. Yes. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, comrade. Appreciate that. Huntress Thompson asks. Paul, what is your and Hakim's take on the anti-tanky sentiments in the online left? For example, Americans like Bosch <clears throat> and his community calling MLs fascists. Any thoughts on this? Well, going right out with the uh, inflammatory question. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> you don't need do to speak be, on. No, uh, you don't need to speak on like individuals. No. Just uh, maybe the anti-tanky sentiment. No, generally. no, 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 no. Yeah. Do you want to give your opinion first, or can I go? Oh, uh, I don't mind. It, it, it's up to you. I'm, I'm happy to go if you want. I mean, you're the guest. I feel. I feel uh, like. Yeah. Sure thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, so generally, my uh, my perception of these sort of things is that it's a position. Look, um, we shouldn't like jump to think that these people are, oh, you know, they're misguided, they're this, they're that, they're that, you know, and all the vitriol of it. Um, you have to realize where these people are coming from. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, you have to take into into account, of course, class background, number one. Number two, you need to take into account where they're from and what sort of ideas they've been sub subjected to, what kind of ideology has been um, like forced down their throats since the beginning of their lives, basically. Um, if you live in a society, particularly like I'm sure any American listening right now can, can verify this. If you've been living your whole life in a system from when you're born until you die, it tells you in every medium in, in, in through, uh, the general like newspaper media and news media to movies, to music and every other books and all that stuff tells you that socialism is bad. Communism is bad. All this is bad. This, this, this is horrible because of blah, 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 you know, and the specific points that are given, um, you end up kind of internalizing it, and then when a uh, contradictory, or not contradictory, but um, uh, somebody comes and says something to counter that, right? The immediate uh, reaction isn't to be like, hey, let's listen to this person. The immediate reaction is to fall back on this lived experience that they've had of everything they've been taught mm. um, to reject, right? Mm. Um, so first, like my general point is we should approach these people front with empathy. Um, they're not doing this because they're nefarious. They're not doing this because th the reason that this is happening is because they've been incultured into a tradition of anti-communism that is over a century old at this point. Mm, right. Mm. So that's the first thing. Mm. Um, then you have the, the, the second point, right? The people who are, let's say a little more, uh, brazen about it, um, who may know better, but still do the, you know, also the anti-communist song and dance. This might be for numerous reasons. Um, number one, it might be because of like class background um, and class interests. Maybe they do not, maybe it is not in their best interest to have a uh, proper socialist model that can succeed. Maybe mm -hmm. it's better to just have this kind of, uh, these vague progressive ideas that don't give you any concrete uh, political goals or programs uh, or give you a proper understanding of the world that could uh, lead to uh a point where you can actually change the situation you're in, uh, but instead uh, it can just kind of give you an outlet for the rage that you have from the mm. system you're living in and the contradictions that you face each day. So th these are these people, uh, so from a class angle. Uh, and then you have another one, which is people who, I don't know what the English word for this is, but basically I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain what I mean. Let's say you want to get popular on a particular sphere, right? No matter what it is. You want to, if you want to do that, you are going to have to uh, kind of like skirt these more, um controversial issues no uh, if you're gonna do this uh then that means that you want to default to what is considered to be the largest opinion that is still socially i don't want to say socially acceptable but um like socially uncontroversial mm. let's say like if you were to say you know um oh you know i'm a socialist or an anarchist but you know the soviet union was bad i don't think they were really social blah blah, blah. if you were to say that in a company of uh quote-unquote respectable people quote-unquote um, they're not really going to bat an eye on you. You know, they're just going to let it pass. And that's what I mean. Uh, compare that or contrast that with somebody saying, for example, oh, you know, actually, I'm a Marxist Leninist and I uphold the experiences of former socialism, including the USSR and the GDR and Cuba and Vietnam and all that kind mm. of stuff. Um, then people will give you looks. Um, yeah. And that can limit your uh, growth. That could limit your popularity and your uh, extent. And I think you see this. Uh, and and the, if you remember the first point I mentioned about the uh, um, people being incultured into anti-communism. These two kind of connect at one point. Uh, oh, look how dialectical we're getting. <laughs> they, 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 connect, uh, they, they connect at one point in which the inculturation of anti-communism and this pseudo-progressive 
leftism. Um, that doesn't give any real answers, but is an outlet for rage. Meet at the point of quote unquote anti tanky discourse of mm-hmm. being like, oh, you know what? We're the actual social. Those people, though, they're, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, Left wing anti communist. Like the synthesis of everything we've been <laughs> exactly. talking about. <laughs> exactly right yeah well it's the, you know um, like, it's like they can tip up to the line they can sort of tiptoe up to the line of what's like socially acceptable as you said uh, and they can take like one step beyond it and say well hey socialism is pretty cool they just got it wrong historically and and as you said i mean that's mm. a that's a very good way of growing your platform online whether it's on twitter yeah. or youtube or, or or you know twitch or whatever it might be yeah and if we're gonna if we're gonna be materialists here <laughs> um the if you if you look at the normal let's say like transition or evolution of these people of um or like not to better better put it people who are marxist less now and how they got to marxism right um and you look at their 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 transformation let's say as they go along and compare that like i'm talking about a mostly western mostly white uh marxists like group of marxists Mm. and you ask them just generally how do you become it um they're gonna say oh usually i started maybe like just uh either conservative or luke lukewarm social democrat bernie bro and i kind of went into the anarchism sphere libertarian socialist thing and then finally i found my way to marxist leninist or mouse or what have you right Mm. that's generally the thing now compare that with um like my personal experience and people from where i'm from and you don't have you don't ever have this kind of like gradual transition everybody here just kind of almost intuitively is is raised with a level of anti-colonialism let's say and Mm. a very simple understanding of anti-imperialism and they the jump from that to the full radicalization right to ml directly Mm. is way more common um and way more quick and direct uh now what am i trying to say like the material basis of these things makes sense because here the uh, enculturation of anti-communism isn't as strong nearly Mm. um as it is in the west so that's why they have to go through all these stages of breaking down barrier after barrier of what they've been taught since their youth right so that's kind of my point um, but when it comes to, sorry, do you want to say something? Well, I, I did want to say, I mean, it's it's very relevant to like Ireland as well. Like people will sort of grow up in Ireland with like this sort of Republican, there's like a Republican kind of thing there. It's again, it's the anti-colonial struggle. It's against British imperialism, British colonialism, all this sort of stuff. And so people can get very, very radical. And um, people like, especially people from like, like working class backgrounds, like we, we grow up and like, there's just kind of a, like a, a, a sort of a low level feeling of like anti-imperialism. And so it's very easy. Like you don't have a lot of people in Ireland who would be identifying as like anarchists and that. Trotskyism is quite big. Trotskyism is, mm. is, is a pretty big thing uh, it's pretty big especially well I, th- I think very much like among like middle classes it's 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 mm. it's very popular middle classes uh, but like most working class people they just go directly to socialist republicanism um which mm. is kind of like vague generally it's very vaguely like marxist leninist or marxist leninist maoists and mm. so there's kind of a vague sense of like we actually need to well get into what they call like physical force republicanism which is very much like armed struggle mm. all, the, all the sort of stuff i don't want to get pulled off youtube so i'm not going to say too much more but yeah I, I know i do know exactly what you're talking about and um, i do think that that anti-colonial sort of context that anti-colonial trajectory definitely lends itself to uh, communism and genuine radical ideology a lot more easily than mm. is maybe uh, the common or the norm uh, in these more mm. uh, <clears throat> these imperialist nations if you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure and just uh, I think a last point, just to like top this all off, because um, somebody specifically mentioned them calling them fascists, like Marxist Leninists or fascists or red fascist or whatever. Mm, yeah. um, there is no way that you can into in an intellectually honest um, like method claim that Marxist Leninism in any fashion in any way was practiced ever could have been even close to fascism. It's even uh, uh, you, yeah, exactly. And the the reason people say this is because these are learned catchphrases, and I, I this is something kind of missing from the because there are no cadres anymore right there are no mm. parties there are no solidified groups in the western left so they can be taught these things but just like quick ca- uh, like crash course <laughs> is um uh, something that happens very frequently and you experience this um this is in every ideological strain but far less far much uh, oh wow my english is failing me far less so does mm. that make sense yeah yep, a lot less yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot less in uh, marxist leninist spaces uh, but it still happens there is there's this phenomenon of like catchphrases right there are things people learn to just uh kind of fire out when they hear the prompt um one of these things for example is commodity production you hear this is, this is a learned catchphrase <laughs> another one that. is yeah another one is uh red fascism that's another one yeah. um or authoritarianism these are learned catchphrases because if you actually make that if you actually sit this person down and be like you know what no don't do just say authoritarianism that? yeah like walk me through what you mean walk yeah. me through specifically what ways what instances how you can qualify this as fascism and then if they actually do that it's going to quickly crumble because they can't 
yep. right? Um, so that's Go these are things that freedom. It's like, well, have you heard about Soviet democracy? <laughs> do you know how yeah, that exactly. works? <laughs> yeah, these, these, uh, on. people people do not know these things, and this is it's a the and the real shame um, is that it's not their fault for not mm. knowing; it's the fault of Marxists for not teaching, right? So, um, every day. Uh, imperialism like in the west remains uh, like as, as a major force and people don't even question it right um like laymen americans for example every day you have these generic uh, heard a hundred times a day fucking anti-socialist arguments that oh you know human nature oh but, but, but oh economic calculation every time you hear these things it's not the fault of the person saying it this person has just learned a catchphrase and is regurgitating because they've never actually had to think about these things mm. right um just their society has told them to say this stuff generally mm. it is the fault of the marxists for not doing proper education right yeah um yeah, and uh, maybe that's a bit being harsh on us as Marxists, but also it's well, kind of like a sense of responsibility that we have. And can to, I to can I piggyback? Educating. I want to piggyback on what yeah, you say on. there because actually that's that's yeah. one of the things I wanted to say. Like people are like, oh my god, they're so like anti-tanky. Like the liberals are so anti-tanky. The anarchists aren't. It's like okay, well we need to toughen the fuck up. Like mm. genuinely, like it, people if people start calling us like red fascists or tankies or this or that, either just fucking wear his armor. It's fine. Obviously not red fascists. Fuck that. <laughs> We're like the opposite <laughs> of that. But I mean genuinely, yeah. like you need to toughen up. Like because just just walk them yeah. through it. Sit them down. Talk, let's say well what are your concerns? What are you yeah. concerned about the USSR? Yeah. Let's actually talk about that. Let's let's yeah. let's take it apart because honestly, I mean like if we're genuinely talking about like revolution, like you're gonna knock them, you're gonna be going around and organizing people, uh, state by state, road by road, like just knocking on people's apartments yeah. and you want to talk to them. You're gonna come up against these things and you're gonna need to be able to yeah. handle them. You know, you can't just fucking say, oh, just these these fucking anarchies or, or some shit like yeah. that. You know, you need to be able to handle this and deal with it in a calm exactly. way and, and, and de-escalate the situation and, and let people know yeah. what the communists are and that like we are the communists and we are yeah. on the people's side. <laughs> You know, yeah. we're not trying to fuck with them. We're not fascists. Uh, we we have to work to. I, I think yeah. there's there's a there's a tendency for us to say, well, no. I think Trotskyists can sometimes do this as well. Uh, at least in Ireland, I've, I've seen this happen where they'll say like, oh well, we're socialists, but we don't support that socialism. We don't want to be like Stalin, yeah. the evil Stalinists. We don't want to be like the evil Maoists. We don't want to be like that. You know, so we're like this different, like pure socialism, this left anti-communism, I guess. Um, but yeah, we need to, we need to toughen the fuck up and actually just be able to take it on the chin and keep pushing forward, uh, regardless yeah. of that. You know, so yeah. that's what I would say. Toughen yeah. the fuck up, comrades. We have to. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, to piggyback off that piggyback, <laughs> um, <laughs> something to also like tie it up is um, uh, th there's a phrase we have in, in like in Iraq. It's Tawrbalik, basically. It's not even a phrase. It's just a thing you say. It literally means elongate your mind. What it means is have patience. Have a lot of patience with these people. Yeah. You're going to have to sit and have the same argument a hundred times over. And you're going to have to, you know, by the way, after a while, you get it down to a science of how exactly what points you're going to know exactly what they're going to say you're going to know exactly what to answer to bring them to the point of deconstructing the anti-communism they've built up with but you have to just have a lot of patience you can't just you know send 300 pdfs and a link and be like you know what here you go like learn yeah. <laughs> no, you have to actually sit and, and, and do the Here's work library. and hey uh, just as a side note i work full time i have my st the stupid studying i have to do and i do this youtube shit i still try to find the time to answer twitter dms where people uh, yeah. bless you some people fucking send me like essays <laughs> and i <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't mind it. All right. Sometimes I'm like, oh Jesus Christ, this. I can't do it. after a hard day at work. I can't after a hard day at work yeah. during a fucking pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, but hey, I, I, I still try to. I still try to make my way through it. Um, and I get it. Some people may not have the energy to do that, but slowly and surely, mm. right? Um, so just have patience and 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 you know, like uh, Paul said, take it on the chin too. Don't don't uh, leave the vitriol, right? Because yeah. if you're very, this is something. Um. Uh, the the advice of uh, the prophet peace and blessings be upon him was, when you discuss with somebody, is that you you should always like uh, return in kindness, and this is some one of the greatest pieces of advice uh, pieces of advice that anybody can get. What it, in practice, what this means is you can't have anybody who comes to you raging and like foaming at the mouth and being angry, and if you're kind back to them, they're gonna stay angry. Eventually, they're gonna that this deescalates the the conversation to a more level headed. You know, mm. so at the very least, at, at, at worst, it becomes less a person so uh, like uh, angrily, you know, anti communist. At worst, it becomes that, you know what, they'll agree to disagree on a like mutual understanding basis. Yeah. And at best, you actually get a comrade. So uh, be nice. And have patience and take it on the chin. That's a long-winded answer, but yeah. <laughs> absolutely. No, I think that was absolutely great, and I'm, and I'm, I'm sure we've both had that experience historically. I've had it many, many times, and I think it's uh, it's really important. Yeah. Actually, there's a there's a comment on that, uh, fellow traveler. Yeah. How are you getting on, comrade? Good to see you, uh, fellow traveler. Hey. 
says, Breadtube, radical liberalism is a business model. It's anti-capitalism commodified. These people are socialist insofar as it gets them views and clout, but in practice, they're no different from libs. You know, some of them are actually openly like liberals. Like they'll just say like, we're, yeah. we're, we're literally just, we're liberals. <laughs> we're social democrats, we're this, we're that. And it's like, okay, yeah. well, that's fine. We, 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 we've got work to do. You know, we've got to, we've got to bring them over and, and keep pushing to, to get yeah. the, the Marx Leninist or Marx Leninist Maoist line uh, forward. You know, yeah. I think it's really important. Uh, and on another comment said, Ben Redwards, uh, thank you, comrade. Uh, with censorship getting worse day by day, what preparations, here's a question, what preparations should comrades be making for when the big tech monopolies kick us out of social media? This is something I've been thinking about, actually. Have you got any thoughts on this? What do we do when we get kicked off YouTube? Oh, I haven't thought of uh, <laughs> oh, I have a thought about it, but just to touch on one last thing about the point mm -hmm. of commodification of like you know anti capitalism. You got oh, think it's a very good video on that. So yes. I, I suggest people go check that out if they're into uh, that idea. Um, but yeah, on this one about if we get kicked off the platforms, huh? <clears throat> I don't think it will ever be okay. People who are very explicitly, you know, um, I'll give an idea, I'll, I'll, I'll give a, a, an allegory. This is what I mean. Mm. Uh, when the old censorship. I'll give an example. So, uh, when the when the Tsarists used to when the Tsarist police used to um, censor Lenin's works, for example, like he published in newspapers, and you have to get get the newspaper passed by a censor, and then afterwards uh, it would be published. Um, what Lenin would do is, for example, uh, instead of referring to capital directly, he would call it that book or that German book. He would say things like this. Um, he would use euphemisms and whatnot. Now, uh, with our very you know like with our modern day understanding of things. Um, the way this would be applied is that if they do kick us off, which I don't think they will, but if they do kick us off, well, we can come back just with a changed style so we wouldn't be as explicitly, you know, because you can bring forth an anti-capitalist mes message without ever mentioning socialism or Marx or Len. You can teach like concepts of, let's say, for example, imperialism and anti-imperialism without ever touching on those exact terminal, the exact terminology, you know. Mm. Um, and that's how traditionally most Marxists did it. We are living, as funny as it is, we're living in a golden age uh, right now of no censorship practically for, yeah. for Marxists. You can you have almost every uh, freedom to share these things, right? Compared to the, okay, there are difficulties now, I'm not going to lie, but it's not like fucking like 80 years ago, you know, where, you, where you're caught and you're sent to, to prison for fucking 10 years in Siberia. Do you think or Len you had would have to, complained uh, about the YouTube algorithm? <laughs> 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 it's exactly not showing right. my videos to my subscribers what the fuck <laughs> Stalin what am I doing, doing wrong <laughs> my god in case people didn't know in case people didn't know um, some of some of Lenin's works that are saved they were snuck out of prison yeah. written on backs of blank paper with bread soaked in milk that would require like this weird <laughs> this um, blank, yeah yeah, they would have to. He would have to like burn, if you want to actually read this uh, milk ink, <laughs> you would have to like uh, put it over a like a candle flame and use wax and shit like that, and then you can like look at it, look at it through the light, and you can kind of make out what the message is. And that's how Len had to get some of his stuff out of prison. Compared to that, okay, the algorithm not showing your video is really not that big of a deal. You know, if you get we'll six hundred views, if you get six hundred views on a video, that's already more people. That have seen something, then the vast majority of works that Lenin wrote, like people that that re people read that oh, Lenin right. wrote at the time that they were published, they were only read widely after the revolution was successful. Yeah. Prior to that, at most, at most, even the greatest work, even like State in the Revolution, was read by a handful, a couple of thousand people at best. That's so crazy so, to think about. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying. What I'm trying to say: uh, have faith in the creativity of people. Um, if uh, there was like a crackdown on the more explicitly anti-capitalist sort of rhetoric, you can kind of hide it. You can use euphemisms and all that. Um, and yeah, there, there will always be a, a way. If there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Absolutely, we can just have like a little website which has like a, a few different like words. We'll just substitute them. Out. When we don't talk about communism, we'll just say like I don't know, like horses. I love horses, and there you go. You know, we're talking about communism. There you go. Problem exactly solved. Right. He's busy. Just I don't know. I I do think that maybe at some point. Um, I I have heard a few people getting like knocks at their doors, not necessarily from YouTube, but mm -hmm. like. <laughs> from their governments oh no for government. sure yeah 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 <laughs> for for things that they've said online like i've heard quite a few comrades have said that online so that is mm. something that might become this you might, we might end up all doing kind of like the bay area thing like where we are like kind of like yeah. the, the voice modulators and we have to like protect our identities much more closely yeah. for sure yeah especially if we're getting mm. like any kind of revolutionary situation um yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, i think what helps is don't have a channel named huh? after yourself like me <laughs> <laughs> like a picture or something. Uh, nah, man, it's fine. I, I think oh, I God. think something that actually comes in uh, something very helpful. 
is that uh, we uh, it's very international at least now um so as a result you'll never have like streams cut off if that makes sense um if one segment of the international left that produces something uh were to be kind of like uh, more like have more uh, censorship be placed upon there will be another angle that you can approach it from right mm. um and this goes especially for example um let's say even if within the american jurisdiction things were shut down uh, I'm over here in Iraq. No, who, who the fuck is gonna, you know? Like, I can still make, I still speak it, I provide all this stuff in English, you know? So, what that's what I'm trying to get at is that uh, mm. with uh, such a diversified world too, it's a lot is easier. I'm, I'm trying to counter the the pessimism that exists in the left right now. It's mm. it's a lot easier for us. Mm. Yeah, there's there's a lot to be uh, optimistic about. So, um, well, yeah. we've got a world for to sure. win. Let's let, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the if that ain't the truth my friend yeah absolutely um Kriti, thank you very much I, I appreciate that there's a question here which is definitely uh let's <clears throat> say above my pay grade but uh casey mm -hmm. mather uh asks mm -hmm. hakeem this one's specifically for you so uh, i can't uh, <laughs> i can't i, I can't yeah. i can't take responsibility for this one hakeem yeah, no tag teaming yeah, go on hey. <laughs> <laughs> if, if i can piggyback or jump in i will but uh, this might be a little bit Good, of a wine. Yeah. Uh, above me, Hakim, could you answer how Marx's monetary theory is reconciled with fiat currency, if you know of it? If it's too long, any book yeah. recommendations? I mean, I suppose this is the whole thing, like exchange value versus like money and price, and yeah. use value, you know, use yeah. value, exchange mm -hmm. value, and like how we could, like sort of reconcile those supply and demand, mm -hmm. and like all this sort of stuff. I mean, I don't know. I think yeah. you'd probably do a better job explaining that than I could. Yes. Um. So uh, this is oh god, this is an annoying question. Um. But a very good one too. Damn it, Casey. Um, <laughs> no, no. It's, it's a, thank you. It's a good. <laughs> it's a good question because it's it's detailed and and that's and that's something that uh, a lot of the time uh, people don't uh, get. So yeah, yeah I'll, I'll try my best. Um, first of all, there is an article written by oh, there's a WordPress WordPress blog. If you write Marxism fiat currency, because I remember I looked into this many years ago um, when the Bitcoin thing first started. That's oh. why I got interested. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah, fiat um, currency. Yeah, like that's like dollars, euros. There's, you know, the you got like cryptocurrency. Yeah. Like, by the way, crazy, exactly. crazy peak at the moment in Bitcoin, it seems like. Uh-huh. Uh, I, I don't keep up with these things. Oh, but that's very interesting to hear. It, it's, it's wild. Yeah. But yeah, so um, I'd suggest uh, Googling that uh, particular um, article discusses a way deeper uh, level than I can. But a very preliminary answer is this. Uh, as I understand it, fiat currency is basically currency not backed. That's what it is. Um, and as a result of this... Is that like the, separated from the gold standards? Is that what we mean? Like is yeah. the Nixon thing? Like, I mean, it used to be backed by like um, the gold standard and then they kind of stepped away from that. Yeah. Nixon... Yeah, exactly. In the in the it started in the early twentieth century when they started moving away from like silver and gold bullion as a mm. uh, like a supporting a thing, like a backing thing for currency. Um, and in the sixties, it was like finalized in the U.S. I think, and then mm. afterwards, yeah, in the rest of the world slowly. Um, but the general thing, uh, general idea of it is that uh, it's it's more than just uh, not having the um, uh, currency be backed. It also has to do issues with with uh, tracking and whatnot mm. uh, of currency. Um, but uh, generally, the thing about it is how you can re reconcile um, monetary. What, first of all, we'll talk about what is money. Money is an expression of commodity relations, right? Uh, when we particularly talk about this, uh, this means that at the end of the day, um, it is uh, a bad substitute for um, uh, the... Uh, Oh, God, we're going to get deep. Okay, so uh, when we talk about prices, generally, right, prices hover. Specific, when, when, okay, oh, my Lord. Let's equalize do this. Um, <laughs> supply and demand. <laughs> when we equalize supply and demand, generally what happens, the price uh, hits one point, and this point oscillates around the labor quanti qu um, quantity within the commodity, right? That's how it is under capitalism. Mm. Now, how is this expressed? Because we have use values and um, exchange values. Exchange value is the money price that you see. Once this is equalized between um, supply and demand, you get the labor quantity expressed in, roughly. Um, I believe Co Paul Cockshot did research on this and many other people and found that it is a, um, what's it called, um, concordance rate or like a, it, up to like 97, 98% even. It's, it's insane how um, accurate the theory is. Um, but th that's what we're dealing with. When we talk about particular cur currency, um, back then, in order to, rather than express differing relations, 
um, of commodities in almost like a barter system, which would be matrixed, right? As a result, you instead have expression by currency, and this currency is backed by something in order to um, say, like, for example, instead of saying like, oh, uh, 10 eggs are worth two bottles of wine and two bottles of wine is worth one jacket. So one jacket is worth uh, 10 eggs or one bottle of wine is worth five eggs. And then you get a very complex matrix system. Uh, instead of this, what you can have is a expression of the commodity relations between the two. So instead of saying, oh, uh, 10 eggs equals two bottles of wine or five eggs equals one bottle of wine um, and 10 eggs equals one coat or half a coat is one bottle of wine, things like that. Instead of doing all this business, which would be incredibly difficult to keep track of, you have a expression, um, an exchange value expression, basically a money expression of these commodity relations. That's the purpose of money in the first space. Uh, and then afterwards, as Marx talks about in volume three, it gets way deeper than this. So um, now that with that out of the way, why is it that uh, monetary or Marxist monetary Marx's uh, considerations towards um, currency? Uh, why is there supposedly? Uh, oh my God, language is failing me now. Like, why does it not align this. when it happens to be um, non-backed uh, currency? Well, this is the thing. There's an assumption that's made, right? Uh, the assumption being that oh, it's not backed if there is fiat currency. Now let's look at which. The currencies really exist that are fiat currencies to my knowledge none of the currencies that currently exist um that are in widespread usage uh, i'm not talking about like bitcoin and ethereum and all this kind of stuff i'm talking mm -hmm. about actual currency dollars and yuan and and euros and whatnot right none of these currencies act as currencies that are not backed right there is still an artificial value placed upon them even if there's no goal to actually back them it's still acted like there is that's why they limit supply of currency, right? Un un unlike in what happens in some countries, like in Zimbabwe, where they, where they just print it. Um, so my point is, there is an assumption that there is disconcordance, but I do I do not know of any material evidence that all of a sudden Marx's monetary theories fail when you're considering commodity relations with fiat currencies. Now, if somebody can show me some, like if, if somebody can send me a link or something, then I'd be glad to read up, up on this some more. Um, but Generally, if you want a more in-depth look into this, first of all, you can look into volume three of Capital, number one. And number two, uh, you can, uh, again, just write fiat currency Marxism. There is one WordPress article I found years back that discussed it in a lot of detail. I remember the answer to my questions now, but I lost interest. <laughs> so I, 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 it all like left my head. Um, but yeah, so generally my point is that I don't know if really there is a discordance um, as people claim there is uh, with, with uh, Marx's monetary theory and um, uh, fiat cur currencies. That being said, though, if it is, um, I know that uh, there's a Japanese Marxist from the 70s. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yeah, uh, there's a Japanese Marxist that wrote an entire book on the topic, and it was recently translated. By recently, I mean, like, the last 15 years. Um, but it was translated, uh, like, you know... Uh, decently uh, in a close to uh, our year. And uh, I remember he discussed some other thing of, of, he discussed this topic way more deeply than I ever bothered to care about. Um, so if you're really into this, DM me after this and I'll find it for you and we can discuss this further. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I, apologies for the very scattered answer, but yeah. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things like uh, I even feel like like with capital and stuff like that. I mean, like whenever I return to capital, I'm just like, oh shit, how did I forget like all this? <laughs> it's not like you go yeah, back right, to it and yeah. you're just like, oh shit, I thought I understood yeah. this, and you go back to it and you understand like ten things more. But capital, you know, it's one of these texts that like you'll go back to it and like every time you will read it, you'll it's like you'll pick up something new every single time. You know, so uh, who mm. is it? I think David Harvey says that he he reads it like once a year. He goes back and reads capital yeah. every single time he reads it. He gets something new. So, um, so yeah, these kinds of questions yeah, are actually often quite even though they can be quite uh. They can seem quite fundamental and quite basic they're actually they can be pretty heady unless you're directly and get like unless you're actually sitting there reading capital like every day it can be quite difficult to to to, to approach these um unless you're in that mindset you know and in that mind frame so uh, so i get it <laughs> i feel it i wouldn't even attempt to answer that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah i think um i i realized uh sorry just to, as a oh. side note um the um the what's it called um WordPress article I was talking about is called The Real Movement. And the the uh, article the article title is Reply to LK, How Labor Theory of Value Destroys Fiat Money by Jehu is, is the is the um, title. So that's the one I was talking about. And that one talks about it decently and they have sourcing there that is like further reading that you can do. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was published in two, 2015. Okay, so I was right. It was many years ago. <laughs>
yeah a couple of years back all right we'll check it out if uh, people are curious um maybe we, we can share that around if people are curious i mean just send us a little message mm-hmm. and we can we can uh, we can send people in the right direction sure thing yeah Thank you, Hakim. I really appreciate that. Uh, a bunch of other questions. Let's power through. I think we've answered with like two or three questions so far. And we're like 45 minutes. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> it's perfectly fine. We're, uh, we're being very thorough. You know? right. uh, this is always how it goes. All right. Uh, come here to me. Uh, here's a question from Donald. Donald, question. Uh, question for the stream. Here's a cool mm. question. I like this I like this one a lot. Does the international communist movement need to be more mm. coordinated in its support for global south revolutions? Everything seems disjointed at the moment. What do you think? For sure, yeah. Oh my god, this is a very... Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I remember I got into a bit of a... Like, I don't know what to say. Like, a, um, uh, There's a little... A, a bit of a stir um, when I said this on uh, that discussion I had with Vosh, where I said generally... Because I was trying to be very... Because, um, uh, you know, uh, um, we're talking at two different Diplomatic. levels, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I was being exactly very diplomatic. And we're talking at two different levels, right? So instead yeah. of going really deep into the theory, I try to give a very general... Um, uh, explanation just so that he would get the idea and then we go about our day mm. um so yeah that's how you have to uh, discuss uh, when there's like a, the, the theory gap sometimes mm. um and that's by no fault of his own or no fault of mine right this these things happen the thing is though um i said there specifically i was like yeah i don't think like uh, and i was trying to be very careful with my words i was like i generally do not think that there is a high probability that there would be a revolution in the first world primarily like it's, it would be a consequence of revolution elsewhere that's my belief Right. And people kind of took that and be like, oh, he thinks that revolution in the first world is absolutely impossible. I did not say this. <laughs> 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 just relax, yeah. guys. Well, Take it down a notch. Yeah. Turn down the volume. Yeah, I, I was, yeah, I remember um, even Bad Mouse got in the DMs with me and I, we were talking and uh, he thought that that's what I said, like through the telephone game. And uh, we had a he's... conversation. No, I, I remember yeah. listening to that and I remember thinking, that, no, you were saying that like it's more likely. It's more likely that in these places yeah. there's probably going to be re- exactly. like revolution yeah. first and then, you know, it'll pro- it's more likely yeah. that it'll happen afterwards, like domino effect from like mm. the global south and, yeah. and from there. I, I I don't know. That seems like a yeah. little bit of a bad faith uh, reading of, of what you'd said. Mm. No, it's, it's, it's okay, I think, because I, I tend to speak very quickly <laughs> and uh, some people maybe then just like tune into the whole thing or stuff like that. So I can see how something might get jumbled. It's fine. Mm. Generally, though, what I was trying to do with that discussion is tying two other points. Number one, concept of labor aristocracy and social democracy and all this kind of stuff. And then number uh, two is the uh, what the Western left should do, right? Uh, and then I gave those four or five points, if uh, I recall correctly. Um, this is related to that. When we talk about, um, oh, should the international communist movement sur- like uh, tr- attempt to support in a more coherent and uh, organized way third world movements? Absolutely, 100%. How does this, when we talk about support, this means material support. I have to always reiterate this because if your support is not material, then it's not worth anything. Just putting a flag in your body doesn't mean anything, Mm, right? mm. Um, Now, how, what are the ways that material support can take place? And then how can this coherence be made or this, this, uh, like, uh, I mean, oh my Lord. uh, I'm sorry, man. No, no, you're okay. English leaves my head sometimes. You're okay. Um, Cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's cool. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, What I was trying to say is. Yeah. Uh, what I was trying to say was uh, this uh, cooperation um, for it to take place. So, th- so these two points. Um, when we talk about uh, what people on the Western left particularly should start doing in the very first form of material support uh, that they can uh, take part in is, of course, the educating and dispelling myths and stuff like that. That's the very first point they can do. And then it can take other forms, uh, sending equipment and money. And if you can get away with the guns and stuff like that, but like, don't get into that if, you're, <laughs> if it's too illegal or too dangerous where you're from. But yeah. Um, <laughs> This is something that's very easy to do where I'm from, for example, but mm. I can realize how an American can't exactly send like By the way, uh, ammo to the comrades, Philippines. I mean, that, that might not be possible for some people, but I tell you what, comrades could support you on Patreon. I send you a few euro on Patreon. <laughs> and, well, who knows what's going to happen with that? <laughs> Money. <laughs> Link in the bio. <laughs> nice little shoehorn. <laughs> <laughs> people can do you guys do whatever you want with your money if you want to support people who you like and who you think that they're useful for the movement and whatnot you do that otherwise go buy yourself a coffee and live your life i i personally do not uh, care i all the money that's sent my ways goes to uh, my student debt regardless so but yeah um wink, wink. the uh, yeah <laughs> but yeah um Generally, though, my God, this fucking... Okay, Loki, there's something I don't understand with, with the US. I don't understand how student debt, like the concept of student debt, has radicalized more people. It's already radicalized some, but I'm just the very fact that you can be crippled like this by just because you wanted to go get an education. This oh, shit is crazy. Criminal. 
my own. But anyways, yeah, what I was trying to say, so yeah, material support uh, as it should take, well, well, material forms, and that's how you actually support these movements, right? Um, and then the cooperation aspect, this has to happen in the first place when there are organiz organizations that cooperate in the first place, mm. right? You can't have just disjointed um, Marxists here and there, you know, oh, two guys in Alabama and a guy in fucking New Mexico, and, you know, you kind of support you can't support anything this way there's no actual coordination going on there's no communication there's no like international network that can be relied on if you look into the history of our movement you realize that there's there's so many um differing layers of cooperation that have existed with uh like it's almost like a james bond movie the the networks that they would create mm -hmm. right uh, and they used to do that with no internet and not, they used to do that with practically fucking pigeons. Like there was no communication back then. All right. There's maybe the telephone and letters. That's it. Which by the way, all the letters were opened up and read by sensors and they managed to develop those kind of networks. Nowadays where we have a practically, um, you can, you can have encrypted communications that nobody can access with anybody across the world. So long as they have an internet connection and we have nothing. Right. So just to mm. show like how we've fallen from grace. Um, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, a primary thing to occur is that there needs to be an organization in the first place so cooperation can occur so that um, material support for third world movements can occur. So again, dialectically, ooh, to bring that in oh. again, um, not only is it necessary for third world, third world revolutions to lay the groundwork and uh, kind of like create the material conditions for a revolution in the first world, but par like also uh, dialectically, the first world support right for these movements is, is necessary to the fact that organizations popping up and being developed in the first world can di di directly support these revolutions in the third world that then subsequently affect first world um, conditions to generate revolutionary situations that can result in revolution in the first world if that's a very long-winded way of explaining what i'm trying to say but yeah so uh, just to the to bullet point it very quickly um yes uh we should support third world movements how is this done this support needs to be material how can this material support be done through cooperation how can this cooperation be formed we need to start uh institutions or uh like groups organizations mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily parties it doesn't have to be but organizations and then in that level of bullet points that i gave you can develop uh the movement not only domestically but also internationally yeah, I mean, look, I will say that there are there are sort of international organizations there, which I think people don't really know about, for example, like the International League of People's Struggle, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Susan, like the sort of the leader of like the Philippines yeah. Communist Movement has like a, a pretty good right. organization there, which is, is worth joining up with and all kinds of organizations mm -hmm. get involved with that. Um, so th yeah. they are there. It's just people don't really know about them that much. And mm -hmm. I think there's they're slept on why. for sure. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd say look at look at those things. I would definitely check out the ILPS uh, and sort of follow the thread from there. Uh, this is all mm -hmm. this is all this is linking up all of the sort of above above ground like legal struggle side of things. Mm -hmm. Of course, obviously, mm -hmm. we're on YouTube. Yeah. <coughs> we don't do anything illegal. <laughs> Communists would never For sure. <clears throat> you, you should see our conversation off off stream. <laughs> 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 that's the, the bitch you conversation or something like that anyway um yeah brilliant uh, thank you very much comrade i, I appreciate that answer that was mm -hmm. that, that was very good and very useful yes mm -hmm. material support uh, for comrades across the world is is essential and um yeah we do need to be more linked up and i think that there's a lot of work we can do i think i i do think that um in some how can i say this uh, in a way that's delicate but also accurate there are a lot of left-wing communists left-wing and communists i don't mean left comms but there are a lot, a lot of left-wing and communist movements in the western world who mm. i think are genuinely afraid of revolution on some level oh yeah and sure. so they're a lot more comfortable just kind of coming into the social democratic path and these are many many times these are organizations that call themselves marx leninists uh communist organizations like proper communist organizations and they're just kind of committed to like euro communists mm. reformist strategies yeah. and they might be actually a little afraid afraid to oh, join okay. up with the international Busting revolution <laughs> yeah Sorry. <laughs> Here we go, anti revisionist monks. <laughs> but I mean, like, there is, well, there is a really a genuine, uh, a genuine revolutionary communist movement, uh, international communist movement, and we can link up with it, but it requires, you know, you, you do need to do a little bit of research and you do, you do need to kind of tap into that network, but uh, it is there. So for comrades who are interested, yeah. follow the thread, ILPS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um great thank you very much uh sorry i, I didn't i didn't i didn't mean to go off on a big fucking anti no, go on, man. rant there go off king <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that actually actually on that on that note there's actually there's a good question earlier on uh, that, that came up and oh. i've got it written down here but 20 good questions by the way that i've got written down here mm. the falcon general asks what are hakim's thoughts on enver hoja <laughs> and and there's a few Hello. people actually well there's a few people mm. uh enver hoja 
Tito. Mm -hmm. And actually, they asked about like Hoja, Hojaism and Tito and Titoism. Uh, they also asked mm -hmm. about Romanian communism. So I'm not sure if, oh, you, yeah, want to, yeah. if you want to touch about it. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I can. well, I can't really talk about Romanian communism. I can, I, can, I can talk a little bit on Titoism and a little bit on Hojaism if people mm -hmm. are curious. Uh, they also mm -hmm. asked a little bit about your thoughts on the balkanization of the USA, what's called the balkanization mm. of the USA, uh, decolonization, mm. the anti-colonial struggle, the right to self-determination mm. for nations mm. uh, within yeah. the territory known as the USA right now. Uh, yeah. If you had any thoughts on that. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of yeah. questions there. I'm not sure that's if you want to take massive, them. That's a massive, that's a massive question. Let's I'll give start. very quick well, let's start. Yeah, let's start points let, on each. Yeah, let's start with Hoja and Tito. Yeah. Maybe let's let's start there. Hojaism and Titoism. Sure. If you wanna, if you wanna address that first, and then we can, yeah. then we'll see where we go. All right. Yeah. Uh, before I uh, like you know just to preface this, um, there's a lot of uh, tendency within the left of finding a leader and having the name and then putting ism afterwards and then thinking that, that it becomes a coherent ideology. Mm. Um, Hojaism isn't a thing. Yeah. Neither is Titoism. Neither is Dengism. These aren't things. That's true. Right. Um, what we have is that uh, the Marxist lesson that was applied in the Albanian uh, situation, along with certain political trends that are not necessarily theoretical, they're more imposed on by the social conditions around them. Um, this goes for Titoism, this goes for quote unquote Titoism, this goes for quote unquote Hojaism, and so, so on and so forth. Mm. Now, how my, my opinions, um, all right. Hoja, not very positive. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, for a very, yeah, not very positive. Uh, various reasons. Mm. Um, I'll start. Okay. I love Hoja, by the way, so I might give a, a counterweight to this afterwards. <laughs> yeah, no, go on. Uh, but uh, just to preface this, you know, when I say like, oh, not very positive, there is like a base level of positivity that goes to all leftist movements generally mm. as, as a Marxist, yeah, right? When I say not very positive, I'm saying like, it's probably oh, like he had way more 90% good stuff, <laughs> but 10% was pretty really bad. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about yeah. that 10%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's it's the sort of, you know, like a uh, proper criticism that should be delegated, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, so Hoja's main issue, number one, was uh, in the political sphere, um, or let's say more economic sphere, is the isola uh, isolationism that they impose mm. on themselves because of their um, dogmatic anti-revisionism, which, by the way, ironically becomes revisionist in and of yeah, itself. Yeah, sorry, it was dogmatic um, revisionism, no doubt about it. Yeah. So uh, as a result of this, they imposed a sort of economic isolationism on their country that basically was the result that it ended up being dissolved. Um, so that is like one segment of it. Um, and people will be like, oh, no, it was actually Hojo was the successor, blah, 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 in the movement 1982, blah, blah, the, the, the reforms that were put in. Yes, but the groundwork was put in by the great supreme leader that was Enver Hoja. So these are things that need to be accurately and described and properly criticized. So this is number one. This is on the um, political front. On the ideological front, it was this rampant um you notice uh, this is a, 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 another um what's it called another parallel comes to my mind and it's the gonzalists um mm. i don't mean modern gonzalists generally but i mean the gonzalo the actual itself, the shining path. yeah yeah exactly the pcp um they they reached this point of uh, like anti-revisions almost of claiming no one is really as theoretically pure as themselves they were on different routes though the albanians considered them like Mar them to be the true bearer torch bearers of Marxism Leninism and oh you know China fell out of grace and the USSR fell out of grace and blah blah they had decent relations with Cuba though mm. while the PCP on the other hand just denounced everybody not not and there was nothing they were the only ones you know mm. um uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, when you reach this level of um ossification of your ideological like uh, open mindedness it's not about revisions or not you can be open to ideas you can have these discussions within the party and then you can reject the bad and keep the good right but if you completely isolate yourself ideologically from every other um like uh, island of socialism that exists around uh you end up with basically what happened in um uh in in albania where these ideological uh, uh positions informed their later economic positions um with their economic isolationism and cutting diplomatic ties and stuff like that which then informed their political um uh, conditions which then resulted in their uh, a dissolution so it's a very um like a difficult ground to tread on but mm. generally this is uh you know and then finally the final point was the oh lord uh, this was a generally almost all the eastern european um uh, countries had this as an issue mm. they're anti-religious campaigns this is some oh, of the yeah. stupidest shit i've seen in my life and it was taking to such a ridiculous extreme in albania right even the ussr which has a ba very bad track record um the what the Soviets did um, from the mid twenties throughout up until the sixties um, to religious communities is the reason to this day that you can go to a buttfuck middle of nowhere village uh, anywhere across the world and be like, hey, you know, um, 
you can go, yeah, you can go to a, a village in the middle of nowhere. You can be like, hey, yeah, social, social, blah, blah, blah. And then this probably peasant who probably has some sort of spirituality in their life will immediately come back with, oh, no, but uh, socialism is an atheistic ideology, so it's, it's not a good thing. The amount of damage this has done has so greatly outweighed whatever possible ideological motivation that could have been preceded it, right? Mm. That it basically rendered it fruitless. Not only fruitless, it has set back the movement quite a bit, mm. right? Um, and the, and the, what made it worse is then the, the, this sort of stuff was adopted by all the like you know copycat uh, parties that existed around the world. The Iraqi Communist Party being prime amongst those, they just kind of uh, placed anything that the Soviets did. They were like, you know what, we're just going to do exactly that. Um, yeah. And that's why they ended up fucking the, uh, the the collectivization they did in Iraq when they did have power, and then they were taken out of power. Um, this is and the same reason with their uh, religious policy. They just kind of copy and pasted what the Soviets did with Albania specifically. What happened was um, they did ridiculous stuff like oh um names if you have any name that has any religious significance of any kind which usually meant only muslim names by the way if you look at their ledgers surprisingly christian names remain a a across in many of them because those names were considered even like oh like long term because of their greek origin originally blah, blah blah all that kind of crap right so basically it's this sort of um it's a chauvinistic yeah not only this but like honestly and let's talk about this just like very candidly mm. okay suppose you actually do want to uh, follow an anti-religious campaign which is stupid that you shouldn't um you can have an education campaign you can have a secularization campaign but you shouldn't have an anti-religious one because if you've learned human psychology is like this if you if there's something somebody holds and you resist it very strongly they're going to push back on you right mm. um so that's what ended up happening for example in chechnya um chechens were known to be well, practically alcoholics <laughs> to be like very candid with you chechens were known to be alcoholics and then the russians came in with their stuff and then what ended up happening was uh, they became very entrenched into their uh, like islamic characters that they had to the point that they exist now where they're a very devout population so all the stuff all the um prosecution that the early soviet state carried out against these people Right, ended up further entrenching and causing the the opposite of what they desired. Hmm. Um, which, by the way, the, the desire in and of itself is kind of sketchy. But with Albania, the reason what happened was not only did they they attack names, and particularly of sub ethnic groups. This happened in Bulgaria too with the Turks, um, the Polacks in Bulgaria. They did the same thing, um, specifically targeting them as an ethnic group. Um, the destruction of uh, religious communities and and houses of worship in Albania, you couldn't even learn Arabic. You know, even out of interest, like just as a thing, you could, you were not allowed to physically learn Arabic in fear that you're actually going to go and teach uh, um, any sort of Islamic text or something. Like mm. this goes to, this is a pathology. And you wonder why, why was it like this? Why is it that in Cuba, they had a more, let's say, moderate anti-religious campaign that kind of made some level of sense, at least, you know, because the Catholic Church did exist as a force of oppression in the country. And they kind of countered that, but there were still some progressive Catholic movements that even joined the revolution, blah, blah, blah. Why did that happen, for example, in Cuba, while in Albania, it was so, like, um, venomous against religion, and particularly Islam, particularly. Why? Mm. Because most of the leader leadership, right, of the uh, communist early communist movie uh, movement in Albania were Muslim origin, and they all had a bone to pick, mm. right? I'm not gonna. Yeah, people like, will, can try to dress it however way they want. They had a bone to pick, and as a result, they kind of took out their anger. Hoja being primary amongst them, right? Uh, Hoja came from a long line of uh, educated Muslim clerics because his his family line. That's it's in his name, Hoja. Hoja is a Persian um, uh, origin, um, in a position within the. Uh, certain Islamic hierarchies. Uh, this is a long uh, discussion that goes no, elsewhere. Important. But, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, yeah, so it's, it, this is the thing. Um, but fundamentally, the Albania failed for many reasons, but it's not a particularly good example to uphold. And Hoja's example is not a particular example, good example to uphold because of economic uh, isolation that was kind of ideologically motivated, their supreme rigidness in their ideological positions, um, and finally, uh, their, um, what's it called? Uh, let's say socio political um uh, uh, oh lord was directives that they mm. gave particularly in regards to religion but other things like names all right why why does it matter that a guy is named Omar and why should he be forced to change his name or a child could not be named Omar even if this person's completely secular why does it matter if they're named something other than what would have been considered a traditionally traditionally illyrian name yeah some dumb shit. this sort of silly name. Yeah. So yeah, this, really sorry, this went on way longer for on Hoja, but I'm trying, no, just no, trying no, to okay. drive a point home on these things. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's... And for any... Sorry, go ahead. Hmm? There I go. Yeah, yeah, what I was trying to say was uh, for anyone who might think like, oh, you know, maybe I'm being a bit too hard. 
I'm not saying that the Albanian example is not a good example in other things. Albania's, for example, industrialization was a good example. They industrialized fairly quickly. Um, their collectivization of agriculture was well done. Um, they developed heavy industry to a very nice degree. It's something that other places did not manage to the same level. Hungary didn't do it to the same level that Albania did, for example. Right. So they did have many victories. Right. Uh, they supported certain African movements, too, um, of course, because based on ideological motivations, really. But mm. um, like, oh, against the Soviets, uh, you know, like this kind of stuff. But they did try to. Right. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. They, they they had a lot of a lot of success. If, if do you mind? I, I mean, I, I if you want to go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I just I do want to give the other side because we did kind of say that, like, the, there's obviously a lot. To, there's a lot to appreciate here. I actually I agree. I mean, there definitely was a dogmatic revisionism. Uh, they're just dogmatically adhering to something that was kind of outdated at that stage. And they were just trying to sort of rigidly uh, impose that on on the country. And they didn't really move forward. It was very much kind of like a backward looking thing, maybe a slightly conservative impulse, kind of a backward looking impulse. As you said, very, very harsh when it comes to like religion and stuff like that uh, i think these are these are all really really useful uh, and important critiques to be made of it with that being said i think there's a lot of stuff that we should look at uh, a lot of stuff we can learn from like yeah. for example like if you look at albania like i mean really like we're talking like post World War Two. It was literally the poorest nation in Europe. It was, yeah. uh, if you look at like 1938, the uh, life expectancy in Albania was 38 years old by the time mm. Hoji was finished. Uh, but but before like the fall of it there, it was doubled. over 70. It was doubled. Yeah, I mean, so that's really yeah. well. full electrification of the country. You know, full electrification. <laughs> that's that's why the literacy rate expanded unbelievably. They got it up to I think it was like 95. Yeah. percent They got it up at the end, whereas I think beforehand I think it was like about 30 percent, 20 percent, 30 percent, something yeah. like that. They had the lightning campaigns for literacy. Yeah, amazing stuff. They they did really really yeah. good stuff there i think really it was sort of like the first the first maybe like 20 years i think was pretty good i think for like from the 70s yeah. like the mid 70s onwards things got pretty fucked the stagnation yeah they got sta it got stagnant and um, they got really into as you said like this isolationism uh the, the holier than thou kind of thing i can kind of i can understand it look i can understand there there, there are massive problems with like post stalin ussr there are massive problems yeah. with like obviously after mao died china took like a very different path and he was very critical of that and okay fair enough mm -hmm. there's criticisms that can be made there and so on and so forth we, that's probably a different conversation conversation and um, so i can understand the context he's, he's coming from uh, and why things could have been so much better before then and, and after then things got kind of tough in the 80s of course it was a very very tough time it's, it's kind of all across eastern europe as well all these countries you do see like the late 70s is kind of the period when everything gets really fucked up <laughs> like everything gets really bad massive economic downturns everything gets really really difficult yeah and uh, like that that's that's very much true uh, in, in albania actually i but, but personally i would say we should uphold albania i say like albania is like like top three yeah. for me like the top three like i would say it's like it's really like mouse mouse china uh, stalin's ussr and albania are like really solid examples of socialism uh, does that mean we shouldn't have the criticisms no absolutely not we need to have the criticisms you need to and there all the criticisms criticisms you've made are 100 percent on point really important criticisms but i do think that they were actually they were actually socialists in a way that a lot of other countries yeah. might be a little bit more like ambiguously so and, uh, mm -hmm. and i think it is really important that we do uphold uh, these traditions even if we uphold them yeah. critically critical support i think is important emphasis on the critical exactly yeah. <laughs> you, you, said, no, you, you said it beautifully exactly that yeah i don't want to in case anybody misunderstands me i'm not trying to say that albania is a bad example not at all even romania which i personally think that is i think romania is the worst example of socialism that we have is still not a bad example yeah it's, right? better it's just the worst out of a list <laughs> yeah but uh, 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 <laughs> but albania party is not a bad example it's just that there are certain things that they did they went they went to extremes that other nations that didn't go mm. to and these things should be criticized but as you said for example like their uh industrial their heavy um industry and the way they built it this is there's a dearth of research on this and this is something that should be actually looked into by communists of similar uh, country geographic co communities and whatnot uh communists from similar countries because there's so much to be learned from what they did mm. and you're 100 right it's just like we say it's better to it's better to criticize because uh again like uh, just a minor minor just side note one mm. sentence two sentences um, a lot of the time, uh, because we deal with uh, anti-communist stuff all the time, we always end up talking about the good, right? But now we're in the company of Marxists, and when we're, when we're we in the go heavy, of <laughs> yeah, exactly. We should focus most of exactly right, yeah. Most of our talk should be criticism, not yeah. praise, because I already know you know all the praise. I already know all the praise. If you want, both you and I can lock arms and start singing anthems and shit like that. We can have a, a jolly old time <laughs> after like a three-hour mark. <laughs> yeah, maybe, 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 right, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, when it comes to like criticism, it is the most important thing because that's what makes us grow as socialists, mm. right? As Marxists. So yeah. Um, as for 
Titoism, should oh, we move on? To yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's a good contrast as well. I mean, because it's quite an yeah. interesting experiment what happened there, and we can have a, we probably have a yeah. lot of criticisms, a lot, a lot of positives, a lot of negatives. Uh-huh. We can say as well. Come here to me. I, do, I, I, re- I'm, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm embarrassed to this, but I need to run to the bathroom. Do you mind go if ahead, I yeah. run to the bathroom while you, while you take that for, for a minute or two? Sure thing. Yeah, go ahead, have you? No worries. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, hopefully it won't take a minute or two. Hopefully I'll be back. <laughs> no, no, go, go ahead, go take your time. Fam. It's all right. <laughs> okay, back in a moment. Okay, so Titoism. Sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the general question while uh, Paul is uh, going to do his business <laughs> is that um, uh, the uh, all right so T- like like Paul said uh, Tito and his experiment it's nice it's not only his it's the entire administration there's a whole group of people right um, no great man of history stuff here uh, the contrast is nice in that they were a lot more socially liberal let's say like in their uh, approach um, but they were wrong poli- uh, economically you know, so they made the mistakes that um, Albania did, but in the inverse. Um, so they had proper, they had nice social policies. They had the, the, the uh, what's it called? Uh, friendship and brotherhood. I don't remember what, it's, what the exact uh, term, um, but uh, I know people know what I'm talking about. Um, between the different uh, ethnic groups and religions and, and, and the other groupings that existed within Yugoslavia, which is an incredibly diverse line. So socially, they were, they had positive experience. When it comes to their economic sphere though they never graduated from that you know very primitive structure of what they like to call oh self-administration it's real socialism no it's not um because you have cooperative um uh just to like avoid stepping on any toes the way i can describe it like uh, is like this when you have cooperatives uh within the economy right and you don't develop them into anything further what happens you have individual firms. Let's say we put all the individual cooperative firms on a single level. They're all equal. As time goes on, they're because they're uh, competing against each other, some of them win in the competi- competition and some of them lose, right? As a result of the winning and as a result of the losing, certain enterprises grow in wealth and, you know, and, and resources and whatnot, and other uh, enterprises fail um, or just end up in having a really bad time. When they end up having a really bad time, two things can happen. Number one, they need support from the state directly to keep them afloat because it's a socialist country. You can't just let these things fail. Uh, and number two, the ones that are uh, enlarging can begin to kind of monopolize capital, even to a certain extent. And can I just ask, um, are, are we, oh, we're talking with Tito's Yugoslavia at the moment or? Yeah, yeah, and cooperatives. Okay. Right? Right, I was right. basically just giving a, a thing. I was like, uh, why is the cooperative system? They, they stayed within a cooperative system and they never kind of graduated beyond that. Why that's bad? Um, the self-administration system that they try to paint as it's, oh, this is the real socialism, mm. unlike what they have in the Soviet Union yeah. or elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The, the reason that this is, they didn't, what they were doing wasn't wrong. It's just that it was missing something. And I'll tell, I'll, I'll mention what that something is in a second. Please. Uh, imagine One if you have all the cooperatives, see. just to reiterate very quickly, if you have all the cooperatives on an equal basis, some cooperatives, there's competition, they compete with each other. Some cooperatives win out and become more wealthy and, and uh, have more influence. It, more the capital. anarchy of capitalism Others is still in full effect. Yeah. The anarchy of the market. I think is the still... anarchy of the market. Exactly. And that's why my personal opinion is market socialism is not socialism. But Agreed. we can get into that. Big later, agree. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but what happens is that uh, there, the stratification happens where the one, the enterprises that win out gain capital, gain influence. Uh, and as a result, they can even begin to monopolize capital, as I mentioned earlier, while the ones that lose out, lose out bad. Uh, and the thing is, because it's a socialist country, they can't just fail. So what happens is the state has to step in right to keep these things afloat artificially so when the state steps in to keep these afloat it needs money and how did they get that money they got it through imf loans yes and they got imf loan after imf loan after imf loan to artificially sustain a system that was based on the contradictions of the market right and there's a reason why every marxist worth their salt eventually kind of talks about the elimination of markets nobody talks about it remaining indefinitely Right. At best, at best, it could be an intermediary step towards the construction of socialism. Mm. At best, that's the presence of more. That's the, the limit of what you have. Just like you cannot okay. have com- uh, communism with the existence of commodities. Right. Um, you yeah. cannot have socialism with the existence of markets. That's yeah. my personal opinion and kind Strongly of agree. theory kind of says this too but i'm trying not to step any on any toes right now <laughs> look just go <laughs> for it fuck it it doesn't matter it's fine yeah. we 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 we're, we're yeah. as you said we're among <laughs> marxists we can be a little bit more critical we get it and I, i'm sure people will that take some true. good faith people definitely won't blow this stuff up to really extreme proportions and, <laughs> and <laughs> that <laughs> never happens do you know the left how you mean? <laughs> Oh, yeah. what, I, what i was trying what i'm saying what i'm trying to like get the, the point i'm trying to get across is that the fundamental error in this cooperative system is that they never got above 
cooperatives that kind of exist um, autonomously within just a loose state governance of these things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a reason that the state should have this is okay. What the Yugoslavs did was they had too much, let's say, worker democracy without any state oversight. And what the Soviets did was they had too much state oversight without enough worker democracy, mm. right? Even though they still there was presence of worker democracy to an extent within the Soviet Union, this is something that's undeniable in all the history, uh, all the history and research proves this. Um, but it still was not enough. I'm saying, and the Yugoslavs did the inverse, right? Uh, mm. you, you just kind of let them be on their own, and you allowed a market to exist. And yeah, what you need is kind of a mixing of the two, right? You need to have sufficient state oversight for these things and as well as um uh, sufficient levels of uh worker participation uh in these enterprises um what does this culminate in this culminates in uh, a something that requires political will really which is the elimination of the market and that was the fundamental issue that yugoslavia always suffered with yeah. and as in the end tore it apart um, because guess what? When you have, let's say, differing republics within, and different republics have different enterprises, and certain enterprises within said republics get very wealthy, then you end up getting stratification within the nation itself, right? Mm -hmm. And then that can then be backed with national chauvinist rhetoric and stuff like that, um, which can then result in, well, exactly what ended up happening, the tearing apart of Yugoslavia and the various civil wars and other wars that occurred in the region in the early 90s up until it finally calmed down in the early, early 2000s. Right, um, and they're always on the brink of something. You can talk to Yugo Pnik about. <laughs> I think if we had Yugo Pnik on this recently, six hours later. Yeah. So that's and too much alcohol. This is actually, I would love. I've never, sp I've never spoken to him about this. I, I'm, I should. I'm gonna make a mental note to to make write that about this. Uh, I, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to hear his his thoughts about my perspective on this. But this is the era with Titoism. Tito mm. himself, though, was a very just like Hoja himself was a. They were cool guys because what they're um, national heroes for their countries. Oh, yeah. They fought. Both, both of them fought guerrilla uh, wars against um, the Nazis. Specifically, Tito was successful to a ridiculous degree. They even they even got an air force at the end of it. That's how well Yugoslavia is the only country I believe that was um, liberated uh, completely without Soviet uh, like direct military boots on the ground Soviet uh, aid. They got weapons and stuff like that, but they didn't. Um, uh, they liberated themselves. Like this is the sort of uh, achievement that is uh, unparalleled, right? Um, mm. Yeah. So my, my my point being is that yeah, again, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of bad. The primary bad thing is this over reliance on cooperatives. Just a side note: if yeah. you're very interested in failures of cooperative, uh, not failures, but why cooperatives are untenable, um, Cockshaw discusses this on in in a book he uh, wrote on econophysics um, and how the law of entropy um, applies to um, cooperatives within a market, particularly enterprises within a market and mm -hmm. uh, wealth distribution. Uh, within a market system it is incredibly interesting mm. um so i think he even made a video on it recently um but if you're not uh if, if you can't find that um he does have a book on it the pdfs are online but you should support him so buy the book directly um very very interesting work it's the sort of forefront i think of modern analysis of, of capitalism and and uh, the prospects of socialism that hasn't happened for the past maybe 30 years or so and uh Cockshot and several other writers are kind of at the forefront of this so check out uh, his his book on econophysics hmm. um yeah good point and also rose yeah. luxembourg's uh reform revolution uh chapter seven of course as well i mean she has hmm. a full like, chapter dedicated to diving into like co-ops that's more relevant to co-ops under capitalism and the, the potentiality for them hmm. like uh, leading to socialism in the for future. sure but um yeah definitely yeah, i think yeah. with the two of those two of those texts i think people will be will pretty well set to yeah have a concrete analysis yeah, of it yeah, for sure yeah, exactly sorry i forgot to mention luxembourg as well and i think the last part of that question was talking about romania as well mm, yeah romanian social i don't know that yeah. much about romanian socialism actually do you do you want to talk, do you yeah. talk about that sure yeah um romania had uh the inverse of both of the other two um so they weren't socially extreme in like um let's say in this like almost secularization to the point of become forming making the state religion like albania and not to the form where they were kind of very liberalized like they were in uh, yugoslavia they were interestingly fairly socially conservative mm. uh, in their application of socialism so that's one uh, point of error what did this show up in in social stuff for example the outlawing of abortion um on the front of it they were like oh you know it's uh, it's because of to increase um uh, like uh, the, the the population rate and stuff like that um but there are ways that can that can be incentivized like in the soviet union where you give like kind of tax credit sort of things 
um, rather than just kind of outlawing it and having women, ha forcing women to undergo very dangerous like home abortions. Jesus, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too real so in Ireland. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, uh, you have direct experience in this. Yeah, yeah, the Soviet Union did it way more intelligently. On paper, they were like, you know what? It's quote unquote not allowed um, because we want to maintain the population. Because after World War II, they lost twenty something million people. They need to have yeah. children. Like this is so, uh, this is a question of like uh, worker shortages and stuff like that, labor shortages particularly. Um, so this is kind of like the survival of the nation. We need to have kids, right? But the way they did it was they gave ta um, tax credits. So what the, what what did this mean? They because like in my most recent video, I talked about taxes were practically non-existent in most socialist countries. Mm. And so in the Soviet Union, you'd have very small rates of income tax and property tax and stuff like that. Even these small rates would be cut the more kids you had, right? Um, so you could live a, your life completely normally, right? But if you wanted even more, um, which by the way, uh, at a point of having your like home provided and education and healthcare and stuff like that, then it's just like cash in your pocket, basically. Um, yeah, like you could have more kids. And, and you got state support. Uh, uh, in China, early on, they did this as well. Um, things like this. Uh, I think Cuba had a similar system. Yeah. What they did instead was this thing. Another thing was the LGBT stuff. Most socialist countries of, pre, of, of yesteryear yeah. weren't the best on these things, right? Some of them were better than others. Um, but yeah, and, and uh, Romania was not one of those better than others. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, so that was uh, an issue. Another thing, um, ethnic... Uh, there was like this ethnic uh, homogenization that was attempted in Romania um, to the level of, yeah, like, yeah. So like linguistic and historical and stuff like that. Um, and it, yeah, so it was almost, almost dystopian that, that level. So these sort of Jesus. things, um, these levels of social conservatism, that was bad on the economic sphere. Mm. They had a focus on heavy industry that they got as a kind of hand-me-down from the Soviets, uh, which was also equally not the best thing that they did. Um, because then it resulted in, uh, like the shortages of the, of the, of the eighties, um, and consumer goods, um, despite the fact that they did not liberalize like the other economies of the, of Eastern Europe. So they still had those errors. So that's another one of those mistakes. Um, there's several other, uh, several other things. There was a uh, certain, uh, like levels of democracy that are limited. There was, um, what's it called? The uh, regional level democracy that was active, like in most social countries, but even the, in the higher levels, there was a lot of, uh, um, yeah, it was it was a lot of show. Uh, it was it's not an exactly a good example to give. With all that being said, though, remember what I said before. Even as the worst example of socialism, in my opinion, that I, uh, Romania being the worst example like this, it was still better. Um, so better than, than capitalism. Like the, yeah, it's still better than capitalism. There's still um, full employment. There's still uh, education and healthcare. There was still um, like the national development of culture and stuff like that. Mm. It was still a progressive force generally, but there are things that needed to happen that were um, very dire, let's say. Mm. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the failure of, of Romania uh, in that regard. But also, yeah, with that being said, it did not deserve to have a, a CIA NATO sponsored coup. Yeah. Um, so. Mm -hmm. I guess that, I think that's that for that question. And the final part of that question was talking about the indigen uh, indigenization and the balkanization of the U.S., I believe, mm. right? Yes, yes, absolutely. The anti-colonial struggle in the U.S. Yeah. I wanted to talk on that a little bit. Yeah. It's yeah, a big, and, that's uh, another that, huge, that's a huge say, yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, it's a really big question. I think uh, it's much better presented to a person who's American and uh, who's educated in these matters, particularly maybe an indigenous American, because mm. uh, neither I or uh, Paul, I believe, and I we think are not agree with me on this. Americans. <laughs> yeah, we can't we're not. We this. don't have the necessary. Yeah, exactly. We don't have the necessary information. But from what I, the little that I do know, it's that uh, if there was to happen, if a revolution is to happen within the U.S., then there's going to have to be a radical redrawing of the borders with the appropriate right given to the particular sub nationalities of the U.S., including um, the a African American origin people, um, Chicanos, and the indigenous, and all these sort of things. And this is stuff that the Americans will have to kind of discuss amongst themselves and of course give the forefront of the uh, like you know the, the loudspeaker the main voice should be to those indigenous communities that have been the most oppressed for the longest time agreed um but yeah i do believe that it would eventually result not necessarily maybe not in a balkanization per se but more of like a a union well that so sounds extreme the, uh, like balkanization you know like when we say balkan yeah. it sounds like you're just like mm -hmm. every single centimeter of the country is just like obliterated and it's own like new territory or something like yeah. it, it sounds very extreme but i mean like 
Uh, but like for example, there there are obvious examples like places like Guam or like Puerto Rico or something like actual colonies mm. like that actually yeah, you know yeah, yeah. they're they're probably if they want to go off and do their own thing if they, if they want freedom you know mm. we have to, as Marxist Leninists as Marxist Leninists males we need to support their right to self determination mm. we don't have to support it but we have to support the right to it you know I think that's that's yeah. important like the the classic Bolshevik yeah. line on it you know so uh, and probably most of these probably most of these places people will decide to stay but um yeah I, I do think we need to be open for it and and as you said like i think people mm. there will have a much better take on this than than we mm. ever possibly could so yeah. listen listen for to sure, yeah. listen to them comrades mm. Mm. exactly uh, i just realized i just wanted to take a look um there's 585 people watching wow i did not think anybody would care nearly enough to come listen to me to me ramble well the king's on i now <laughs> i keep slaying down the I, lot. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I feel even worse now, actually, because this has been really... Okay, in my opinion, this has been kind of a shit show. I've, I've been very scatterbrained today. Oh, come on. This has been uh, great. So, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if people don't feel like they're getting their money's worth on me right now, which is, I mean, time's worth, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, this has been great. This has been really, really good. And I really, really appreciate you being here. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I'm having a good time. Yeah. And it seems like... I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems hey, like they're. Uh, I'm not gonna well, lie. So. Okay, the only reason I came, the only reason I came on this is to hear Paul's voice. Okay, there could oh. be zero people watching. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do my uh, my deep voice here, comrades. Let's talk in exactly, deep voices. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so this yeah. is radio it's, it's, voice. It's, it's... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Paul, Paul Moore and after uh, you know, late night Paul Moore after oh, ASMR. Oh, Paul to, to Moore. be to, to be candlelit and to run my my fingers through Paul Moore's hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god Akeem, we need to wait till we're off air before we can <laughs> okay all right, all right before we get it before we get too too that. far down in the the, the bromance path <laughs> anyway okay yeah uh, thank you very much that was that was a that was a really really good answer there um listen to the listen to the comrades uh in what's now called the united states of america i think that they'll have a much better answer and be able mm. to answer this much more concretely for sure uh, than we will be so mm. uh thank you very much uh there's a bunch of other comments here uh Michael Parenti, a comrade called Michael Parenti. Great, great name. A little picture and all. It's got a little picture. Um, Paul, what is, this is for you, Hakim, what is Hakim's opinion mm. on groups in Europe mm. or, quote, first world countries taking a Marxist Leninist Maoist approach? So MLMs, Western um, MLMs. I would ask him to define what. Uh, yeah, I would ask him <laughs> to define what he exactly means by a Marxist Leninist Maoist approach. Mm. If, because. Uh, Okay, uh, this may be a controversial take, but bring 100 Marxist Leninist Maoists in a room and ask them what they should be doing, you're going to get 100 answers, I've seen, um, <laughs> in my personal experience. Yes, it's um, usually it's, diverse, yeah. yeah. There's some who will be very like no. very similar to MLs and some who will be, look, I, I don't know, like, I, I can't even say. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, they're very principled comrades in my experience, and a lot of them are very well-read. Um, and what I love is a lot of them are, are well-read, not only about the general stuff, but also they have like these niche topics that they go into and sometimes like sometimes uh, there's some people in my dms that uh, i love reading the the stuff that they write um mm. so yeah uh, but but with that said though um what i would say is yeah like i would like to get a definition of what that exactly means uh, to say mlm approach if what is meant is uh, organization building at first and agitation and stuff like that sure go for it if you mean protracted people's war Please, please, please do not do anything of the sort in a highly developed industrial nation, right? Um, why? Why is this not really a, like a viable option, right? Because the very nature of protracted people's war um, is the idea that uh, you can surround the urban centers, right? You need to have a different class structure. This is a movement or an idea that some people like to say is universal. I mean, to an extent, it can be considered to be. But in a high, like, let's say, let's hypothetically take Sweden. This is not something that can be, that can happen in Sweden. Mm. Why? Because at the very base, what you need for a protracted people's war is the support of the people. And the situation has to be, has to get very bad in these places for them to even approach armed, uh, like armed, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, armed conflict mm. um, for them to even consider uh, this as a viable path, right? Um, so it really depends on the local conditions, but I think I can't think of a single place in Europe currently that could benefit from this. I don't think even Iraq could um, uh, is currently a candidate for a protracted people's war of any kind. Um, at least as it currently stands, there needs mm. to be organizations that start to, to bring. Okay, let me give a nice example. How did the, uh, the Gonzales movement even start? Um, at first, of course, Gonzales was teaching university in a particular province. I know this is a story that's like, this is like what MLMs read to their children practically, um, <laughs> right? 
and and uh, the cadres that were recruited from not only the students but fellow um, staff in the university going into the indigenous communities and then developing a movement with proper political organization with associated um, negative conditions that existed across the country, but particularly for uh, a the, the indigenous, right? So it was a very targeted view. So you can all knew what had to be done. And the very first thing that occurred was you, the, the um, identification of the fundamental uh, contradiction that existed in the country and also the formation of a political group, particularly it, can be a, it's a, it was a party in that case, doesn't always have to be a party, and then proper political education. And when these three bricks were fucking, were put place at, at first, um, then finally you can build the structure upon to, uh, on top of that, which is the revolution. So yeah, my, my, this is a very long way of saying <laughs> define what you mean by MLM approach. If well, you mean starting by what Gonzalo did, which is building organizations, then yes, for sure, 100%. If you mean going, picking up the gun, no, uh, do not do that. Can I say, I, I think that this is uh, an important point of clarification, uh, which I see a lot of people get a little mm -hmm. bit confused about. With regards to the MLM mm -hmm. approach, ac across the spectrum of MLM thoughts, uh, the PPW, mm -hmm. it's not actually it's not actually agreed that that hasn't been scientifically proven true, like a world historical revolution, that this is universally applicable. So I think that that's a really yeah. important thing. Mm -hmm. Like, like this hasn't been proven. Like, people think that this might be correct. Uh, there's a lot of people who think, well, yeah, it just yeah. makes sense. Like, rather than having some, like, one big mm -hmm. blow-up insurrection, it makes more sense that it'd be, like, a more of, like, a low-level, protracted struggle, a people's war struggle mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Um, and... It, but it, there, there isn't a full consensus on that, like in the MLM terrain. So I, I think that that's important. Actually, uh, Jose Jose Maria Sison, like from the from the Philippines Party, has actually written quite a bit about this. Uh, on you know, yes. he talks with this on the so-called universality of protected people's war. He's got a great uh, article about that. I've linked it in the chat, in the live chat there for people who are curious. Mm -hmm. Hacking, I can send it to you afterwards if you're curious. And um, he mm -hmm. he's yes. he's talked a lot about this, and obviously he's like <laughs> he knows how to build like he's, a genuine yeah. revolutionary communist movement. And but he 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 very much falls on the side of like mm, I, I'm not sure if this actually is universally applicable um at least the protracted nature isn't universally applicable the way we think for like you know like in in, in Mao's china and so on yeah. and so forth but there might be there might be an argument to be made for for general for general more general protracted uh, armed struggle uh, rather than what we think of as being like the traditional uh, ppw strategy of like enclosing the cities from the outside and so on and so forth so exactly yeah i i, I think there's something to the protracted struggle rather than focus on like an interactionary Agreed, kind of model yeah. Um, and I think that that's, this has actually been borne out in Ireland as well. Like through like the Republican the armed, the armed struggle uh, in Ireland, you can actually see this happening like in kind of you know first world country, like an imperialist kind of country, like an imperialist core. Like we've actually had this. We've actually had this kind of guerrilla warfare. Yeah. This this kind of low level um, <laughs> terrorist action in many, in many ways, what people call it that. But um, it was yeah. that kind of protracted armed struggle. And I, I think that there are yeah. elements of PPW in there that people maybe yeah. don't draw comparisons if, with. If but I actually could build there. up on that point specifically, yeah. yeah. Gonzalo um, talked about, by the way, the, the Irish Republicans uh, in Ireland, like in the in the troubles, yeah. like in the 70s, mm -hmm. stuff like that as well, as uh, in, in some circumstances. I'm not going to say, by the way, it was mm -hmm. a PP, I'm not saying that it was a PPW, but I'm just saying yeah, that yeah. There, there was a protracted element to it that I think mm -hmm. is important to take, in mind, exactly. to take into account. Yeah, exactly right. Just to clarify so people understand what I mean. Um, like you gave a very good example with the, uh, with the with the within Ireland. Um, the thing is that existed in Ireland that is different from practically all the other European countries is that the Irish population had a revolutionary nature in particularly number one in resisting the British and number two uh, uniting all of Ireland. Right. Mm. There is a thing even to today. I think even your, struggle, yeah. Exactly. In your own experience, you can talk to a teenage, an Irish teenager and loosely talk about this stuff. And they're going to be like, yeah, fuck the British. And uh, we should, Take you know, arms, yeah. uh, yeah, exactly. Or at least unite it, the, uh, the entire nation. Genuine, yeah. genuine. Like it's it's a genuine thing. Like it's just, it's just like there's there's yeah. this tradition of armed struggle as being like uh, upheld. It's exactly. just like that's just what you do. If, you know, mm. especially with young people, yeah. young guys. What I'm trying to say is, yeah, this is. Oh, sorry, sorry. To cut no, you no, off. sorry. I didn't mean I was I was going off on a yeah. tangent. You go, you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, but what I'm trying to say is that there was popular support for the idea. That's what I'm trying to say. And mm. this is something that doesn't exist elsewhere. As for the point yeah. on universality, a protracted people's war, um, this is something as well. There's, uh, I agree with the controversy. The reason I'm on the fence of, uh, okay, I'm on the other side of the fence. I don't think it's universal. Um, the reason I kind of kept it ambiguous is because I said this I, in a in a uh, voice chat thing um, that I did like a, two years ago at this point. Mm. Somebody also asked me this question. And I remember I was like, yeah, I don't think it's universal. And I got flooded with comments of people sending me all sorts of articles about oh the supposed universality and i realized that a lot of these people um a, a good chunk of them also considered themselves mlms and i was like hold on i thought the mlm position was not and then i realized i was like okay it's a very it's a con it's a still evolving tradition mlm um and there's people on one side and people on the other 
yeah so uh again if i uh, miss uh represented your particular or like a, if there's an mlm in the chat and they disagree with me um my personal experience with many different mlms has given me different many different opinions mm -hmm. so sometimes i try to be ambiguous sometimes i try to be more specific but yeah and also by the way the quote unquote the the cardinal mlm documents and i'm talking about the compiled works of gonzalo that mm -hmm. um foreign language press has and the rain documents they and make it clear and, to uh, yeah. paul's work and all that kind of stuff they are not as uh, <laughs> they they don't all like fit into a neat mosaic as everybody considers them to be at least in my personal experience mm. um but yeah, this is a conversation a whole different conversation for another time mm. oh i love but the conversation yeah, uh, well, I, loads I of people I, have I asked loosely, mm. loads of people have asked specifically mm. about this and a lot of people are curious about mm. your thoughts on mlm and stuff like that so i mean it this does it does mm. touch on a bunch of different questions so people are, are bound mm. to find this uh, useful so uh, thanks very much for, for diving into mm. that question and for giving your take on it and, and i hope the comrades uh, has found this mm. has found this useful so um i i, I think that you're pretty you're quite a uh, pro mass line and cultural revolution if i'm not mistaken is that yes for sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're pretty you much. Know, I, I say it's this just, as a, it's the PPW uh, is the only is the only thing in MLM that you're not like 100 percent sure about. No, not even not not even that. This is something I always find funny. Um, I call myself a Marxist Leninist, right? Um, and then people will come to me as like, oh, that must mean you know, blah 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 blah. It's like, no, you know what's funny is if you're MLM, practically we we probably agree on 95 percent of things, yeah. right? Um, and then people will be like, then why don't you just call yourself MLM? It's like I. This is then we get to a philosophical point where I do not believe that there has been a rupture between Marxism and Leninism and MLM personally. And then this is where, ooh, everybody, you know, a lot of people have also been like, oh, what does, you know, and I had people in my DMs also uh, discussing this. I had very nice uh, conversations on this point. Mm. Um, but from my personal experience, uh, reading the necessary documents, um, that uh, the, 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 like the literature, the MLM literature that's uh, usually shared. Did you read JMP? Um, uh, yes, 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 you did. Oh, I've I read GMP. continuity. I've read, I've read so the good. communist necessity. I read his uh, work so on Mao's reason. Um, oh, they're so good. Uh, there's the, the, so the, the fourth good. work. Oh my god, he's read. He's written a lot, and I like a lot of his work. I think the communist necessity is his best work, mm. personally. Um, the whole critique I think of movement is amazing. So yeah, good. I, agreed. I think uh, continuity and rupture. Um, a lot of people really like it. I. I found it a little bit lacking personally, but that, again, that's a conversation for another time. Maybe post like off stream, we can discuss this at mm. length. I, I do not have the energy right now to that's go into okay. that because because uh, I actually I don't have it with me right now because I, I have it annotated back home. Um, so we could maybe a next like a future time uh, when I'm back home, I can pop it out and like read my notes and yeah, definitely say cool. what parts I disagreed with. That that might be actually a lot of fun. It would actually be but, yeah. cool because uh, actually I, I will say like the first time I read it, actually um, I was a lot more like hardcore ml and i was in like a hardcore ml organization i was i was very closed to mlm and yeah. like he has a full chapter on like the limits of ml jmp is yeah. like full and i was just like no how dare you i, <laughs> I was like angry but it's, 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 yeah. no i remember that yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I remember even when i read that i was like no he's, he's obviously presenting it from a philosophical point and i understand where he's coming from and he he touches on points he's like oh for example yeah i remember this 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 particular example stuck out in my head he's like oh um people talk about the contribution of Maoism, um, one of the main cont contributions of Maoism is the concept of the cultural revolution. Mm. And then he kind of like uh, satirized, not satirized, but he comments on Marxist Leninists that say, oh, but cultural revolution had occurred during the Soviet Union. They even used the term, right? And then he's like, yeah, that's true, but there wasn't a, like, f um, uh, a structure built around the term to make it an actual component of Marxism. It was just a thing, like a throwaway term, right? Mm. Um, it's kind of like the, the, the point he gets at. And I agree somewhat with that perspective, mm. but also that doesn't change the fact that there, what happened in material terms was a cultural rev revolution throughout the 20s and into the early 30s. Uh, that doesn't change the fact that there was somewhat. But then again, yes, but. you know, it's become more structured. Yes, but yes, I mean, it, it wasn't uh, exactly... Let me just... Get... Yes, sorry, excuse me. Sorry, go on. No, 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 you, you, you go. No, you go. Go, ahead, go ahead. I apologize, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, it's all right. My, my point is this. Um, the tendency of Marxism as it develops uh, across the years is that it becomes more um, developed and becomes more codified. So there are things that existed before that didn't. The concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat was a germ in the mind of both Engels and Marx. Some people claim it only Engels brought it in. This is bullshit. People need to read more. Um, but yeah, uh, the uh, concept was there. It wasn't codified. Then when Lenin came around, he codified it. All right. He codified also relations to the state and stuff like that. Mm. Lenin also co codified uh, concepts of new economic policies and how feudalism can jump to socialism, what, what should happen between the two and all that kind of stuff. He codified the transitional period, for example, even though these were ideas that existed within Marx and uh, Engels. Within the works of Marx and Engels and Lenin and uh, Stalin and uh, Ho Chi Minh even and other Marxists, lesser known Marxists at the time, uh, Georgi Lukács uh, and, and the Hungarian, 
um, philosopher, for example, all these works, there were ideas of cultural revolution, for example, and mass line, particularly in the works of Lenin, but they mm. were not codified, mm. right? And when Mao came around, came around, they became codified with him uh, and with his movement, with, with the Chinese communist movement, right? And as that movement has progressed now, modern Marxists, many of which uh, consider themselves MLMs, have further co codified things, right? And I consider myself part of this tradition. Right. Based so in team. all, <laughs> so in for, for all intents and purposes, no, that's funnily enough for all intents and purposes. Uh, in, oh my God, is that the phrase? Intents and purposes. Yeah, yeah that's, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. For all I intents remember. and purposes, I practice. Sorry. I, you know, sorry. So you finished. You finished what you're going to say. There, and I'll go from all around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for all intents and purposes, you could almost consider me to be a MLM. I just choose not to call myself because I have a philosophical like nitpick on the concept of rupture between MLism and MLM, right? But that doesn't change the yeah. fact that I agree with it generally. Yeah. Right? Um, I was so, I was like that for so long, man. I, genuinely, I was the exact same way. I was like, I, I accept everything that MLM has to offer. I just don't accept that it's a higher mm -hmm. stage. I don't accept a rupture. I, I mm -hmm. just, it's all continuity. That was me for like a really, really long time. And then I had this experience like wits, the, the old revisionist style, the, the old style communist party, which actually, mm. which I realized necessitated a rupture, you know, this, and it's not a rupture from Marxism Leninism as much as it's a rupture from revisionism, you know, and that's the big thing. Like, yeah. That's what it is. You're cutting out Khrushchevism, you know, you're mm. cutting out uh, the ideas that don't work, Euro communism, the mm. kind of reformist ideas, mm. stuff like that. You're actually getting back to revolutionary yeah. communism. And, mm. and so, so for, for me, that's, that's kind of caused me to embrace MLM a lot more than I would have historically. But, you know, this is, this is a funny mm. conversation because like, you're saying like you're, you're you're like for all intents and purposes you're basically a maoist but you, you don't you don't see the rupture fully um and i think yeah. that I, I remember specifically the last conversation we had about seven or eight months ago i remember i was definitely a lot more uh pro china at that state now i'm a lot more a lot, a lot harsher on, on china and stuff like that but uh mm -hmm. i remember thinking at the time i was just like holy shit we talked we talked to each other i was like he's both a better dengist and a better maoist than i am what the fuck <laughs> <laughs> you do oh, both of these ops it's way better what the fuck because oh, you've actually read you've actually read that excuse me dong <laughs> dong xiaoping you've actually yeah, read dong xiaoping yeah. a lot more uh you've, you've engaged with maoism a lot more yeah. and i was like oh fuck <laughs> this guy's just this guy's better in both extremes than i am i, I, I don't know how i'm gonna how oh, do i how do i come back from this yeah um oh, man. there's been a lot of questions but, uh, about about that topic i'm not sure if you wanted to touch on any of that sort of stuff uh, sure yeah what, what, what particularly there there have been a bunch of questions on your thoughts on mlm uh, there were a bunch of thoughts about a bunch of questions about your thoughts on china um i'm mm -hmm. not sure if you wanted to talk about them a little bit. i know it's a kind of controversial thing so if you it's, don't yeah no it's fine it's a very large question i'm That's applying i'm making a video yeah. on it well yeah let me let uh, me just yeah. maybe we can narrow, oh, actually i was gonna say if we can narrow it down and, uh, and ask a few questions mm -hmm. but the question is the, the few questions i see uh jumping up for me are actually pretty vague they're pretty big jamie rowe literally no. just asks what are hakim's views on china <laughs> it's very <laughs> That's completely fine. very open-ended but uh if you want did, did you want to did you want to take that i can take it very quickly um, yeah i'm not going to go on for 30 Bullet minutes points, i say that yeah. i'm going to end up going on 30 minutes three hours later yeah, <laughs> yeah. we'll be still here <laughs> I'll, I'll give just a quick couple of sentences right um i think just to preface this, I think there's a lot of dogmatism on both sides um, when it comes to the concept uh, to the idea of China. Um, of oh, some people will be like, you know what? No, they're actually you know socialism and market socialism. Uh, they're socialist and market socialism is a form of socialism. You have this on which is one aspect which I think is wrong, and you have the other aspect which is oh, they're in a form of authoritarian capitalism that has yeah, nothing yeah. to do with the you know blah, blah, blah. and that's another form of uh, dogmatism that's absolutely ridiculous. What you have is a very dynamic and pragmatic nation that has done several things. First and foremost of which is that they have developed a merging of state capitalist and private capitalist economy, right? Mostly though, because of the um, like uh, overbearing, let's say arm of the state, I would say by majority, it can be considered to be a state capitalist economy. This is not yeah, a controversial point to make. No, I mean, they basically um, agree. I mean, they, they literally talk yeah. about the decisive nature of the markets and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it, there's nothing exactly. controversial about that. Yeah. Now, where the controversy uh, lays uh, is uh, the uh, political structure and motives. Oh, whether it's now, the dictatorship, is, the bourgeoisie, I... dictatorship, proletariat, and stuff like that. Exact, exactly yeah. right. Yes. And then it gets to a point of uh, lots of statistics and discussions which can be had. And either at the end, you get to the idea that, hey, it's um, a dictatorship of the proletariat because of the leading nature of the Communist Party. Uh, or you get to a position that it is a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie because of the presence of um, certain unsavory classes, let's say, within uh, the ruling structures. Jack Ma and stuff in like the that. CCP, sixty over sixty yeah. billion net worth, 
Alibaba. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it gets, yeah. It gets dodgy, yeah. Exactly. Now, my point, I meet in the middle of this, right? Mm. You need to realize that the Chinese, or not you particularly, but I mean people in general, need to realize that the, the uh, Communist Party of China is an incredibly massive organization. Absolutely. Ma we have not, even the Soviet Party, the uh, CPSU, uh, which was the largest party of its time, practically, this does not even reach a level of the complexity that exists within China and their political structure. Mm. There is not one trend. There is four or five major trends and dozens of subtrends within the uh, um, party. Something that you know, if, if you right, um, yeah. yeah, if you read, uh, there's a really good book called um, uh, the, the Chinese New Left is a publisher of these sort of things. Right, mm. their tendency, one of the tendencies within the CP, uh, CPC. And uh, the they were published a book called Afterlives of Chinese Communism, and in it there's a chapter that's relevant on this, um, which I recommend. Mm. Uh, but uh, the general discussion is that we need to realize that unlike in the Soviet era and their ban on factionalism to an extreme extent, um, there is a limitation of factionalism within the uh, Chinese Communist Party, but there is not a ban on it. So what does that mean? Is you have informal groupings within that form and base around certain ideological and political trends. What are those trends? You have the uh, liberals on one side who advocate for social democracy and whatnot. Um, Some free marketeers like, like Jack Ma is a good example. Yeah. Like an actual like proper, like exactly. proper rightist. Yeah. You know? Exactly right. Yes. The, the prototypical capitalist rotor. Exactly yeah. right. Then you have other aspects. You have um, the, uh, what we can say is like the, the new left. The new left is a almost, they're almost European in the mentality uh, towards Marxism. Mm. If you notice in a lot of their writings, they discuss critical theory much more than they discuss economic. Mm. Very interesting to note, right? Um, but they kind of highlight more social issues within China. But also they have a negative idea of the way that China is moving in right now. That's another trend. Mm. Another trend that exists is the Maoist trend. And that is, by the way, we cannot deny that there's also a substantial grouping within uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And these are people who are uh, um, basically... Um, of, of the flavor of the mouse, the mouse of the 60s, right? Late 50s and, and, and early 60s. Right, uh, yeah. Cultural rev revolution types who really uphold that legacy and whatnot um, and would like to see um, the uh, suppression of markets and the nationalization of everything again and all that kind of stuff. And you have uh, two other trends right now, but they are mentioned in Paul Cockshot's discussion of cyber socialism that, that, that he gave at the New Left uh, Forum. Um, it's on YouTube. Uh, he discusses in way more detail uh, over there, but um, it's also discussed in there. Uh, these are, by the way, informal groupings because um, this is kind of like closed down. This is kind of like hearsay that you get about the stuff. They, mm. The Chinese Communist Party doesn't actively tell, you know what, we're frag we're actually fragmented, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so you can put in wedges. But this is my point is being is this, that this is an incredibly um, complex issue where you have many different forces pu pulling and pushing in many different degree uh, in, in many different directions. So you have these forces that want to increase the the capacity of the party for like the development of capitalism kind of like till, to its end. You, these are the Jack Ma types and their ideological um, uh, comrades, right? Yeah. Then you have these people who want absolute state nationalization and abolition of markets and all that kind of stuff. You have all these things. What is the actual practice that you get though in China? What you are seeing is a very strong centralized state that is developing the economy towards something that is almost a meme at this point, the development of the productive forces. <laughs> now people will laugh and be like, haha, you you know, like, oh, wow. oh, you know, oh, socialism will be January 1st, 2050, right? You know, <laughs> that they're, they're going to press the socialism button. Um, my personal perspective on this is this, right? That as it currently stands, I personally think that it is a state capitalist economy aimed at developing the, um, uh, the, the productive capacity of China, which, by the way, people need to remember is a very poor nation. Even now is an incredibly poor nation. There are certain parts of China that are absolutely dirt poor, dirt, dirt poor to this day, even after the poverty uh, uh, alleviating campaigns, because those only uh, eliminated absolute, like, a, um, what's it called? Extreme poverty. Mm. Um even though that's a massive achievement that they did, regardless. Um, but what I'm trying to say is that it's still so um, imbalanced across the country. Unlike, for example, if you compare with the Soviet Union, if you were to go to Almaty, which is in Kazakhstan, and you were to go to Baku, which is in um, Azerbaijan, and you were going, if you were to go to Minsk in Belarus, and then you were to go to Leningrad, you're going to see the same type of uh, city setup and urban development and uh, uh, industrial levels of output and diversification, right? If you do the same thing in China, you will not see that. You're going to see many cities that are incredibly highly developed, particularly in their capacity for production. And then you're going to see other cities that are still kind of in their early 70s 
uh, levels. Of, like they're developing, but they're developing slowly and they're not developed sufficiently as to result in this like disbalance in the country um, mm -hmm. where one side is developed and, 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 and has the productive capacity to do what they want. Other sides are incredibly still poor and have kind of our net receivers of the benefits of other parts of the country. Um, Xinjiang is an example of this right now, for example, mm -hmm. right? What does this mean in the end? So yeah, I told you I was gonna be like, oh, just like three sentences and then being pretty mid discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does this mean in the end? What it means is that um, the Chinese leadership has identified a fundamental issue that they have is the development of like the the the, the development of the whole country um, to kind of kind of skirt this issue of unequal uh, presence, number one. Number two, to allow for a proper base of productive capacity to be uh, like produced. And then afterwards, according to them, they claim that they will begin a proper transition to the full construction of socialism, which they consider currently what they're doing. They don't consider themselves to be socialists. They're considering themselves to be progressing towards socialism. Well, I've heard say, oh, the primary stage. Mm -hmm. Like Sorry. I've heard this, this, this thing, they say like we're in the primary stages of socialism. So it's kind of like they've, they've inserted like an, an, a yeah. transitional layer between capitalism and, and socialism. And like, they've, even though, yeah. even though like as traditionally, like, like revolutionary Marxists would see socialism as a tradition, the transitional stage to communism, they've mm -hmm. kind of like inserted like another like little wedge there between capitalism uh, and socialism. And they mm -hmm. kind of say that they're this, like the primary stages uh, of socialism. Like we're, it's kind of, a strange thing i, I, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know what to make of it it seems a little bit yeah. wishy-washy to me and but... I, no no i agree with you and i remember i was reading the um there's a there's a book that was a compilation of various many authors it's called why socialism and um in it uh there's a section segments on different like topics and then many different author uh, authors give their own like short essays on this and one of the two of the authors were chinese um, and they gave their Chinese Marxist perspective um, mm. on this. And I remember the, the discussing the discussion was that we are uh, like when they're talking about the the what's going on in China, they particularly say that they're not in socialism. They're in the when they say the primary stage, they're like, oh, we are building up to the building of socialism. Yeah, that's the way they worded it. Yeah, and that's real. something I realize uh, again when we have to look at this from a class analysis. I realize why many white Western comrades or not even white west but western comrades from in highly industrialized nations and in, in imperial core nations why they can have an issue with this because they already exist in industrialized nations well i as an iraqi this really resonates with me and it makes a lot of sense because i look at for example iraq primarily and then on a general uh thing like the arab world as a whole like all the way from morocco to iraq and to the south to oman and yemen right and i think about what would be required for us as a nation as an arab nation what would be required for us hmm. and you'd need many people chinese path about it yeah, yeah, the Chinese path is the one that makes the most sense because we are so unequally developed in many different forms. Um, we still exist. Uh, there's some places that have incredibly highly developed industrial production, and there's some places that are still subsisting on a semi-feudal economy, even to this day. Mm. Um, we have uh, incredible difficulties in our productive capacity, and these things cannot be done uh, without... Oh my God! This gets in a way deeper. This gets in a way deeper discussion of the position that China found itself in the seventies after the uh, after the Sino-Soviet split mm. and uh, its isolation from the world, both from the West and the quote unquote East, and what they had to do. So it was kind of they were um, compelled, they were forced, their hand was forced to open up to one or the other. And the Sino-Soviets after the Sino-Soviet splits, the Soviets weren't gonna you know open their arms again. They took everybody out, even their experts. They took their machines with them too. Right. So who are they going to go to? If we exist, like as the Arab world, if we exist in a similarly precarious situation, it makes complete sense as to why you would open up to the market to the West and to allow um, capital investment to develop the already non-existent capital that exists. There is no, you know, uh, productive basis at all, and to produce it from ground zero would take such a, a massive effort. And uh, with expected embargoes and political isolation, and diplomatic, uh, you know, fear, warmongering and stuff like that, that would result. Uh, it becomes incredibly difficult and incredibly complex. Let me just summarize because I'm even beginning to ramble. I'll just summarize like this. I personally consider China to be state capitalist, not because they chose to be state capitalist, but because they initiated market reforms as a result of the complexities and difficulties uh, of their situation after the Sino Soviet split uh, and the limited capacity they had for development. As a result of this, they started market uh, reforms. Not that I personally agree with them. Of course, I would rather uh, planning and the uh, uh, suppression of markets and stuff like this goes without mm. saying. Um, but they had to do this. 
And what they're planning to do is develop their productive capacity of on equal basis across the country to the point that they can then, once they're complete with this preliminary stage, then start the construction of socialism proper. And this process is what they consider to be what they hope to be completed by 2050. It's not a button. It's more of a, you know, uh, imagine you turn a water heater on and the water slowly boils. Yeah, it, takes, it's, it takes a time. Well, but then there's the, qualitative, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Qualitative qualitative. Well, Thank you. Exactly that. Quantitative you know, qualitative. here's and, the thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Sorry, you, my you final point. Off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My final point is: I personally think, on the political sphere, I have some level of optimism, just to counter the general cynicism that exists within. Mm. Them. I have some level of optim optimism that what they say they're going to try to do, they're going to actually accomplish. And mm. I think only time will resolve this. The endless debates we have as people who don't speak Chinese and don't have access to Chinese sources um, can be on a low level at the end of the day. And I think that's a nice way of tying it up. But yeah, please give me your opinion on it. No, that's a, that's a really, really nice take there. Uh, I, I think you're cautious. You're sort of cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm probably the opposite, mm. uh, sort of the other side of going mm. there, like where I'm cautiously pessimistic and, and I hope I'm wrong. I mm. really hope I'm wrong. Like yeah. if you can prove me wrong, then uh, if, if, mm. if China proves me wrong, I, I would love nothing more mm. than to be proven wrong exactly that, for, yeah. for global mm. communism to be ushered mm. in by the, C, yeah. by the CPC. That'd be absolutely amazing. So I, I really hope that happens yeah. and I hope I'm wrong here. But... Yeah. Yeah, when you look at the export of capital that has occurred since mm -hmm. the reform, specifically post post nineteen seventy nine, uh, you know, obviously Deng Xiaoping's reforms coming in uh, after Mao died and so on and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. there's it, it it really peaks uh, and it really peaks. Um, I suppose really in the in the mid two thousands, you just see it skyrocket into crazy levels. I mean, two thousand and one, I think the, C the CPC decided to accept capitalists into the party. There's this the whole thing happened mm -hmm. and. It, it it just it seems to be going very much in a in a in a, a troublesome direction in terms of really capitalizing on the market. It says okay, well uh -huh. we're just going to do the market. We're just going to do this. It, it seems like to me in a way that they've kind of sacrificed socialism, like everything we understand to be socialism. And I, I think that it probably is necessary to just do just a, a quick little recap on like what we mean when we're talking about socialism. Because mm -hmm. for me, I, this is this is something that is often confused with people. Like they don't actually know like what are we talking about socialism. People just think like socialism is government does things and so on and so forth. For me, socialism there's three aspects. There's the economic aspects. You know of course from each according to your ability to each according to their work that re that's really really important you know uh, there's the political aspect having a dictatorship of the proletariat super important mm -hmm. and the third aspect of course the transformational aspect so there the ac economic aspect the political aspect and the transformational aspect of course of socialism being the stage between capitalism and communism that for me is like the that's what socialism is and like everything else all of the other like factors fit into those categories you know like whether it's mm -hmm. abolition of the markets or abolition of the commodity form or things like that uh, elim just eliminating cla the, the long sort of uh, move to, to really transforming the relations of production so that you have this mm -hmm. stateless class as moneyless society they can all fit under those categories uh, pretty well and for me like when i look at like the economic aspect uh, from each coin to your ability to each coin to your work China, it's not. It's not that at all. Political aspect. It's. Exactly. It's. The thing is, political aspect. It's a little bit vague. Maybe uh, there are aspects of it that are definitely there. there as you said, there, there's a line struggle within the organization. There are different factions. There's genuinely proletarian aspects. There is also the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are part of the organization, and they have immense political power i mean uh, in 2018 the cpc was celebrating the the role that these capitalists these ultra capitalists had played in the reform and opening up process you know so like th there's definitely a massive uh bourgeois element to this which which we we can't uh, we can't mm -hmm. deny you know and as for the transformational aspect i mean do we accept the 2050 line do we accept i mean and this is going to be this is going to be borne out over the many years that, that come before us do we accept that it's actually going to be socialism by 2050 or 2078 or whatever whatever yeah. mark they're, they're putting in at the moment and mm -hmm. beyond that beyond that kind of question I think there's a massive question that needs to be raised if we don't see it as socialism if we just see it as this kind of mm -hmm. state capitalism that's kind of wholesome and kind of nice and does this cool stuff and it cancels mm -hmm. debt and it, you know it, it's kind of a friendlier th it's friendlier than US imperialism it's friendlier than EU imperialism mm -hmm. we kind of like it but mm -hmm. We also, as Marxist analysts, need to remember like what Lenin said. I mean, Lenin talks about imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. So we, we we're existing in the stage of imperialism. And if you have these massive capitalist countries, uh, they're probably going to be imperial. And if you don't think that China is socialist, then the only alternative is it being the second largest economy in the world, uh, it mm. being this massive economic powerhouse. Well, I mean, do, fill in the gaps. Uh, mm. Living in this age of imperialism, well, I think um, what is it? Yeah, no, I, yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, but I just have one point because you mentioned like, oh, whether we take uh, in 2050 and accept us or, or not. Um, I just have one counterpoint: Is it our place to be the ones who even 
But isn't that a liberal Any analysis? Sort of, That's the thing. Like, I, I've heard Vishay no, no, Prashad no. say things like that. And I've heard people say like, oh, well, you know, who is... This is actually a thing that I, I remember. I was a little bit perplexed when I heard Vijay Prasad say like, you know, is it imperialist? Is it not imperialist? And he was like, well, who are you, uh, white Western man, to say whether or not it's imperialist? And like, the thing is... That's not a scientific no, 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 socialist no. analysis. That's that's a liberal uh, standpoint, epistemology yeah. analysis. That's not actually a scientific yeah. socialist analysis. You're it's correct. not based in material yeah. reality. So mm. it's but an what issue. What I'm trying you know? to say, I'll, I'll, to, to to like you know um, uh, frame it in a way that I can like get my point across mm. is like this. It's not about do we accept it because oh you're a white guy. What do you know? No, it's not. That's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm saying is, um, is it our place to accept it? Not as you know. Oh, we're just because we're you know not outside. My primary thing mm. is that. We do not have the necessary information um, on the uh, particular direct um, like motives of the uh, CPC, for, like primarily. Same way, we do not have access to the literature that's mostly in Chinese of the discussions that are going uh, going around all this. All this stuff exists there, and it's published. And I have um, I have uh, several friends that are that can speak uh, the language, the relevant languages, and uh, they tell me about like fairly interesting things of the conversations that are going on and their conversations to a level that is far more deep than what we have. Cause um, like, I mean us outside of China, our mm. conversations never get beyond, Oh, there's 60 something capitalists within the um, uh, CPC. Uh, there's the uh, supposed foreign investments that's being characterized as imperialism. Um, and uh, like in Africa, for example, um, Oh, uh, they don't support and they don't diplomatically support uh, socialist movements abroad. Like this is as deep as our conversation ever gets over here well right? can or i just that. say though like i mean i i do like this is this is we can actually objectively prove this like we can actually like when it comes to like export of capital and stuff like that like we can actually look at the statistics for their outward foreign direct investment this is just like a wishy-washy mm. thing like we can actually chart this and say like yes absolutely mm. the export of capital is dominant and does take on a decisive role mm. in their economic plan i mean like we can actually prove these things you know we can actually prove mm. like we can actually prove the oligopolies that exist there you know we can actually pl prove mm. the predominance of what we consider to be imperialism by the Leninist uh, standard. We we can prove the military bases they have in Djibouti. We we, we can show these things. It's it's not as though we we yeah. can't see these things. I, mean, I agree with you. You know what but I mean. I think the fundamental flaw in there is that um, the there's it's kind of jumping the gun, right? Um, because you mentioned something very interesting. You're like, oh, it's the second largest economy, and it's gonna f uh, like what if it starts filling or the fears that it fills in the gaps, mm. right? Uh, of the former, uh, you know, like, of course, I don't want to do the, the silly game of like, oh, actually compared to the former second largest economies and what they did compared to what China's doing. And you see a very different picture, but I don't mm. want to play that game. The game, the, the, the angle I want to get at is um, uh, when we say like, oh, it's actually like proven without it. Uh, I've really looked into this. The the con the, the, the claim that China is, cap is, is uh, excuse me, um, imperialist, right? Mm. And every time I've looked into it, it is like the, 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 the way that it's presented it's like a ad hoc um explanation that's kind of applied back onto the foreign investment that exists it's kind of like i'm not saying you do this but a lot of people for example on twitter do this where they're like oh foreign investment exists ergo it is imperialism right well, well outward foreign direct investment case, i mean that is that's the export of yeah, capital that lenin talked about yeah of course you're right in that but it's a multifactorial thing um and i think something that's missing as well is that um, there is a geopolitical aspect that's missed out because even if like we grant that, by the way, I would like to actually discuss this maybe further in the DMs about the imperialism aspect um, because maybe you've seen mm. something that I haven't seen. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, so actually, I, I read a pretty good... See, thing is, I made a video about this last year where I was just like, nah, China isn't imperialist. And I, like all of the same arguments that like, I was issued on the opposite side of this argument like uh, about, about yeah. a year ago. Uh, it, it forced me to confront a lot of stuff, which I think was pretty... Un it, was yeah. very, it was a very uncomfortable situation for me to be in um, and it forced me to look Every single argument that I had against sure, China being yeah. imperialist, yeah. I had to really, I had to really grip with that and yeah. handle that. And so, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a bunch of documents I can send you, which yeah. pretty much concretely Please do, yeah. demonstrated. And it's, yeah, it's, I would, it's I would like wild. to more deeply, yeah, I would like to look into this more deeply because every time I've asked people to send me stuff and they would send me stuff and I'd look into it and I can be, yeah, it would be a bit. Um, not as concrete as I would like it to be, but yeah. my point is I've got that it, yeah, um, I've got, it, I've got it for you. I, I've actually I put a little link to it in the chat there, um, for yeah. people. It's called. Um, 
it's on band thoughts uh, and it goes into it it's like it literally uses all the statistics it goes into like literally using like uh, world bank statistics and oecd statistics and it actually it actually shows concretely exactly how they're exporting capital yeah, yeah. how they're doing this how they're doing that and how they become yeah. this massive uh, powerhouse and this isn't like a moral judgment by the way this isn't like oh shine is bad because it does yeah, this. Yeah, it's of just yeah, no, this no. is this is just this is how capitalism develops if you if you if you if you pursue mm-hmm. this process this is this is what happens it's not like there's these nefarious evil mm-hmm. bastards doing this no and this this also doesn't mean yeah, that china doesn't have like a progressive role to play against u.s imperialism it doesn't mean that there aren't progressive things that can be mm-hmm. done and there aren't well meaning right, people yeah. within the organization so i i, I do want to sort of um uh, maybe dial it back a little bit in, in that regard this, this shouldn't be like an attack but just like objectively like no when you look for at, sure not no. when you look at the stats yeah. and you look at the numbers it, it definitely yeah. does seem to tick but the boxes the, for imperialism from the Leninist exactly perspective, yeah. um which is, so yes, so I would like to take a look at those uh, sources, and I will um, uh, take a look at them. So thank you for those. Uh, and of course, yeah, the, to reiterate, like this is just this is a friendly conversation on matters that discuss that deserve to be discussed. Mm. Um, so yeah, and hopefully everybody benefits, including myself. Um, but uh, my, and the thing, the point I was going to mention is um, there is a geopolitical aspect that is sometimes ignored um, that doesn't excuse the very fact that something may be happening, but it also has a little more explanatory power than. Uh, other ideas and it's the fact that um china's uh, like belt and road initiative for example if you notice the countries that where people are like oh yeah they're, they're the uh countries that are getting them a massive amount of their foreign investment uh mm-hmm. are they're trying to bring them into this uh, belt and road initiative you know the part of their win-win diplomatic strategy and whatnot right uh, or mutual gain diplomatic strategy uh and the reason is because this is a country that has been isolated for so long and they kind of want to um carve out a little um, not like sphere for themselves but um to uh, increase their standing equivalent to the size of their economy is what I mean, right? Um, compared to like previous examples mm. of uh, economies of this size. When the Soviet Union was the second largest economy on earth, the amount of diplomatic clout we can say that it held was absolutely massive, right? It yeah. d- practically directed nations. China does not have this. And they, it can be said that this is a lot of geopolitical... Um, uh, uh, van- There's a vantage point from that aspect that can be also analyzed. Um, but I think this can be discussed. We, we'll discuss uh, discuss this further in DMs because I think mm, we've been talking yeah. about this for like an hour or so. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, but man. it is. It's very inter- it's very interesting and it's a very deep question to get into. But again, uh, it's just a fun to, like, question. Sign I love this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> the, the most important the most important aspect of it, I think, is that it's always nice and fun to have the academic discussion, right? Mm. But in the end, what is the material result for your own organizational activities, oh, your own community, your own region, and your own country? <laughs> right and the thing is, no no you think there is none but no because uh maybe for ireland there isn't because mm. ireland doesn't need a market stage like ireland probably could go from a a a it's a decently developed um industrialized economy um mm. it has a a proper industrial base compared to for example let's say like libya <laughs> you know is yeah what I mean. or, yeah or, yeah so uh for uh ireland may not be that valid but for like countries of the third world which can look at china and look at their position where they were like 50 years ago and compare it to their local conditions and see how these are important conversations to be Mm. had because it can then directly inform uh future policy uh directives and whatnot if a revolution were to occur blah blah so it's always and the cpp as well like this is very relevant like for for comrades like in the philippines Mm. who are engaged in pbw at the moment like actually fighting for exactly and like this is important like they because they see chinese imperialism Mm. right there they see the chinese companies they see them trying to imperialize their forests i mean this is why they're kind of like this kind Mm. of eco-socialist kind of movement and they're they're hiding Mm. in the forests (laughs) it doesn't work when you have like people trying to imperialize and and, uh, tear down your forests like that so it is relevant i suppose it is kind of like a privileged position for me in ireland to just be like oh well it's an academic No, no, I'm not. That's not my criticism. I'm not trying no, to say. No, no, I, I don't. Position. I know that you're not. I know that you're not saying that. Um, but I, I do feel like, in a way, it probably is because, like, in my organization, in in the Connolly Youth Movement, uh, we have comrades who are extremely pro-China, and we have comrades who are extremely anti-China, and like so. But yeah. that doesn't actually impede our organizing together. We still work and organize See, yeah. shoulder to shoulder. It's not. It's not like. It, it's not like oh well fuck this person like we're we're diametrically opposed because we have a different take on china it's it's actually it's not even like that big of a deal you know we just have a different take and well, yeah it's like okay no, no yeah problem. That, that's my point. it's like yeah have the academic discussion because it's interesting and it also can help you develop right but also try to always link back to why it's materially beneficial because otherwise there are many better uh, conversations to be had mm. um for the limited time that many organizations have but it's still it's sure. very very interesting and yeah i will be uh, writing to you um maybe after this or yeah this is, definitely because uh, i'm very yeah. <laughs> I've got I've got a few documents to send you, which I, I I'd love to hear your takes on. And uh, please do, they definitely, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Definitely, because I've been like I've been just across the spectrum on this particular question, mm. and um, I'd love mm. to I'd love to talk about it some more. I, mean, I never say no to more reading material. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, I've got a, I've got a good bit of that to send you, so uh, that'll be fun to, to talk about mm. and to, to dive into in concrete in concrete terms, not just mm. like abstract like vague sure thing. platitudes or ultra left platitudes mm. or whatever it might be. Um, brilliant, sure, yeah, yeah. brilliant. So thank you so much, comrade. Jesus, like two hours later, <laughs> let's do like a quick it's a right. quick chat in China and then. <laughs> are you it's are right, you, it has to be yeah it, it's always going to take a little while do you do you are, do you still have a little bit of time are you still good for sure man. great okay yeah, i think we can do like another hour or so for sure oh amazing okay great we got a bunch of bunch of fun questions <laughs> now here's here's a cool one because <laughs> yeah it's like we've taken only like three or four questions or something so now i feel bad <laughs> please even, it, throw them at me why not and even then like we've probably gotten through about like half of them i don't even know if we've really answered yeah. the question but oh we're uh, we're working through them um okay brilliant uh, listen thank you so much akim and i really appreciate this mm. um one of the comments, uh, Boogie, B-U-G-G-H-E-1, mm. asks, what is your take on vanguard parties? How about a union-led revolution, pros and cons? I think it's kind of like a council communist kind of take. Um, yeah. Anarcho-syndicalists. Did you want to give your, your thoughts on that? I think we're uh, both very yeah, pro-vanguard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. Um, vanguard, mo- okay. Uh, number one is also to see, it's, the first thing is to say is to see the efficacy of them in practice. There have been many syndicalist movements across history. There have been many vanguard movements across history. Which ones have had a higher success rate? It's always been the vanguard movements. Exactly. So that's not a nice way to actually look at it. This is kind of like a, a material, like, you know, just shut up and listen sort of answer. I don't want to give that answer. Um, the it is true, answers- though. I'm going to lie. <laughs> it is What's true. Worked? You're right. You- um, <laughs> Vanguard parties have proven their efficacy over syndicalist movements. Now, why is this, right? Because syndicalism, if you uh, if you read your Lenin, you realize that uh, union movements, trade unionism, is only the lowest form of class consciousness, mm. right? A trade union movement only can organize within, yeah. right? It cannot transition out of it. It does not exist as a revolutionary um uh, let's say unit um that can progress outward it can be a radical like a radicalizing sphere for sure and that's what it was historically um but what happens is uh trade unionism kind of atomizes worker the workers movement um and uh, results in a loose confederate like confederation we could say of many various fields of the like uh, of the proletariat across all um, like branches that I may work in, right? Hmm. Um, and as a result of this, you end up with a almost like a um, yeah, like an atomized approach towards revolution that is fundamentally um, what's it called? Like the kernel of the movement is not we want to transition out of socialism, but it is the fight for workers' rights and mm. the uh, improved improvement conditions. of that condition yeah. within capitalism. Yeah. So that's the fundamental issue, right? Um, but. Uh, further than this, right, their fundamental issue is that they do not, okay, this is actually a controversial point within an- anarcho-syndicalists and the de- Leonists and shit like that, um, so this is a conversation that can be had for a long time, but some uh, sections of the anarcho-syndicalist movement, of course, do not believe, because that's the part of the anarcho, right, they don't believe in uh, capturing the state mm-hmm. and wielding it uh, and destroying the bourgeois state and then building a proletarian power in its place, usually a dictatorship of the proletariat, not usually considered a state, but could be considered a state function, right? They, they don't believe in this, right? They believe in a loose confederation of like commune-based, you know, stateless existence. And I don't think we need to get into the faults of, uh, yeah, of, the, of, of, uh, thing, yeah, the lack it's... of a centralized state. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the, the, yeah. And another thing is a lot of them are also associated with the concept of organic uh, centralism and uh, platformism and these sort of things mm-hmm. and all these kind of fail because as much as we hate it centralization and hierarchy are necessary components of the beginning of the movement we can talk about after the revolution is one and after we establish a certain level of like uh, productive capacity and all like that then we can discuss like limitations on these sort of things but at the very beginning to at least transition out of capitalism it is absolutely vital to have proper centralization and proper hierarchy for the movement, uh, for organizing the movement, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now we can talk about, you know, um, uh, democratic control of these sort of things and all that kind of stuff, but these are things that must be present, right? Um, mm-hmm. It gets into a conversation that then starts to, like, you know, criticize anarchism as well, but the, I think that's outside the scope of the direct question. Mm-hmm. I think vanguardism, mm-hmm. personally, uh, at the end of the day, even when analyzing its ideological flaws, um, excuse me, I mean, anarcho syndicalism, when an- analyzing its ideological flaws, you can see uh, that. Vanguardism not only has resulted in has brought in more return, like just generally historically, like uh, as as a successful movement on the whole, mm. but also 
um, that uh, it is based on a more solid ideological foundation, even if the things that make it so successful are things that may be distasteful to some, including myself, and I'm sure more uh, for Paul as well, mm -hmm. um, which include things of like um, uh, the, the absolutely necessary hierarchies that exist and on and on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's a very general question a general answer to a, yeah, a very well, general question well that was a very very good answer and i really appreciate the the mm. depth within uh, with which you dive into it mm. I, I really appreciate that it was fantastic i, I you know i will say I, I think that the leninist party formation there are internal contradictions within that i mean as you said like exactly. uh, we talked about this idea that like for example like the workers movement in and of itself isn't capable of transcending this trade union mm. uh, consciousness that lenin talked about mm. in i think it was what has mm. to be done um yeah. you, you spoke a little bit about this and you got into economism and how it's not capable mm. of becoming truly revolutionary it's just fighting for like the improving our material conditions from here we are under capitalism mm -hmm. and so it ends up being this kind of uh revolution from without rather than revolution from within uh, it, it generally comes from these kind of petty bourgeois intellectuals uh, and many like if you look at the five heads of communism like <laughs> generally <laughs> it's generally pretty petty bourgeois if not full-on bourgeois in the case of like yeah. well, Engels obviously Engels is one mm -hmm. of the five heads specifically but I mean very bourgeois mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And so there are contradictions that come with that. Like when you have like a Leninist party formation built on this and coming from the petty bourgeoisie, there will be opportunism and there will be revisionism that seeps into the movement later on when things get uncomfortable. Uh, you're, you're, maybe you're in socialism. Maybe you, you'll move towards revisionism. Maybe you don't want to continue the revolution. You don't want to be... <laughs> you don't want to lose your position of power and influence and you become yeah. you become part of this let me say like let me say like a mm. how can i say a bureaucratic bourgeoisie and you, you, you might you might come up against some problems and i think that that's where things like mass law and two-line struggle all this sort of stuff exactly. really come into it and cultural revolution is like, that's where cultural revolution yeah. comes into it that's where you you and actually have the masses yeah exactly that's where your mail comes in exactly yeah this is this is it this mm. is where your mail comes in and this is where you know mail lets us know that like if you want to have a revolution if you really want to have a successful revolution then it's obligatory for the masses to participate in the revolution you know you can't just have it from like from above you know it can't just mm. be like this top down thing uh, and this is where this is where the culture revolution this is where mass line yeah. this is where two line struggle all this sort of stuff comes in and so yeah. so these There's, problems have been solved these problems actually we, we, we've we've made advances as scientific social scientific socialists and we figured out mm. that there were problems here historically and moving forward into the 21st century uh we we we, we know the solution to those problems so mm -hmm. on, on the whole on the whole of course contradictions never end they only evolve yeah <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um but but we are we're evolving we're, we're, we're getting better all the time exactly. so. <laughs> we don't want to say and actually i did i did i did come up i did bump up against these problems um in, in my previous organization in the cpi yeah. and and this is the thing actually like many people are bumping up against these contradictions within the the classical marxist leninist party formation especially the especially ml organizations that haven't really evolved and haven't really moved on and they're kind of stuck on khrushchevism yeah exactly uh, a lot of people are reporting to me after after the cym split from the cpi a lot of people got in touch with me and they were like oh yeah shit i, I really I totally get what you're talking about when you talk about like for example abuses of democratic centralism about it not actually being democratic at all it's just pure centralism like it's literally just yeah. top down there's no mm. democracy involved the, the dialectical relationship between democracy and centralism has been completely negated it's all just yeah. it's pure centralism just top down do this do that there's no involvement of the rank and file of the organization and comrades from all over the world have explained this same problem to me. I mean, we're talking about not just comrades in Ireland, comrades in the UK, comrades in the US, people like in Australia and New Zealand, you know, comrades in India, like all these people have said, we're seeing the same problem over and over again. So if this problem is happening, everywhere then it, it becomes clear that yeah. it's not just like a bad apple situation like it's not just a, yeah. a unique problem this is this is a systemic issue inherent that needs to be dealt with it's an inherent contradiction that needs to be overcome and that we need to deal with uh, and so what do we do to make uh, the leadership mm. of these organizations more accountable to the rank and file mm. and that's of course mm. that's of course where things like cultural revolution come in and where line struggle exactly. and all sorts of stuff they come in and, and they also, solve those problems you know yeah. and also alternative forms of uh uh, organization like uh, Lenin spoke about this at one point and Stalin actively fought for this and he was defeated on this line mm. which is the separation of the political and the state administrative functions so the mm. party becomes an advisory board not an executive mm. uh, um, like house or uh, I don't know how to say it in English yeah like an executive arm to to carry out um, the actual directives um, yeah so that's why and another thing just like a, it's a final point just to piggyback off what you said mm. um, you're right about everything, all these errors that come up. And the thing is that a lot of people, when they first learn, when they're like baby Marxists, they learn the uh, classical um, Bolshevik type 
you know, party setup, mm. right? And they never read more on it. And then that's why they they get stuck on these things. Uh, one of the most important things is to continuously educate yourself. Stalin wrote about this. Mao wrote absolutely necessary things. And what's also important is that modern um, literature has been actually quite uh, like growing uh, a lot. There's a, if, if people, um, cause I mentioned this, I mentioned this two videos in a row now. Um, if you notice, by the way, I've been on a cop shot reading binge cause I mentioned them. Like <laughs> I three did times. notice that. Yeah. <laughs> See, mention- I can never, I can never endorse cock shot because he was in a pro unionist, pro loyalist organization, which is loyalism mm-hmm. is like the uh, imperialist ideology, which upholds mm-hmm. the yeah. British. And so like, he, he's very like uh, kind of UK chauvinist, very mm-hmm. anti-Irish mm-hmm. liberation. So I, I'm very skeptical of Paul Cockshaw, although I do yeah. know that he's made incredible, he's an incredible work in terms of like technology and stuff like that. So he, exactly. I know he's, he's made incredible advancements, but from like the, the Irish national liberation yeah. struggle, as an Irish Republican, I, I still struggle with Paul <laughs> Yes, yeah. No, no, I, I agree, I agree. No, uh, look, uh, not everybody can be completely unproblematic, right? Yeah, And course, uh, yeah. you have every right to, you know, but my, my point is, uh, it's also, it's uh, again, one of the advices, uh, like piece of advice from the prophet, which is to take the good and leave the bad. Yeah, and that's my advice with Cockshaw because he has other problematic things. Oh but, yeah, and like LGBTQ yeah. plus stuff as well. Like yeah, it's really... yeah, yeah. But the 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 positivity on on the, the 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 actual good points, which are the things that people should center in on, is number one. The the uh, of course the computing section of like you know of, of economic planning. That stuff he's done amazingly. Mm. Uh, and oh number yeah, two, right. His work on democracy has absolutely been like. Uh, it's mind opening, genuinely. Um, he, I, I've mentioned it two videos in a row. His talks in Hanoi, um, he uploaded both uh, of them uh, to YouTube, so you, you, people should watch that. And he discusses this um, also further and towards a new socialism. Uh, these aspects of the, the, the forms of democracy that he discusses and the differing forms of political organization in regards to vanguard parties that he discusses are incredibly relevant to this discussion that we have now. I'm not going to get into it because we've been talking long enough about this one question, but yes. So that's also something that people should check out. Um, but yeah, exactly right. Um, the vanguard structure, okay, the best way to put it, vanguard structure is not the best construction there ever is, but it's the best we've had so far, Definitely. right? And if something better is developed, then please do develop it, people. Yep, get to work. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, we can continuously learn from previous mistakes and continuously improve on our current situation. Uh, all right, I'm sorry. We can get Definitely. to the next question. Brilliant. Thanks. So, no, I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we do have a tangent, uh, a tendency to go off on our tangents and uh, talk about these things for like hours and hours. So I do appreciate you uh, pushing forward with that. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, in the spirit of getting to all the questions. God, we got a lot yes. of questions to get through here. We've got... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't think we will, but um, yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of DMs. Um, I will push forward. Yeah, it's all right. Well, here's, here's a comment. We're in the question. Saeed says, uh, I, I love... Uh, S-A-E-E-D. Uh, S, mm. by the way. That's the, that's the spelling of it there. Uh, he says, mm. uh, loved bromance. Both of y'all are great creators. Thank you very much, Saeed. I really appreciate Aww. that. <laughs> that's very nice of you to say. <laughs> Thank and, you so much. And Nasser Hamid as well says, keep up the good work, comrades. Uh, salam, thank you so much. Salam from the US. So thank you very much. Alaikum. That's very nice of you to say. Thank you, comrade. Um, mm-hmm. there, was a, there, was a, there was a couple of interesting questions before the stream started, which I, I, did, yeah, want sure. to, I did want to address. Um, I can't actually answer these at all. So this is this is very much towards you. I actually mm-hmm. need to run to the bathroom. So if it's okay with you, I might ask you the questions and then I might mm-hmm. run and do my thing and mm-hmm. yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you go. Khalifa mm-hmm. asked a few questions. Um, sure. uh, let's see if you can get through them all here. Khalifa asks, Paul, how would we go about, how would we, excuse me, how would we go, I think it's go about combating, it says how would we Mm. go combat, but how would we go Mm. about combating attempts by foreign and Arab governments Mm. to create conflict and balkanize different Arab communities? For example, attempts Mm. to create rifts between Gulf Mm. Arabs and the rest of the Arab population, such as the claim Mm. that North African Arabs are not real Arabs or that Palestinians Mm. are not real Arabs. These are views that I saw being expressed by government propaganda outlets in the Gulf. And, Mm. okay, so there's a a big question there, uh, but how do we we handle this? Uh Another question from the same comrade, what are Hakim's thoughts on Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti, I, I can never pronounce the name. Yeah, Kuwaiti, yeah. Kuwaiti, political mm-hmm. scientist, and I can't pronounce this again, I'm, I'm sorry. Abdullah Al Nafisi. Mm-hmm. Abdullah Al. Hey, yeah, yeah. You know who this person is? <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I suppose this attempts by, by foreign and Arab governments to create conflict and, and balkanize yeah, different yeah. Arab communities, and your, your thoughts on this uh, Kuwaiti mm-hmm. political scientist. Are you okay with taking yes. those while I, while I run off for a moment? Yes, yeah, yeah, go. Oh, yeah, okay. go, go. Thanks. Back in the month. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Uh, the about the, the the first question. Um, I've not encountered this personally, like with with government outlets saying that North Africans aren't Arabs or Palestinians are Arabs. I've never seen this. Um, 
I've seen this on fringe things like, you know, like, oh, you know, some Lebanese nationalists, Maronite nationalists claiming that they're Phoenicians. I've seen a bunch of people of Amazigh uh, ethnicities and they're like, oh, no, you know, all North Africans are Amazigh when in fact they're uh, Arab uh, Berber mixtures uh, to, of various levels. Um, these sort of things. Uh, but how would we go about countering this? Well, education. Um, that's number one. And number two, it's combating the influence of um, Gulf monarchies. Uh, there's not really much more to it. I personally haven't experienced this, so I I really can't comment further because I don't have any uh, exact example in my mind. Uh, as for um, let me face you, the, the, the Kuwaiti um, uh, political scientist, I mean, what is there to say? He was, like, he's mildly controversial, I guess. He wrote, um, I remember he wrote something. Oh, he, uh, the translation, like in English, it goes, um, uh, oh lord. I think it was the political involvement of the Shia the Shiites in Iraq, I think. I think was it was his I think it was his thesis. You can find it online. I remember I gave it a go once. Uh I read it a while back. It was, but it was published many many years ago. Um I don't really know what you want me to say about him. I haven't read much more of him. Uh I saw like an article or two maybe that I can recall, but nothing more than this. Uh, if you have any more specific questions, maybe DM me and tell me specifically what you want to uh, uh, know about that, and I'll get to you. I'll get back to you. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Are you back? And I'm back. Sorry. The... Right. There's, there a, there's a no. There's a controversial point that I want to clear up. Oh, please. Um, cause, yeah, because people have mentioned. Um, I take great offense to people saying that we have a bromance and not an outright full romance. Okay. <laughs> 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 yes, absolutely. Our, our, our love knows no gender barriers. This has nothing I'm, to do I'm, with the fact that we're bros. Also, that I'm sure. But <laughs> I'm trying. People need to know that uh, if, if people are unaware, uh, our our good friend uh, Paul is married, and I want his wife to sleep one eye o with one eye open because I'm coming for our man. <laughs> 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 oh man I hope it's not much in this life should be should be coming up for me right now the stream said oh I have to end the stream uh, apologies comrades <laughs> sleeping in the dark house tonight now no. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> oh man um, apologies Did, I, I, I probably interrupted there uh, really Did... no 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 I finished talking about it no worries ah brilliant okay thanks very much yeah. I appreciate that now here's a here's an interesting one here uh, Smoke Jaguar asked a question it's a couple of questions again i hope you can uh, hope your, your memory is good hope you can That's just, fine. just probably maybe two or three questions here uh smoke jaguar mm -hmm. says i'm curious as to comrade hakim's thoughts about and knowledge of the iraqi diaspora communities in the west yes. and in america mm -hmm. in particular and elsewhere potentially mm -hmm. how deep are their connections to the homeland do you have any family abroad and what does our comrades think of them serving in foreign militaries and America particularly? Uh, and there's a little bit of context provided here. Mm. At university, uh, Comrade Smoke Dragoir says, at university, I met a young Iraqi American man who was serving or set to serve in the US military. I don't recall which branch he was doing it to get the GI Bill so he could attend college. After getting to know him, I ended up directing him to your channel. I hope it set him towards Lovely. a better path in life. And I wonder if he ever made his presence known to you. So I any thoughts? So, inshallah. Yeah. Any thoughts on diaspora, Iraqi diaspora? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the questions first on diaspora. Um, after the uh, the um, invasion, uh, the illegal American invasion and yep. aggression against my country, um, there was a massive diaspora. It's in the millions now in across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them are um, uh, in North Africa and Europe. North Africa, excuse me. Um, in North America and Europe, and several Arab countries, which include that you used to be Syria. I think now they're not anymore. Mm -hmm. um, there's some in Lebanon. Uh, there's some in the Emirates. Um, stuff like that, right? Um, a few in Turkey, but generally most of them are either in Germany or the Scandinavian countries or the UK. There's quite a sizable population there and uh, in, in North America. Mm. Um, as to what I think of them and their connections, it depends. It really depends. Some of them have not done anything uh, with Iraq, that, like don't have any connection to it. Some of them like come back twice a year, right? So it really depends on the individual person. I think the vast majority of them are still like pretty connected to their home, home country because many they, they have many relatives there. Mm. Um, as for my personal um, experience, do I have diaspora relatives? Oh boy! You, you ask any Iraqi; they have countless. I have. Oh lord! Okay, I have family in. You know, you you may as well just bring uh, up. Do you know that that Where don't you tunes, um, Huh? Where don't you have family? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> uh, I was gonna say. Um. Sorry, I had an alarm that go oh, off. Oh, it's okay. To remind me of something. 
Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I was going to say, you know that, that Looney Tunes where he points at the countries and he makes a song out of them? Uh, <laughs> I think people know what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah, it's basically that. It's Okay, so um, I have family in Syria, in Iraq, obviously, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Norway, in the UK, in Canada, in the Ooh. US, um, across various Gulf countries. Yeah, and I have yeah, distant relatives even elsewhere, right? Some of them are more connected with, some of them are less. I'm less connected with, but um, I guess they're convenient connections to have. <laughs> but yeah, no, I have I have uh, relatives everywhere. Um, so yeah, uh, as for um, uh, the third question was, do I think about them serving? Most of them, when they do serve in foreign militaries, um, it's out of like they need to um, because they don't have any other options. Um, it's still not doesn't justify the reason but at least there's some reason there and most of them when they do serve they serve in translation roles because they're too valuable to go to anything else um because they speak not only arabic they speak usually dialects necessary for a particular regions so they usually work in translation roles hmm. um but if they do and with full conviction of the bullshit that is uh, the american prop military propaganda then i hope they get a bullet to the back of the head i don't care for them um <laughs> oh we're streaming yeah, from no. court hang on let me see if we can start <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but generally like if they have no other option and stuff like that's like okay yeah i can see some justification they're fine um but yeah i remember there's there's a book called iraq and turmoil um if you i don't very few people have read it i'm doubtful it was written for um american military personnel in particular and it was it's basically a loose political history uh of iraq and it was written by an arab guy i don't remember his name off the top of my head right now but in the uh, in the dedication, he's like, "Oh, this is dedicated to the brave men of the American military and blah blah blah, like this sort of shit." I'm like, "I want to strangle this motherfucker in his sleep um, for writing this." You are an Arab yourself, like these are your own fucking people that they're bombing and killing, and you're writing, "Oh, this is dedicated to the." Blah, blah. I get it that he probably has to write that shit. I get it, but also at the same time, Yanni, uh, oh God. yeah, okay, I don't want the stream to be. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop talking at that point but yes um generally yes the diaspora is everywhere it depends on their families and their particular situations as to their connectedness uh with their homeland um where i have family i have family fucking everywhere um surprisingly actually uh no you know i'm not even gonna mention that i'm not even gonna mention that point but uh no problem. Yeah, no, no I'll, I'll mention it to, i'll mention it to paul off stream um <laughs> but not, not on Loki. like and uh yeah and uh what's it called um as for the military serving if they really have to fine but otherwise yeah i'm not a fan of it yeah yeah no definitely definitely um oof diaspora uh <laughs> oof uh, uh edgy subject I, of I course mean, you irish <laughs> evil irish, irish yes, yeah, exactly oh my god uh, there are more irish people outside of ireland than in right oh there are i believe so like embarrassments yeah. unfortunately <laughs> many times. no i'm sorry I'm being, I'm being too harsh i'm being too harsh there i'm just thinking of like the the fucking yeah. police in, in america the yeah you know you know like the boston irish you hear about this kind of thing become really reaction really reactionary mm. very revolutionary in ireland they leave there's this massive famine they leave in the 1800s they yeah. become this reactionary force when they go to america and in canada mm. and stuff like that and it's such a disappointment they're obviously very they're obviously loads of great irish diaspora mm. people but uh yeah. unfortunately there's there's been some bad ones as well so mm-hmm. yeah shitty to see shitty to see anyway um at Berman's, mm-hmm. by the way says thank you very much Berman's. um kudos to both of you for all the work you the good work you do cheers uh cheers mm-hmm. I'll, I'll have a little sip of my beer to that so thank you Berman's. Mm-hmm. yeah so uh thank you comrade uh and thank you comrade for, for answering that question i appreciate that yes there is a question. Um, it's more. I think it's more towards me. I just want to quickly answer this one. Prophet Ains A I N Z or Z. Paul, what do you think of the break between the CPI okay. and the C- CYM, the Communist Party of Ireland and the Connolly Youth Movement? Do you think that they'll mm-hmm. last or die out like some splits? Um, I can't speak for the C for the CPI, the Communist Party of Ireland. I know there's there there are some issues there. We've highlighted them. Uh, the C the CYM have highlighted them. We've highlighted our issues. You'll find the collective statements on the CYM website, cym.ee. You'll find a statement of its affiliation. Um, we highlight some issues within CPI. We highlight like the ultra centralism, these abuses of democratic centralism, and so on and so forth. So you can check them out there if you want the the collective statement on that, which I think would be useful to do. As for the CYM, the CYM is extremely healthy. The CYM is growing massively day by day. More and more applications coming in. It's thriving. It's getting better and better. Without this sort of being weighed down by the CPI, we're sort of unleashed now. We can be fully democratic. We can do whatever we want. We're not sort of mm. under the yoke of anyone else. It, it's it's really opened up a lot of uh, new horizons for us. And it's a very exciting time to be engaged with the CYM. And I am very privileged to be a part of that. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm hugely excited about this moment. And uh, what the future holds, who knows? Let's see. If people are in Ireland, get involved at CYM. Uh, just cym.ie. 
find out a little bit of stuff join if you're interested cym.ie forward slash join uh by all means get in touch even if you're over over the age i mean of course it's for people aged between 16 and 30 but if you're older than that then please get in touch uh, register your interests and uh, we can definitely um keep you in the loop as to what we're going to do regarding uh, people who are over the age of 30 obviously it's a youth organization which doesn't have like a, a mother organization anymore it used to be the case that like if you aged out then you just go straight to the cpi but obviously we're not connected to the cpi now so we need to do something about that and something's going to happen so there haven't been any formal decisions made just yet but get in touch if you're curious um and we'll, we'll we'll let you know as soon as there's something available so very exciting time to be in the cym it's growing rapidly it's growing massively uh, i don't believe the cym is going to die out i can't say about cpi i'd just be speculating i don't want to talk shite about other organizations <laughs> i wish them well i hope they they sort out the issues that we've highlighted with them um but but yeah it, it's 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 a very it's been a very positive development for the cym and i, I totally uphold it i think i think it was a really really great and positive move and I, and I voted in support of it of course i was at the i was at the the, the meeting where we, we we made the decision to disaffiliate and i of course voted in favor of this affiliation so so yeah those are my thoughts on that sorry hakeem i know that's very region that's very specific to <laughs> Um, I'm always interested in, in listening to these things because uh, I have no direct connection to Ireland. So it's yeah, what well, you do now with, with me. <laughs> mm. I mean, I would like to have a direct connection with a part of Ireland in specific. But... <laughs> oh, I'm taking that in like the dirtiest way uh, possible. I hope you don't mind. We take <laughs> as it <was> intended. <laughs> <laughs> well you've definitely got a you've definitely always got a, a free couch uh, in mind if you want to ever stay on that so uh yeah, definitely anyway we'll, we'll talk exactly. talk after. <laughs> here's a here's a cool question here's a here's a here's the fun question this is this is a weird one actually it's a weird one uh getting off in some weird weird territory here but it was it was a recent question i thought i thought uh we'll come back to the questions that were asked earlier before the stream that we haven't gotten through this yet but uh mm-hmm. here's here's quite a recent question from someone called simple milk it's a fun name sure <laughs> can you ask <laughs> can you ask Hakeem his thoughts about cannabis legalization and his medical mm-hmm. opinion because you're, you're like a doctor and stuff like that so what's your yeah, medical yeah, opinion on this on this subject um all right <laughs> um i think this is something that gets me labeled as quote-unquote socially conservative because mm-hmm. i personally am against all um drugs with that said though, put them with um your... <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Incl- no i actually no per- me personally i also include alcohol into that character it's so a, drug, a personal percent. Yeah, yeah yeah um d- but also um when we talk about cannabis per se it is really unfair for the american characterization to kind of like be global where they kind of said oh hard drugs uh crack heroin marijuana that's really uh an unfair characterization of marijuana i would say yeah. um or and cannabis usage yeah. cannabis usage does have its benefits in certain medical uses for sure um and i know in many parts of the world uh particularly in the third world um manual workers uh smoke uh, marijuana after like hard days of work because it loosens uh muscles and whatnot it has um uh relaxing effects that may not you know it's it's it has some use for sure now my personal opinion of uh, legalization versus not i would rather um all forms of drugs including tobacco and alcohol and as well marijuana not be a thing mm. but i would not be uh i don't think there should be like this sort of um you mean for re- for like recreational i mean i was I, I yeah, assume... like recre- yeah like recreational use should be okay right um but i mean like there should not be an active segment of the economy that grows it for directly you know it did mm. ah, this is okay this is this becomes more difficult because i'm one person and this is supposed to be a democratic conversation that happens mm. with the rel- relevant groups um and then they re- reach a thing if you're mm. asking for my personal opinion personally i do not agree with its usage i would not kind of i would not say anything about your personal usage of it if you do partake but i personally uh, would not nor would i want the people around me to partake in it as well um, my medical opinion of it is that, uh, there isn't the medical, uh, or like the side effects of it or not, uh, uh, the, the way, the way to word this is like the negative aspects of it are mm. not as bad as it's been made out to be, particularly in traditional American media. Mm. Um, although there's been like this counter correction where they're trying to say like, it has no counter, like there's no cancer. effects whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. Which yeah. is absolutely not extreme. true. Yeah. 
yeah, not only is that, but there is other associations. There's associations with mental disease. That's a thing. There, pregnant women should not smoke, for example. There are certain associations with um, fetal hypoxia, for example, and results of that. It, it gets very deep and medical, and there's a lot of research that's going on right now into it. Um, but my general personal opinion is I'm against drugs in general, including tobacco and alcohol, as mm-hmm. well as cannabis and all the hard drugs for sure. If it comes from a policy perspective, I think uh, uh, cannabis, tobacco, and alcohol should be a lot for recreational use, but should be, um, what's it called, uh, in English, um, not monitored. Uh, what's oh, it I know, it, it's, it's, yeah, do you, do you support this thing where it's like, it's, it's not a commercialization kind of approach to it, it's, it's exactly. more like, I, I think, uh, Spain has a kind of thing where, like, if people want to do that, then they can have, like, little clubs, and they can, like, grow their weeds together, and, it's, it's, see, yeah, you un- perfectly understand what I think, it's not yeah. a, it's what not I like, a, it's, it's not a capitalist endeavor to, you, people aren't just seeing this as, like, an opportunity to make lots of money, mm-hmm. and you're, you're not, like, exploiting that, it's just, like, people want to get together and to do it, and it's, it's not a big deal, exactly or whatever, right. Right. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's, when it comes, exactly right, when it comes to the hard drugs, though, right um oh, yeah, users yeah. it should their decriminalization for use which what that means is that people who are who do use it should be allowed like they should be taken to proper clinics and tra- treated for it yes as for smugglers and people who bring it into stuff and shit like that these people should be hung out uh, upside down in the town square and ha- allow children <laughs> to throw stones at them personally um i don't think these people like it like I, smugglers yeah and, yeah these mm. like the the, like the the big kingpin stuff i would have a i would have a, a similar like and a lot of these a lot of these kind of areas that have been kind of done like you know we, we talk about this area like lumpen proletarian kind of areas like like mm. drugs like prostitution like all these kinds of things and like there's a very there's there's there are different dynamics there's like people who are in charge and who are exploiting people mm. and they're just like these ultra cynical horrific mega capitalists and yeah uh, exactly and they you know they should be dealt with like capitalists exactly, exactly. <laughs> with that's what that entails yeah. and that's the general thing exactly so yeah if it's a small scale thing then yeah it should be just like uh taken care of and these people should be re-educated out of this and stuff like that but if there is a concert like an actual effort for like currently in Iraq, there exists this there is a smuggling uh, effort of massive yeah. size and the people in charge of this yeah they should they should get what's coming to them yeah <laughs> right yeah um, yeah yeah that's... I'll, I'll share I'll share a funny story, actually, Please. a personal story. Um, heavy subject, by the way. Oh. Heavy subject to be just like, let me tell you a funny, let me tell you a joke. <laughs> <laughs> no, heroin. No, it's not used. No, 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 not used. No, stuff like that. No, nothing like that. Um, but I, um, uh, I remember I was not, this is when I was not in Iraq, I was uh, visiting elsewhere in another country. And I, I needed to get a haircut for a thing because there was a, an official thing that I had to get to and uh, I needed to get a haircut. So I go and I go get a haircut. <laughs> and the person who's giving me the haircut is a Albanian immigrant because that, no, he's from Kosovo. He was from Kosovo. Oh. So he really is giving a name to the fucking the stereotype. But uh, he was talking with me and he was like, hey, where are you from? Because you're not, you're obviously not from around here. You don't look like the people of this country. I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm not from here. I'm from Iraq. And he's like, oh. And the first thing he says to me is like, uh, did you know that Iraq has the best cocaine in the world? I'm like, what the fuck? What? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> okay. <laughs> did yeah, you, I was like, Akeem, excuse- did you know huh? that? <laughs> and I had no idea. Never, never in my life. No. And I asked, and, I, and, well. yeah. and I, I looked at him. And, uh, and two thoughts went through my mind. Number one, I was like, Iraq is not the best at anything, so that's probably <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> and, 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 and number two, I wanted to get more information. I was like, I want to know what's, why, how, how did you even interact with this? How did you know the origin of it? How did and this I want to be? Yeah, I want to get into it, but this motherfucker looked so sketchy. I was like, you know what? This guy has very I'm sharp... Sure yeah, so I'm like, you know what? Just cut my hair and let me get out of my get out of here, get out of here. This is <laughs> Wait, is that just a funny little. Um... <laughs> you didn't think about going back and like getting to the bottom of this and figuring out whether or not he was like a kingpin oh, and... or something. Thank, thankfully not. Yeah, <laughs> and by the way, the 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 name of the salon uh, was something mafia. Something mafia. Okay, well by that's kind of a, a bit of a giveaway. Yeah, so isn't something it? like like gold. Yeah, I was like golden mafia, some shit like this, right? Um, and I was like, aha, okay, well that's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's an act. Maybe he do- he really does know. I I would not. All right. <laughs> Wait, that's a, that was just a silly thing that that reminded me of for some reason. Oh my god, oh, that's my. hilarious. Mm. Oh man. Um. Yeah. Well, a little bit of a giveaway, I suppose. I mean, uh, I don't know. Mm. The cocaine shot. Man, there's be a little bit more of a giveaway, but yeah. You know, for something that kind of sucks about the like whole anonymity thing uh, aspect of this is that uh, because you know I want to maintain my anonymity, right? So I never give any personal stories. But there's so much fun shit that I can talk about. This is not one of them. This is just like a stupid tidbit. I have some good shit to talk about. Wait, but every once in a while, like, 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I was like, maybe off there, I'll, 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 I'll share some nuggets. Why not? <laughs> My life experience. Anyways, yeah, sorry. Next question. <laughs> well, here's a here's a, here's an interesting question though. It's a little bit, it's a little bit mm-hmm. different. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. George, uh, maybe I'm rich. It's uh, it looks like George to me, but it might be like Jorge or something like that. Uh, mm-hmm. J O R G E Stalin asks, mm-hmm. "What leads to the mindset of American?" <clears throat> Marxist Leninists, where they recently called indigenous people imperialists for opposing mm. things like USSA, the United Socialist Soviet. Uh, I don't know, USSR. Yeah. I, they're, they're trying to do like I, USSR, but USSA. Yeah. This this thing, socialism with American characteristics, all this kind of stuff comes into yeah. it. You, you, you can't call, I, I get the vibe that he's going for, like the question, I think. Uh, you can't call imperialist because, first of all, that's not the, 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 imperialism has a definition and you need to apply. So if they reject it, they're not being imperialist. Yeah. Um, that's number one. And this number two, uh, yeah, and uh, I think it's very fair to say the people who are indigenous to a land should have a say in how the land is structured yeah, okay. and yeah and for the united states to remain the united states just to have oh united soviet states of america and uh, they have the same state like you know um like there's still alabama still alabama and new york is still new york, like the uh, state structure is the same and everything's the same mm-hmm. and nothing fundamentally changes for the people who are actually belong to the land in indigenously for as long as history has been um yeah that's not this is something that's a uh, very iffy um yeah i agree are. i agree and I, I think this is a big thing like it's like ussr like that or doesn't stand for russia okay yeah. why would the ussa yeah, exactly. be like america like no like it was union of yeah. soviet socialist republic they were set they were like they mm-hmm. were they respected the right to self-determination of yeah. all of these different groups and nations mm-hmm. and and I think that that's really important. This this often gets sort of like mm-hmm. taped over or, or kind of plastered mm-hmm. over in these kind of conversations, and it's a huge problem. I mean, like people talk about like mm-hmm. socialism with uh, American characteristics, and they're, like they're <laughs> genuinely they're just talking about social democracy. Yeah. No, they're talking about I've imperialism never... with social democratic characteristics. Is what I'm talking about. Yeah, so it's I, nothing to do. With what I don't think I've about. heard any genuine like movements. I think this is just a Twitter thing. At least I hope. I, this is my hope. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking hope so. I swear to God, if this if if this is a real thing, then you're not mm. doing the mass line right. You're not actually talking to would, the people. Would you, be surpri- <laughs> would you? This is not the worst that left Twitter has to offer. So honestly, well, yeah, left Twitter it gets in some yeah. weird places. We haven't gotten into the fucking the weird sex stuff, thankfully. Oh no, God, don't bring it up. <laughs> Jesus please. Christ! Oh, no, I'm not gonna. But people know. <laughs> the people now that I've said that, the people know. I know, and now now you just have to know. Whatever the worst thing Jeez. you can imagine, it's that, and probably ten times worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, people can talk about the USSA. At least it's not going to grow as a say in that regard. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is, a, it's, it's, it's a weird mindset, and I think it's, it's, it's a very uh, colonizer kind of mindset. It's, it's, a, it's a strange colonial mindset where you're just sort of, you're assuming that everybody can unite under the flag of the bourgeoisie, under this American flag. Like we're all American, we can all get together under this flag. I mean, Stalin in Marxism and the National Question literally says that the proletariat cannot. We can't mm. unite under the flag of the bourgeoisie. We can't unite mm. under this national flag of the bourgeoisie. We can't unite under the flag of America or whatever these bourgeois uh, nations might be. You know, we, they're not even nations like by the by the, yeah. the standard of, of Marxism. And settler and so. colonial structures. Yeah, exactly. These settler colonial, settler colonial yeah. structures. So I think that that's a, that's an important uh, thing thing to raise. You know. Um, this question has been dealt with. Uh, there have been comrades all across the world who have dealt with the national question in much greater detail, which I would recommend people check out. Mm. Please, please, please read Marxism and the national question. And uh, you'll see very quickly, mm. it, it'll destroy any notions that people have about socialism with American characteristics or any of these kind of bourgeois, colonial... Uh, it's basically just an extension of imperialism, you know, just building socialism on top of imperialism without uh, dismantling the colonial structures that it's, that it's built upon. It's it's total, it's total Western chauvinism. and uh, Perfect, yeah. We, we we can't push forward with that completely as, completely agree as, as as any kind of progressives or as any kind of communists or people who want to move forward starkly like we can't we need to we need to solve these problems you know so 100 percent, yeah yeah so thank you very much um sally connell has a question for you here so sally yeah. connell says hakim could mm-hmm. you make videos yes. debunking mm-hmm. austrians like mises and hayek and things like abct ANCAPs mm. and the ECP, SVT, mm. Bohm Bowerk, mm. and that kind of stuff. So, would you be able mm. to make videos uh, doing that? Yes. Um, if you can't wait uh, for a video, then uh, you should see uh, Capitalism 101's blog. He's uh, uh, Brendan. Uh, 
not Brendan Fraser, no, uh, Brendan Cooney, <laughs> McCooney. Uh, <laughs> Brendan, he's the first guy that 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 really started proper uh, videos on this stuff, and he hasn't uploaded in like twelve years. Um, but yeah, he's his videos are good, so you can start there if you're uh, can't wait for me to make one. But it's on the list. If if you if I could ask you to please do this, could you DM me and tell me specific like write this so I can actually note it down later because mm. I'm gonna forget right now. Uh, but yeah, sure, it's uh, I, I can definitely do that because I've been I've been tinkering around with an idea about this um yeah great great brilliant uh thank you very much i'm sure that'll be a satisfactory answer and i'm sure they'll be in touch with you you're gonna have a million dms after this by the way i hope you can i don't mind man it's it's a lot of fun to talk with people you're a patient you're a patient fella i'll, I'll give you that <laughs> yeah more, more so than yeah. me anyway uh thank you very much comrade i, I really appreciate that okay there's been a mm. million questions let me see let me see if i can pull up a, a, a good one a good one here for you mm. Okay, now I, I think we asked mm -hmm. something about this. I think we may have touched on this earlier on. Uh, Nahid Ahmed, by the way, a, a big commenter on <laughs> all of our videos. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> of course, and I do appreciate you. <laughs> big appreciation. Uh, it's just like mm -hmm. Mashallah, X person is uploaded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I always heart them. The, you have to, the, you have to the heart them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Lots of love to this comrade. Ask Hakim if it's ever possible to get working class people in the global north to give a fuck about working class or oppressed people in the global south. And to expand on this mm. question, I often see people mm. in the US say Green New Deal, ignoring the role that resource mm. extraction plays in this. So this is the social democracy question again yeah. and the extraction. And any chance? I mean, yeah. we can't even get people to give a fuck about other working class people in the global north. <laughs> like, mm. <laughs> Never yeah, mind exactly in the global right. south. I mean, yeah. geez, in the same country in many no, cases, no, yeah, I think you right. give a fuck. Do you want to? Yeah, do you want to exactly. touch on that? And I think that there's one. Yeah, yeah. Um, this brings us back to the very beginning of this discussion. Uh, something that I mentioned earlier, which is that this is a fundamental failure of the leftist movements within these countries. Hmm. Right. We have not done our job. Me, myself included, by the way. I'm, I'm, this is not just you know. I'm not just throwing this on you guys. Mm. Myself, we have not done the job appropriately. We have not educated these populations sufficiently on everything, on what capitalism is, on why it's bad, on how it affects the rest of the world, on what imperialism is, how to combat it. We have not done the job. And if the job is not done, then you can't put the flame, the, the blame on those who are. Uh, I don't want to say innocent. Uh, I mean, they are innocent. The people who don't know better, mm. right? Not only do they not not know better, they're entrenched in a. Um, uh, socioeconomic and uh, cultural system that tells them everything against what is the actual truth, right? Um, they don't want them to properly think and analyze these things from like a materialist or Marxist perspective and have a proper understanding of these things because it would negatively affect the bottom line, of course, and mm. uh, uh, as a result, American imperialism and what have you. So that's why. So it's the failure of us. Um, how do we change this? Well, again, you need to start educating people. What is the best way to educate people? I think in the modern uh, world through the internet, uh, and YouTube and whatnot, I think that's a fantastic resource. I would have never been able to reach this many people in my life if I tried mm -hmm. outside of the internet. So this is number one. Um, and uh, number two is within said countries, you need to start institutions, groups. It doesn't have to be a party, but it can. you start on some level. And the, it's, it's really a domino effect, right? Because I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, right? I, when I first started, um, I think most... Marxists when they first started watching uh, videos on YouTube because I think most of us started I think okay at least my age and like I say this like I'm so like I'm that fucking old my god <laughs> uh, but I mean like my age and older um, we started by reading theory and then eventually we went to YouTube because YouTube is still a new thing I think for many young people they start off with YouTube and then go to a theory right I started with 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 um, theory and I became I radicalized kind of like myself quote unquote. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, more appropriately, it's like my material conditions radicalized me. And then I looked for answers to the questions I had and I found them in theory. Uh, and from then I went, and I watched YouTube videos of people who were the, the very first people to start. So one of them is the one I mentioned, um, uh, Capitalism 101, who was, uh, he's, Bre uh, um, again, Brendan McCooney, I believe is his name. Mm. Uh, I'm sure people know who I'm talking about. Um, uh, Jason Unruh or Unruh, hey, I don't remember how it's his Yeah, me neither. I, I say both yeah. ways. Yeah, but um, as well, even if like some people are like, oh, he's a meme or something. Hey, he was the first step for many people when they're yeah. when they're coming to the online space for radicalization. Makes some good points as well. and, exactly. That's also, exactly by the right. way, can we and just say he he's actually kind of a sweetheart. I just saw recently, like like he just literally, I think it was yesterday or today. I, I just saw he had a video like where he shouted out. Uh, the obnoxious anarchist and he, he literally made a video just to say hey everybody go support these new left-wing content creators yeah. that's such a fucking mm. sweet thing to do like yeah. it's a really yeah, nice he's... so yeah big mm. big props i've never had a negative 
I've never had a negative interaction with him, and I, a lot of the hate that he gets, I don't understand. But anyways, my, my point being is that um, he reached me and people like uh, like people like us, Paul and I, and other people, and all of us have went on to make, you know, and from the efforts of these people, right, have radicalized others, and this domino effect, I have reached others, and who knows, maybe five years down the future, somebody who's a viewer of mine is going to end up with a channel that has half a million or even a million subs who re reaches an even further, like a much larger audience than I ever would, you know, and on and on. So what I'm saying is we have to start somewhere. It's okay that you start small, but start organizations of some kind and begin educating people. It yeah. looks like it's a lot of work until the revolution happens, right? Then you're ready to go. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, yeah, right. Uh, to, to quote, just the thing is what Luxembourg said is like, um, before the revolution, it seems impossible. After the revolution, it seems inevitable, right? Mm. Um, so that that's what we always have to keep in mind. Mm. But yeah, so that's that for that question. Mm -hmm. brilliant thank you so much uh, i appreciate that let's see i i think we're, we're sort of approaching the three hour mark now yeah I, I think we can do maybe two more questions yeah maybe two um, more and then we'll we'll sort of wind things down we'll sort of wrap things up exactly i think we'll be good yep. to go i'll take a i'll take a question from the chat as well i know i've taken mm -hmm. a few questions earlier on so i'll take mm -hmm. so people please just put a message into the chat there I'll, I'll grab a good one if it's a really good one we'll, we'll make sure <laughs> to answer that and uh, i'll take one or two from the earlier questions that were asked first so uh let's yeah, let's go ahead Let's go for those. Um, well, here's a here's a well. There's a couple of nice ones here. I'm keeping keeping you on edge. You know, give me give me a second. I'll find a good one. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Professor <laughs> Potatoson. I don't know about the credentials of Professor here. Maybe they're. I'm <laughs> <laughs> check whether or not they're a real professor i don't know i've got my suspicions but anyway uh professor potato son says paul what do you what do you and hakeem think would be the solution if we reach a point where revolution becomes impossible hypothetical scenario not likely to happen revolution becomes impossible yeah. do you think that it there could be a situation where revolution becomes impossible no i don't think uh, what can happen is that revolution becomes a much smaller likelihood has, has a much lower probability in certain sectors or sections of the world regions of the world Agreed. i think that's the quote-unquote worst it can get i don't think it'll ever be an impossibility yeah revolution is almost it's funny to say but revolution is almost universal we can say from the dawn of human civilization until you gonzalo is <laughs> <laughs> exactly right but no as funny as it is to say if you remember um again if, if people read their mouth you realize that he speaks about um revolution happening under communism like action stateless mindless like actually when we reach communism there's revolutions in communism too as it develops mm, right yeah. and he discusses he, he gives also the domino analogy and all that kind of stuff so i think it, it yeah it will always be a universal thing i don't think so but um let's reframe the question if it becomes very difficult well then if it, if it becomes very difficult then your um uh, main goal is to number one uh, try to mitigate this difficulty and number two try to support um, movements elsewhere that could have um, success that could reduce the stress on you, mm. right? Um, and uh, increase the the revolutionary like uh, possibility within your own country. Uh, mm. We discussed this, I think, at length earlier. Mm. But you can give your opinions. Yeah, no, I agree absolutely. We should be supporting our comrades in in positions where it is more likely to happen. There, there are many weak links in the chain where we should be supporting mm. our comrades, and like we should definitely like there are people engaged in revolutionary communist movements right now. You know, uh, whether that's mm. in the Philippines or in Turkey or. To a lesser extent, I suppose in Nepal, I know they took more of a right deviationist position. <laughs> okay, we can, that's a whole different thing. But um, uh, <laughs> India as well, like there are people actually engaged like in armed struggle like right now, and, and and we can actually support them in certain ways. If you investigate, you will find <laughs> answers to that. Yes, I can't yes, give them yes. right now, obviously for uh, legal reasons. But we can definitely support them, and I think that that's what we, we exactly. should be doing. And if we can't support them materially, then at least uh, direct help to direct other people who might be able to support the materially direct their attention towards these organizations it is difficult it is difficult. like for example like if someone asked me like concretely can you give me like a link to support the communists in the philippines no i actually can't because <laughs> there's like an above ground legal struggle and there's a bunch of organizations associated with that and if you if you if you link them if you link to them and say this is going to help the revolutionary communist movement then that gets them into legal trouble with the government because if there's yeah. any organizations that are directly linked to the underground struggle then and they can be repressed in the most horrific yeah. ways under Duterte. And so there are difficulties there, but there are ways around it. Just keep inquiring. The, the, the way the way to say it is, yeah, look, if, if you look, you'll find it. But fundamentally, the 
the very first step of material um, uh, support is to, first of all, uh, educate yourself, and second of all, educate others. And then yes. afterwards, you can start all the other ones. Yeah. But yeah, if you look, you'll find. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Keep on looking, stay curious, and, uh, and, mm. and you, can, you can definitely help. You can definitely, you can definitely play a role. So um, yeah, brilliant. Listen, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mass Casually says, I gotta get along. Take it easy, y'all. I Paul and Hakeem, thanks so much for this solidarity. Solidarity, comrade, thank you for, so much for being Take here. Take care, Habibi. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for being here, by the way. I think that's absolutely great. Um, Andrew Harper asks, did Hakeem study abroad? <laughs> Does he read books in English or Arabic? <laughs> um, as to where I studied and how and whatnot, that is something that I'll I'll tell Paul after. Ah, <laughs> but I'll keep this to mind. If, wanna... if, people, if, if people remember, like uh, this is something I mentioned uh, a long time ago, but people can, uh, I'll, I'll let the, the people uh, like in, in chat try to figure it out. Um, but as for uh, what languages I read in, uh, mostly it's English. Um, the reason is because most things are written in English. English yeah. is the global lingua franca, so we have to. Um, and also, um, as funny as it sounds, it's, English is very enjoyable to read. Don't uh, say that. Enjoyable is a... How dare you. It's a strange word to use. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say it like this. I'll say it like this. It's very easy to read in English because the academic... Um, uh, like the, 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 the word usage is very standardized at this point. So mm -hmm. if you... Because the the like tradition, particularly the, like the Marxian tradition, uh, has long existed in English. So when you look at a term, for example, um, uh, you'll be able to like it's kind of standardized across many years and many different kinds of works, right? But when you look at, for example, Arabic works, it's usually like local regional translations. There's no like government office that does these translations. So the um, idea, the, the uh, terminology is not standardized. Mm. So sometimes you'll see two different words and two different works, but they mean the same thing because they're just translated differently, if you're getting what I mean, mm. right? Mm. Um, so English also helps with standardization of translations and stuff like that. So it's just, it's, just, it's wider, um, you know, a wider pool to, to draw from. That's why English is a, yeah. So that's my fundamental language. Um, but I have had uh, the, I don't want to say, I don't know if it's pleasure or displeasure, of reading books in languages I don't speak. So I had to sit with like a dictionary next to and like translate like a fucking people had to do like a hundred years ago. Um, there's a Bosnian book I had to read that way. Um, Lacerda's book on Stalin, I had to read that way uh, because it was in Italian and I got an Italian oh, copy wow. and there was no English translation. And just now finally somebody has done a proper English translation. So I'm gonna reread it now with this English translation. Um, but uh, yeah, at the time I had to uh, sit and uh, Oh my god, that was such a fucking mess. Jesus, but yeah, hey, it was done, and I, Oof. yeah. So, so I, I, yeah, I, I learned ever so slightly. Um, but it was, it was, it was a fun time. It was, a, it was a fun time. <laughs> well, uh, I, I don't envy that moment. Jesus Christ, reading. Yeah, Italian. I can't read from Italian. Jesus fuck. I mean, maybe if you speak like a language that's kind of, mm. you know, one of the, like the Romance languages. Like if you speak like yeah. uh, I don't know Portuguese, uh, yeah. maybe maybe you speak like Spanish, something like so, that. There's a little slow and steady wins. Slow and steady wins the race. It's Oof, painful at first, fair. but it gets it picks up after a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's impressive. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, come one last question, and then we'll and then we'll wrap things up. We'll do yes. shade outs and all sorts. Sure thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Comrade Kartoffel Mandelden, I can't pronounce that, asks, <laughs> uh, oh, actually, we, we already answered half of this question earlier on. Is there a reason for Hakim not labeling himself a Maoist? We talked about that earlier on. We talked about the rupture, the continuity, all this sort of stuff, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, what are his thoughts on the PCP, so the Peruvian uh, situation, mm -hmm. and the CPP, so the Communist Party of the Philippines? Any thoughts on the PCP and the, the CPP? Uh -huh. And ending on a very controversial <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> I, can, I can quickly give my yeah, so uh, Gonzalo is forever uphold the eternal thought of our. Uh, I'm, I'm not getting it. We must yeah, pass no. through a river of blood before communism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you say this like ironically. This shit is well as written. Man. You I literally can't said this shit. It's right. wild. Yeah. Oh man, it was yeah, crazy. It's, stuff. it's like, like it's dude. Don't pretend you're not like a white guy with psoriasis. Stop with the <laughs> fucking. Oh yeah, we're gonna pass through. There's no. You've never passed through a river in your life. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, Gonzalo okay, could be Mal pretty Mal melodramatic. Yeah, <laughs> Mal s swam across the Yangtze River, okay? He deserves to be like, oh, with the river of He can say that shit, okay? You, like, take a seat. <laughs> sit, anyway. sit down, professor. Okay, yeah. just take yeah, it easy. Yeah, exactly. Not, not to disrespect Gonzalo, though. <laughs> no, I mean, he, he had great contributions. I mean, he did great yeah. stuff, but he, he also Let's, fucked yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'll start with my opinion of the Philippines, the movement in the Philippines. Um, I personally think, I hope this is not a controversial point, I think that the movement in the Philippines is the um, 
greatest hope that there is for a chain of revolutions that will kind of like it will be the spark for the next um set you know uh, to, to kind of like you know totally. yeah because totally it's never agree. it's never just one off right it's yeah. one and Tumbles. then several follow and then f- yeah some of them fail some of them succeed blah blah, blah all that kind of stuff mm. i think it's going to be the one the most likely um why because of the tenacity of the movement they have experienced sorts of the sorts of hardships that no very few movements have known and they have persevered through decades they've recently passed their 50th an- uh, anniversary of the of the people's war i think it was 2018 right mm-hmm. uh the That's 50th right. anniversary it was yeah. Yeah, um, 1968, and now it's uh, yeah, 2018. Mm. Um, and uh, Third the party's even old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, not only this, but they have both an above ground and underground movement. Um, not only this, but they've recently expanded their um column, the presence of their uh guerrilla columns. Um, in the Philippines, they have a presence on I think all the islands, if not like the majority of them at this point. Mm. Um, in the Philippines, uh, and uh, they're giving the central government a real headache. Um, oh, yeah. not only this, but yeah, I've, I've had, um, uh, you know, so weird. Actually, I'll tell another story. Um, apparently somebody within the movement, within the armed movement, it's not somebody, two friends watch my videos and one of them contacted me through the above ground movement, asking me to wish them happy birthday. Wow. Um, so that was very interesting That's and amazing. very neat. It's so wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, exactly. It's very wholesome. And it's I, like Joma. And like a nice. You know, like Joma and his like fucking karaoke's, and you're just like, holy shit! You were like the most dangerous person for like Western imperialism for many years, and now you're just vibing on mm. YouTube, singing karaoke, singing like seasons greetings to people. <laughs> like the most oh recent. God. It's like holy shit! This mm. is amazing. You you, you were like the leader mm. of like the fucking vanguard of the international proletarian movement for decades. Now you're just yeah. vibing. You're you're doing karaoke on YouTube. Yeah, it's wild. It's it's insane. Living in Utrecht, but living the life, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, <laughs> but yeah, so, so that was interesting. But what I'm saying is, I personally think that they're um, the uh, best hope, uh, not best hope. I want that makes it sound like there are no other alternatives. No, what I mean is like they oh, are ones who are most, most progressed. Likely. Yeah, yeah, and most likely to succeed. And I wish them all the best. And of course, the material support is due for them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, with that said, though, um, I think that the at the movement. So I don't. Under, this is something I don't understand with how how much they've achieved. Mm-hmm. I don't understand how they're so not unknown but um how under like supported and under spoken of excuse me yeah uh, I agree. In, uh, why not communism it makes... why not full communism yeah. <laughs> with that infrastructure with the dual power structures they have like why not just just fucking go for it jesus <laughs> no, no, no. no 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 that's uh, what i mean is in western spaces like english speaking yeah, spaces nobody talks about them yeah nobody even knows about them like mostly right it's a it's a thing like oh you've marked it for a while and then you learn about them it's very strange yeah um so that's i think a failure on again on our part agree, uh, yeah. for not educating so yeah, um, but that. that's my my yeah my, my hope is that uh, I we could get mo- people from the uh, above ground movement to to like maybe make videos on this oh, sort of stuff. So uh, yeah, imagine. Yeah, I remember I was I, I was talking with somebody about this, but it didn't get anywhere, and I was yeah. And plus, we have to consider their safety and whatnot. Course, so that's my yeah. general yeah condition. And also something that's very important is you sh- people should read the writings um on there particularly the history of it it's very very interesting there's Amazing. no modern history written of it the, the last book that was written on it was published like 1978 so it's very out of date um but there they have their own publications they publish in english a little bit um and all that stuff so look into it uh and study the history because um uh the history of the of the split in the movement and then the rectification campaign and uh how they reorganized the the, the um, guerrilla war or the people's war uh all that kind of stuff very very um interesting stuff uh, that should be understood. But yeah, that's kind of it. Other than that, when it comes to their criticisms, I'm going to withhold because they have little to be criticized about considering their conditions. You know, it's kind of unfair. Like, is, oh, they're doing this, this, this. Yeah. yeah. Like it, within those conditions and also just the rectification, it's like they know their criticism. They know when they veered off to the left. Mm. They know when they veered off to the right. Mm. Like they, they, that's mm. the purpose of these rectification campaigns. Like they admit it and they're like, okay, let's get back on track. And that's the purpose mm. of these rectification. Like, so it's really hard to criticize them. Oh, they did this fucked up thing like in the seventies or the eighties or whatever. It's like, yeah. And they, they recognize that and they're, they're moving on from that. They're not stuck in that place. They're, they're moving on and correcting it, you know? So I think that that's something that mm. so many other communist movements in the world are just missing and uh, are, are very reluctant to do. They're very reluctant to criticize themselves. And, and I think that this is, this is a really important development. <laughs> we need to be able to self crit We need to create a, Mm. Uh, an atmosphere where criticism is acceptable and okay and we can criticize the people 
our leaders and our central committees, the rank and file are comfortable speaking up and saying, I think we fucked up here. <laughs> we messed things up. And, and I think they've done it really well. The comrades in the Philippines have done a really, really yeah. good job of, of nailing that. And we should all be looking towards them as a, as a beacon for how communist organizations should be run uh, in the 21st century. Mm. In my opinion. Yeah, beautifully said. Um, absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. Oh, fuck me, I can't speak. Wholeheartedly. <laughs> Man, the syllables, the syllables fuck me up. Right? <laughs> Right, English is the stupidest fucking language. I swear, yes. how the hell is through Down sp- spelled all fucked up and pronounced as through? Fuck this language. <laughs> through, um, thorough, true, true, T R U E. Jesus Christ, what a yeah. mess. Though, my God, the spelling. But yeah, oh. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, and I was gonna say something. Uh, what was the the other part oh, of that PCP. question was the the shining path. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as for the shining path, I'm sorry to say, me personally, I think. Um, they are not particular. They're an example to be learned from, not exactly an example to be upheld. Now, why do I say this? Mm. I say this because the um, controversies of the movement, even with clarification, um, they're the errors that they have committed are okay. Number one, the the movement failed. I think that's the fundamental issue. The movement failed, and when we when a movement fails, we have to take a look at the considerations why it happened, um, and you can realize several flaws with the shining path and uh, i can just like quickly name i think five off the top of my head number one the cult of personality mm. undeniable and something that should be rectified this isn't something that should not exist at yeah all. jeff Achura right. and stuff like that yeah it's, it's it's a bit it's a bit dodgy yeah. um yeah and he got to the point of it split the movement when he was arrested um mm. and uh at like you know and now you you have like apps mess it it, it it fell apart. Like, oh no, actually the, the was when he was uh, arrested. Yes, but that also split the movement. And with the split of the movement, that's what allowed them to be cornered. And um, the, it was running off the the, the momentum that they had before he was. And number one, number two, the high centralization uh, of uh, this is something that um, the shining. It was one of the most important lessons yeah. of the shining path. It's the centralization of uh, knowledge and command. I've spoken about this on other um, points, and Guevara has discussed this on different points, uh, like uh, the, the, the general theory of it. It's the uh, st- uh, streamlining of differing, um, let's say, avenues or like streams of leadership, right? Especially when it comes to armed movement, but also the political movement. Mm. Uh, it shouldn't be you shouldn't be a um, like a, a snake that you cut off the head and then the body dies. It should be the sort of thing where you, if you were to cut one head, two will appear instead. Right. Mm. Um, you should always have multiple streams. And this is the most important uh, lesson, because what happened is you had an almost like an ossified central committee um, with Gonzalo as the godhead of it. And when they were taken out, right, not only were they taken out with the central leadership, but they also were all the ones with the central information. The rest of the movement didn't have, for example, yeah. Gonzalo on his computer had uh, the um, not on his computer in his notebooks. He had all the uh, details. I think it was a computer, actually. Yeah, he had all the details of all the amount of ammunition that they had and everything. the different guns and where the different positions. Everything was there. This is such a colossal error. And by the way, it wasn't like, oh, it was encrypted and blah, blah. No, literally, you open up the laptop, dun, 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 and you have the fucking... Like, how... I, I Honestly, like, this sort of... Like, that shows that they were so... It shows, like, another error, which is that they got um, arrogant in the mm-hmm. movement. Um, because w- at what stage did they reach? They reached strategic in the Maoist terminology, strategic equilibrium with the Peruvian state. Yeah, they, they were never approaching strategic. strategic. Yeah, they didn't get into the strategic strategic offensive. Yeah, but they were they were approaching it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they stopped at strategic equilibrium. Right at that point, they became arrogant. That they're like, oh well, we're gonna win. No, you're not gonna win. If you forget what happened to the Maoists, all right, in 1928. Uh, you need you need to learn from history. You need to realize that until the revolution, not even until the revolution is won, decades upon decades after the revolution is won, you cannot lose your vigilance. And they lost it before the revolution was even won. So that's another one of the errors. Another third one of the errors was um, this is kind of a this is a like a more I think modern um, criticism. This isn't a criticism that existed at the time. Uh, I do find it kind of unpleasant that the 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 kind of rank and file were mostly indigenous, while the main cadre and the main leadership was all white ethnic uh you know like a um mm. european ancestry mm. uh peruvians i think that's all also kind of dodgy um yeah if yeah. you look at the, if you look at for example the soviet m- movement you have everything from bundists to uh leadership amongst the tatars and the uh, ca- um Cauc- like the, the caucasian um uh nations to um the the J- um jadids in the uh, central asian republics to you know you have streamlined leadership across many different factors that eventually came to the party right mm. um 
But when you look at the Peruvian movement, you realize that it's very, it's a shame really that they were by majority whites in a country that is, I yeah. think, majority um, indigenous. Uh, another error of the movement um, was um, the antagoni antagonization of the peasantry at different points, not always, because the peasantry were generally mm -hmm. on their side. Why do I mean antagonization? What, um, if, oh, if people America. know the Lenin? Huh? Lucana Marca, Jesus Christ. Yeah, exa Lucana exactly Marca right. Yeah. It's wild. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly what I mean. <clears throat> if people read their Lenin, uh, what's said is always, you <clears throat> um, politically educate the middle peasant. The small peasant will be on your side by economic necessity and also uh, shared interest generally. Mm -hmm. um, the proper political education needs to be, go to this level as well as the middle peasant. And the uh, kulaks or the just landlords and whatnot, these people, um, you can try a uh, political struggle with them or you can try to just impose taxation at first or you can, uh, you know, do the other thing, right? Um, the, <laughs> the other the, thing. The Maoist thing, <laughs> <the Maoist's laughs> thing that we really like, right? Um, they didn't follow. The, and, and this is like if they read their Ho Chi Minh, if they read their Mao, they would have known. And they did. They, they upheld Mao to such a ridiculous uh, like degree and they didn't realize that antagonizing the peasantry, which is your primary base at any level is a mistake. You should sooner take a political defeat than antagonizing the the, the main um, uh, social uh, base of your movement. Right? It would be better to lose a town or to lose a battle than to lose the um, political uh, the, the, your political support amongst the social base because the social base again, like Mao said, it's like the fish the 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 party is like the fish uh, in and the masses are like the water. Right? Mm -hmm. You should go through them and be and without them you can't live. Right? That's the main thing. As long as the masses are there and the social base for the movement is there, you can. There is room for future victories. If you lose your social base, the movement is ended right then and there. And that was one of the fundamental issues. There are so many I can get into. Right? What were the contributions to kind of like make it? Uh, oh, one more thing: the the extreme extreme dogmatism against everything. The yeah. Cubans wanted to support them, wanted to send them money, even guns. Supposedly, ooh, nobody really knows. Controversial, but you know mm. what I'm trying to say. Like they wanted mm. to send them guns, they wanted to send them money. What did they say in return? Oh, you know what? Uh, fuck you. You guys aren't even socialist. And yeah. then they start all this. Oh, the the fascist fucking Castro brothers, blah, blah blah. Oh, dictatorship. This stuff. I'm like, all right, is this necessary? How they assassinated a DPRK official in Peru, the the, the embassy, uh, a member of the embassy. Mm. Why? What does this serve? Actually, what material benefit does this serve the movement, right? Antagonizing mm. at the time the Soviet Union, which also wanted to extend support, by the way, uh, antagonizing China as well, which I think this is uh, after they started, uh, they stopped like g granting out, you know, money and guns and, and diplomatic support, but still antagonizing other socialist movement for no reason whatsoever, aside mm. from the theoretical pur pur purity. I'm dragging on, so yeah, like these are many, many mistakes. What are the um, uh, contributions? And here's where it gets dodgy. Honestly, there are some, but they are few. And also other movements proved them or, or gave those contributions without the, the damage that th that particular movement caused. So I think the most important contribution is to learn it and learn it very deeply, the, the experience of the Shining Path, so you can avoid their mistakes. I think that is the most important contribution. As for the MLM aspects and Gazala's thought and all that kind of stuff, um, I see, uh, I don't see eye to eye with people on that stuff. I don't particularly consider to uh, always be, you know, like a new rupture, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nor is it the best formation. I think the, the, the like, for example, the Afghani um, uh, MLMs did a better job of, of, of discussing uh, these uh, uh, new, like, developments and whatnot. Mm. It, yeah, like, I can drag on for a, lo a longer, much longer time. No, but yeah, I think it's most, great. Uh, yeah. It's a really, it's Most a really cool thing. conversation. I love, I love, I love hearing this perspective. Yeah. I think it's important, and and like these criticisms, mm -hmm. I think are, are very useful. I mean, there is, there is an element when we when we start talking about like the PCP SL, uh, we can sometimes get into. A, there is a tendency towards dogmatism sometimes of just saying, well, Gonzalo mm -hmm. said that the militarization of the party and concentric organization and Jeff Atura and PPW are all universal, mm -hmm. so they must be universal because he said mm -hmm. it. And it's like, well, this isn't yeah, really exactly. a historical materialist, a scientific socialist analysis a way of approaching these things. You know, uh, some aspects mm -hmm. might be uh, mass line, certainly. Uh, cultural revolution, yeah, definitely. We can see that they've been proven through the world historical revolutions. Exactly. But uh, has has Jeff Jura been proven to be universally applicable? Mm. PPW, mm. we can definitely say it might work, might be better, might be useful, but has been proven. Mm. You know, there's there's definitely some questions to be had there, and, and there are some I, issues I with think, dogmatism, you know, that we need to address. Yeah. And I, I think also the beginning of the movement is a very important area of study um, uh, because it's, uh, especially for people from semi-feudal nations, um, because it's a very interesting avenue that hasn't, this is not, no other revolution started the same way as the Peruvian one did. Um, which is very mm. interesting to know. Um, so yeah, so the most important contribution is the study of it, the actual example that they gave. Yeah, I love studying that. It's really yeah, interesting. It is. 
And you know what is interesting? I tell you what is interesting. Um, there there is kind of a thing like mm. BPW, like on on the point of universality, and this this is maybe a slight point in favor of the universality of PPW but not like a full mm-hmm. point of favor there was this kind of idea mm-hmm. that like PPW was just kind of this thing that you could do like in Asia <laughs> it's only relevant in Asia <laughs> and and of course we yeah. saw this like in China you could argue that we saw it in Vietnam you can, you can make these arguments mm-hmm. and so forth it's just that thing that works mm-hmm. over there it doesn't really work anywhere else in the world and then they did it in Peru and it actually it did yeah. have some pretty big success it was brutal mm-hmm. it was violent there was Oh Jesus Christ! Were their excesses, but uh, but it was also effective, if nothing else. And and that, that that's not a that's not an appraisal. That's not to say it's perfect, but that just to say that it was effective. It did secure territory, you know. And uh, so I I do think that that was that is important to engage with. I mean, it just that that's that's not to say it's perfect, but just to say that it's important to engage with that this has happened in other, in other areas, and uh, we should exactly right. We should and, and controversial point actually. I'm gonna say one thing just yeah. to keep it nice and juicy for the end. Something that I've always thought about personally, but I haven't had the time to research and properly develop. I think there is a parallel between the Gonzalo's experience of the Shining Path and uh, the experience of People's War that they had, and Focoism of the of the Latin American oh, variety yeah. of the uh, ELN, EZLN of the Cuban experience of the Guatemalan um, and, and other um, uh, guerrillas. Uh, I think there is a parallel there that some people find uncomfortable, so they don't, always don't mention it. And then they try to say, like, no, no, it was a completely different movement because focusism is based on, like, actually being the focus that causes the the social, uh, like, um, support to arise from the focus while the people's war is supposed to be from the people and then the armed movement. And mm-hmm. well, I'm like, well, you know, if you look at how it actually started. Yeah, but this is something that I would like to see if I hopefully, if I get the time, I want to actually do proper research into this. Otherwise, I'd like somebody else to also, if they have time or interest, to also look into this. Uh, but yeah, so that's just a side point. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a really cool one to look into. Um, this, yeah, this question of focalism, I think, is, is, is quite interesting as well. Because focalism was, was was quite an interesting development. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, it didn't work anywhere else. You know, it worked in Cuba, uh, yeah. worked in Cuba, and okay, you can have criticism of Cuba. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, you understand the material conditions yeah. that it was in, but uh, it didn't really work anywhere else, was... which is an issue. You know. Yeah. Because the the way it was done in Cuba was different than anywhere else, and I think that was Guevara give, give put too much. He was a romantic at the end of the day, so yeah. he put too much stock, yeah, in in the in the oh, you know, the heroic uh, guerrilla, and then the people are inspired. When in reality, there already existed a very prominent um, movement within the cities, mm. um, frequent general strikes, and all that kind of stuff. The revolution was already brewing. Mm. What was the uh, apple that was you know forced to make fall was mm. the landing of the Sierra Maestra, and then the defeat of the military and whatnot. But uh, still, like, yeah, 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 there's a that's a very fun conversation to be had, and I think also focusism deserves to have its kind of a um, reevaluation because if you read some people they talk about oh it was a far uh, left deviation yeah, the ultra. Um, yeah 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 and i personally think that the way that Guevara did it in the congo yes for sure um the way he did it in bolivia not so much but also to an extent the way it was done in cuba was the proper way and that's the way it was analyzed and then you can kind of intersect that with people's war very fun conversation to be had but it's yeah, too definitely. late now <laughs> <laughs> it's too late approaching three and a half hours <laughs> Oh it's probably God. time. Oh man, this has been so good. I've I've yeah. really really appreciated this, and I've loved talking to you. And oh man, there's so much to think about, and like we've got so much to talk about off the air. So <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I love it. Oh, this is great. Um, come here to me. Mm. Thank you so much, Comrade. I really really appreciate you making the time to do this. Uh, and especially you're not even home. You know, you're not even home right now. You're off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, look. I need to get to where the good internet was. All right. <laughs> 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 well it works yeah. i mean i don't think there are any major yeah. issues i mean i, I there yeah, seems to I be hope not, yeah. i think i'm actually having a little bit of internet difficulty i'm probably having more internet difficulty here in ireland right now than you are at the moment mm. um, perfect see so the, the stallest internet has to have its way somewhere yeah we're bouncing it out <laughs> like we're after the three hour mark it's, it's getting slightly dodgy but i think i i, I think yeah. it's okay i don't think there are any major mm. issues comrade thank you yeah. so much for coming on i really appreciate it would you like to would you like to shout out anything or let people know about any upcoming projects or works that you've yeah. uh, gotten in the pipeline at the moment and anything at all there's sure, tons yeah, of yeah. shout outs to, to comrades sure sure yeah yeah um there's one shout out i'd like to do um there's this um channel that's very uh like you know it's it's on the up and up and it really deserves more attention and views it's called the uh, paul moran's channel oh <laughs> unironically oh, unironically though people oh, God, no way <laughs> Uh, un- unironically no though I, I, I've I shouted Paul out Paul Moran maybe like three times and I can't shout him out enough him and you Yugopni so um, Bay Area um, Vicky uh, I have a list of like 30 oh, other yeah. comrades that I need to shout out eventually I just don't I can't find the time to properly you know because I have to watch their videos You're and busy, find man. the ones I like the most to give the two recommendations yeah mm. it's, a, it's a long thing but yeah um, as for a thing 
um yeah i just have my channel so go check it out if you'd like as for um like it, what future projects um i'm sorry to say I, work has been really heavy uh since the beginning of the new year um and i am absolutely spent i do not have the energy right now to do really long form research videos mm. um so i'm gonna keep it to something short at least for like another month or something until i can recoup um as it stands now the next project i have is something very simple i'm gonna be making a, a book recommendations uh on something people have been asking uh, for a lot so I'll, I'll do something on that maybe a couple of response videos um i'm working on a couple of interesting guests to have on i've never had guests on my channel but there's some oh, very class you're gonna do interviews um, some very interesting yes uh but only like two or three and it's the three people i've wanted to have on my channel ever since it started and uh can you yeah, and uh can you give us a hint or is that is uh, that you're gonna keep it kind of like low-key uh -huh. for a little while i mean i mean uh, maybe it's uh uh, socialism is when the government does stuff. No, <laughs> maybe no that's way, hint. really? <laughs> oh, maybe, wait, possibly, are you, maybe. Are, are you, are you possibly maybe in touch with this comrade? Maybe, possibly, maybe. Maybe, oh, maybe, possibly, maybe. Oh, um, fuck. And, that's and gonna be great. I have, I have two other very uh, important, I'll keep the other two guests secret for now, but they're, they're right, also, well, you got a low key. have on forever. DM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Oh, that's yeah. gonna be fucking cool. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you after when we're off. Yeah, uh, please. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I'll, I'll, that's I'll, huge. I'll share it over. <laughs> so yeah, I'm um, not gonna say anything else because that. Yeah. I mean, that's. I, I think some. I think people will probably yeah. get it from that already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They should. They should. That was too obvious. I was trying yeah. to think of a more like a sly way of putting it, but yeah. We'll have to edit. I'll have to edit exactly. that out of the stream. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, you can. If you want to leave it in, you can. I don't nah. mind. That's cool. Yeah. So that's about that. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Holy shit. Yeah. Will you we okay. Um could you please clarify to this comrade that Portugal is not mm. socialist? That's just that's just the one request that I have when this comrade comes yeah. on. Just that's all that's all I ask. That's all I ask. This this particular comrade <laughs> is um really uh hiding his power level, let's say, but I'm not gonna continue on that. You guys can can <laughs> <laughs> oh, if, if this is the country who I think it is, it's just that they said at one point that Portugal was a good example of socialism, and I just, I was just yeah. like, man, come on, yeah. you've done such good stuff. Yeah, I know. Why, why, why you gotta go and say that? Why you gotta go say Portugal is a good example of yeah. socialism? Get out of here. Let's we'll get out. Talk, of we'll, we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk, talk off the air. We'll, 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 <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all right, okay, cool. We're, we're no, we're gonna wrap that up. Hakim, thank you yes. so much. I really appreciate you being here. I appreciate you in general. You're fucking great. You're Habibi, inc anything for you, Habibi. Honestly. Wow. I'm sending. You I'm know sending how many? I get through the air. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's gonna be on my repeat for now on. <laughs> Little <Yeah>. gift. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Habibi. Oh so. my god. Yeah. So listen. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been it's been great. It's been an absolute pleasure. Anytime. I would love to do this again. Mm. Uh, probably seven months from now, we'll probably do the same thing. I'm sure we'll be, we'll be vibing. We'll be, we'll be, we'll maybe we'll have reached conclusions on China. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> let's, maybe. Let's see. Maybe. Oh, we'll swap places. Let's put, a, <laughs> let, let's put a, another little sprinkle of intrigue. Maybe the next one might be in person. Hmm. Oh, we'll see. Because well, I'm not gonna say you know, anything. I'm not gonna say anything. You know, I that would be amazing. But holy, I think it's just like COVID. Like when the COVID thing, like once yeah. the vaccines are rolled out, then like, yeah. fucking yes. <laughs> there, there is a thing. Really? We'll talk again offline, off the, off the, off the air. I'll, I'll, there's some stuff. I, yeah, we will talk. <laughs> Please, yeah. Oh, oh shit. Face real. Face real. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I guess, yeah. <laughs> You'll be like, you're gonna wear like a little Lennon mask when we do this, like when we do like a, a live stream together, like you and me, just sure. just just rowing out, hanging out. <laughs> that'll be that'll be legit fun. Lennon actually. mask. I'll uh, be like, I'll be putting like a little like fucking crown on you. You'll just like, pop oh, fuck off out here with that with that monarchy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have the Bay Area get up. The... <laughs> oh, that'd be good. We can get Bay. We can get Bay in as well. <laughs> yeah, why not? Of course. Bay's a lot of fun. Right, Listen, thank you so much. We'll <laughs> we'll wrap things up, comrades in the chat. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everyone for being here to the audience for for checking us out. Thank I hope you guys, you, honestly. Yeah, I I really hope you've enjoyed this. Hope you found this useful. This has been a great conversation. There've been great questions. It's been really. I, I apologize that we haven't gotten to all the questions. You know how it is. There's like a million questions. Hakim's the king. 
<laughs> the chairman is here <laughs> with us today. It's it's difficult to get through everything. It's we're all very excited, and of course the king doesn't uh, doesn't fuck around. You know, like when we have a question, he doesn't just go like for ten seconds answer it yes no bullshit. No, he he dives into it. He gets into <laughs> it and he goes off for like half an hour, and it's beautiful. It's amazing, uh, and unfortunately the that means that there's not enough king to go around. So I apologize, but uh, of course follow our comrade on Twitter. Uh, get in touch. Send a little DM. If there's something that's really important, and uh, and hopefully we can we can get to the bottom of whatever issues you have and uh, <laughs> answer the questions that might be still burning in your mind <laughs> Please right do, go ahead. afterwards listen comrades thank you so much I hope you've enjoyed this enjoy the rest of the week I'll be back next uh, sometime next week uh, Aaron from Re-Education is coming on that's going to be a lot of fun uh, you know the, the tanky versus anarchist thing <laughs> okay so that's going to be well we're, we're friends so I can't even I can't even pretend yeah. that we're like uh, fighting each other he's just he's just a really really nice guy he's a lot of fun so uh, we'll be doing that next week that's going to be a lot of fun we'll be back with the Socialism 101 videos soon uh, I'm not sure when I'm still working on them but uh, yeah we're still working away on them and uh, we'll be in touch soon comrades enjoy the rest yep. of the week Hakeem again thank you so much for coming on cheers everybody August anytime Slong. Slong fall, everybody yeah. take care lots of love enjoy the rest of the week Mass take care Lama. take care guys bye